Are you gonna are you going to test the video clip or no? Yeah, it'll work. All right. At Let's record. Point, I just did. The show hasn't started yet now. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we we're just about to start. Did you have a good weekend? We have to have a meeting. Yeah, we I'm have late. to have meetings. We need uh, right. to to discuss the office hours and hours coming up this weekend. We have and we uh, had a somebody, I, I'm just about to get my coffee and then we start. Thank God. The show still hasn't started yet. Thank you. Show this is just pre-show stuff. Are you going to sit on it? Am I going to sit on the coffee? Yeah. Why would I do that? Your coffee enema you always talk about. All right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Have a great show. Thank you, Dan. And Dan will be back later on. The show hasn't started yet. God, I need vitamin D. Show still hasn't started yet. Still waiting. Okay. Pre-show is now over. People pay extra for the pre-show, by the way. Okay, now this is the show everybody else gets to see. Oh, boy. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comment too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinell, who will be joining us a little later on tonight with new music. Rachel Maddow says she's taking a hiatus from MSNBC to make movies with Ben Stiller. Rachel Maddow is going to go make a movie or two with Ben Stiller. I thought her show already was a Ben Stiller movie. What, that, that thing I watch every night on MS? That's not a Ben That's what is it then? If it's not a Ben Stiller movie, what am I watching? Neil Young says we should boycott Spotify because of the misinformation that Joe Rogan is spreading about the Holocaust. No, he's not a Holocaust denier. Right? What is Joe Rogan doing? Is, it, is he saying black people don't have the same IQs as white people? What is Joe Rogan saying? Oh, the COVID stuff. He's giving misinformation. It's the same. He's fishing from the same pond. So anyway, eventually he'll get around to Holocaust denying and talking about uh, how black people don't have the same IQ as white people. That's next on the agenda for Joe Rogan. Now it's now he's doing the COVID thing. OK, anyway, Neil Young says we should boycott Spotify because of the misinformation that joe rogan is spreading on spotify and today joe rogan apologized uh, this was his biannual apology for spreading COVID misinformation he does it every six months and promises never to do it again because he learned from tesla and uh all the big tech people it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission and people have no memory so joe will say to people under the age of 30 don't get vaccinated 
gets into trouble. He apologizes. People have the memory of a fruit fly six months later. He says he never got vaccinated. He apologizes again. And again, he issued an apology for his latest COVID outrage. And people, you know, oh, OK, he's apologized. Moving on. He said that he's going to do a better job bringing um, uh, more informed people onto his show. And he said that he books the show himself. $100 million he gets from Spotify, and he can't spring for a booker. This is an example of everything that's wrong with the greed of capitalism. $100 million. Now, I know he's popular, but so is pornography. So is Holocaust denial. Uh, so are snuff videos. Uh, he gets $100 million from Spotify, but doesn't spring for a booker? Does it all by himself? Well, obviously he is doing it all by himself. Do you realize the kind of newsroom Spotify could build with $100 million? Do you realize what kind of news could be delivered? What kind of truth could be told? How you could get both sides of every story with $100 million? But no, let's give it to the guy who gets kicked in the head repeatedly studying his mixed martial arts. So Neil Young is saying we should boycott Spotify. We should get our music from Amazon. Now, wait a second. Amazon, I have to pick Jeff Bezos over Joe Rogan. I mean, two bald headed homunculi who don't care about what happens to people. I have to choose between those two. I'm going to choose Joe Rogan over Jeff Bezos. Well, OK, wait a second. I, I, there's choice. We have choice when it comes to live streaming. I'm not going to do Spotify. I'm not going to do Amazon. There's Apple, but they use slave labor to make the phones. You know what? Apple, Amazon are just as evil as Spotify. So I have decided to cancel music. That's it. Obviously, I can no longer listen to music. Welcome to the mop up for January 31st, 2022. I'm the vitamin D deficient David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 27 degrees and sunny. Now, I've deducted it's sunny. I live in an air shaft above a parking garage. So if people get out of their car with sunglasses on, I assume it's sunny or the guy behind the wheel is blind. Most of the time, you never know, it is New York City. Most of the time, it's because it's sunny. Although blind people do drive in Manhattan, we, we call them tourists from Boston. The worst place to drive is, is Boston uh, because the worst people in the world come from Boston. Again, I have no, nothing against Boston, just the people who live there. Uh, they're horrible drivers, horrible people. And most importantly, every single one of them, they're all bigots. Everybody from Boston is a bigot. Not a single person from Boston is not a bigot. Every single person. If you step foot in Boston, you become a bigot. And I hate bigots. I do. That's why I hate everyone from Boston. I am not prejudiced. That's the reason I hate everyone from Boston, because everyone there is bigoted. So I am the farthest thing from prejudiced. Uh, I have happy memories of, from Boston. I do. I want to talk about fixing things. We're going to be a little more positive today and say nice things about the system because it's a midterm year. And as much as I loathe the Democrats, I hate Trump supporters even more. And I, you know, I, I don't think Biden delights in other people's suffering. I think he doesn't care that other people are suffering. I think the, the, the right, the Republican Party, I, I think they get off on pain and suffering. We have to do a better job in the Democratic Party. 
for those of you who have never heard this show before, uh, you're lucky, and I would advise you to go listen to Joe Rogan. That's the first thing. But if you're going to, uh, you should know that I, I am going to stay in the Democratic Party. Uh, you don't kick me out. I kick you out of the Democratic Party. And I'm not going to beat up. I don't like beating up on Trump supporters because, and I mean this, it really is hitting a hitting on a you know hitting an emotionally mentally disabled person and i'm not making a joke i I think when you go after the right you really are picking on illiterate mentally direct people who are in serious need of medical attention so i don't get any joy in i i know they're bullies but i don't get off on beating up on those bullies. The problem is I find myself beating up way too much on my own people. I still am a Democrat. I still believe this party can be salvaged. And I'm not beating up on the left because I am moving further and further to the left. I'm searching for how do we make, how do we provide for everybody? How, how, How do we start getting back to basics. How do we feed everybody? How do we house everybody? How do we make sure that everybody has health care, clothing, and education? And then, you know, if you want to be competitive, go ahead. You you know, if you want to be a monster, that's a whole other issue. But I think a basic building block of society is let's make sure everybody has food, shelter, clean water, clothing, health care, dental, eye, uh, and, and an education that everybody feels safe. I'm not a football fan, but the idea of the profit motive, uh, you can only survive with the profit motive. Football, and most of you know, this is in many ways socialism, the, as opposed to baseball. The, the, the TV profits are split evenly among all the football teams. So that if you have a a team in los angeles you get the same television revenue as your shithole team in san francisco same money dispersed so it's equal and then the way they do draft picks it's to make sure that losing teams get access to better college players football is an example of what happens when you spread the wealth and you keep the playing field level so this is the problem in america we are not playing with a level field and we're not everybody is not starting the season with the same amount of money in their pocket uh that isn't capitalism that isn't socialism that isn't left right that's just basic human decency and i'm getting tired of hearing people telling me that you know, it's cap. We have to get rid of capitalism. I don't even know what that means. Like, like we're going to wake up one day and outlaw capitalism the, the way you're going to, you know, I, I believe the communists try to outlaw the Catholic Church in China, in Russia. They wouldn't allow the Jews to work. You can't outlaw a religion. Capitalism is a religion you just can't get rid of capitalism so blaming everything on capitalism doesn't cut it for me uh especially when i'm not hearing big ideas to replace capitalism i keep asking so we replace it with well i'm gonna talk about what how we get to socialism by using capitalism um i would like to hear one leftist look up from rereading Das Kapital and offer up a clear and simple explanation as to how we can offer an idea, a solution as big as our enemy's idea. And when I say our enemy, the 0.01%, the richest 0.01%, they have big ideas. They are writing the future and we're playing defense. They're proactive, we're reactive. We're allowing 
the richest 0.01% to write the future. When you look at big tech, the big banks, they have big ideas. And in America, big ideas will always trump the small ones. I'm hearing old ideas with fresh coats of paint. Ideas that I support, that I think work, that have to be reinvigorated, but they're old ideas with fresh paints, fresh coats of paint, unions, I'm all for it. Medicare for all, all for it, a new green deal. They are all great ideas, but they are not new ideas. They were once new ideas and they worked before, but they are now old ideas. Yes, unions built the middle class 70 years ago. I believe in unions, but it's an old ID, idea. Medicare for all, an old idea. Medicare was passed in 65. Now we're just giving it to everybody else, and we're not, unfortunately. It is an old idea. And of course, a Green New Deal, that is the New Deal. It's an old idea from 1933. Now you've just slapped the color green. You just painted over green on it. Great idea. I, I support it. I think it would solve climate change, uh, perhaps. Breaking up big tech, all for it. The Sherman Antitrust Act, though, was passed in 1890. So, you know, these are old ideas, all great ideas that should be reanimated. They are all great tools that the Democratic Party should be using, but they are old ideas. All of them are tired ideas that unfortunately the right wing, the richest 0.01% has already figured out how to work around. They've, they've had anywhere between 50 to 100 years to figure out all the workarounds from these old ideas. I see it with unions. I, I see that you could be working on a show at Comedy Central, which is owned by CBS, which is owned by Viacom, and the show has to go union, but not Viacom and not CBS. Every individual, they've just figure out how to create all these separate shell companies to make it impossible to, to unionize. I've, I mentioned this on the show last week. We keep hearing how this is the golden age of union organization. Bullshit. Bullshit. Two Starbucks in Buffalo went union. That's it. We're seeing a lot of strikes. But we're not seeing a lot of shops going union. And that's been borne out. A new study. I talked about this last week. A new study shows that there are 250,000 fewer union members in 2021 than there were in 2020. They figure out ways to get rid of unions. So unions are great. I wouldn't be able to do this show had I not been a member of the Writers Guild Union. Uh, the Writers Guild Union has taken care of me. I wish everybody belonged to the Writers Guild. It is a great union. I wish that for everybody. I do. But fewer and fewer people are joining unions. One out of 10 Americans has some affiliation with the union and uh, and we have 250,000 fewer union members than we did the year before when we were supposedly at the height of a brand new golden age for, for union organizing. Uh, these are old uh, ideas. And what we need is a big new idea. And I have that big idea. It's the Mo Green New Deal. This is what I believe will save the country, the planet, and the 99%, the Mo Green New Deal. You don't buy me out, I buy you out. Corporate America is buying our government right now. Unacceptable. 
it's time for our government to say to corporate America, you don't buy me out, I buy you out. This is the Mo Green New Deal. Let's talk business. You're done. Big tech, Wall Street, you don't even have that kind of muscle anymore. The country's sick, right? You're getting chased out by China and the Saudis. What do you think is going on here? You think you can come to my government and take over? I talked to Barzini. I can make a deal with him and still keep my hotel. The Mo Green New Deal. And I'm serious about this. Unions, minimum wage, Green New Deal, antitrust enforcement. I'm for all of the above, but these are not new ideas and it's not working because it's not big enough. We're not taking a big enough swing at the 0.01%, which is always swinging big. The, the Mo Green New Deal, where we buy out corporate America, our tax dollars buy out corporate America and corporate America works for us. That's the pathway to socialism. The, the road to socialism is paved by capitalism. The left, again, it's so easy to beat up on this fictitious left. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Uh, there's no leadership, you know, other than Bernie. Uh, and there, there are many reasons why there's no leadership other than Bernie. Rachel Maddow is, you know, wants to go make movies with Ben Stiller. Uh, people get rich in the media and they don't care about the left. So there are, you know, inherent systemic roadblocks to the emergence of a strong and powerful left. I get that. But uh, there is an opportunity inside the Democratic Party. But we have to think large. And we have to stop with these bite-sized solutions. Uh, we insult the intelligence of the American people by thinking that they can't grasp big ideas. We give them bite-sized solutions. Too many on the left think that Americans can't dream big. But the 99% does dream big and they can dream bigger than the richest one percent the one one percent is dreaming of amazing things amazingly destructive things collateralized debt obligations where you bet on a bet on a home and then have that bet backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government that is a huge swing you know that when they came up with this they thought, well, we're not going to get away with this. They'll stop us. Nobody stopped them. They took a big swing. It's insane, but we still have collateralized debt obligations on Wall Street. We have uh, an undeniable climate emergency, yet we're subsidizing the oil companies that is insane that's a, that's a big idea a big swing it's outrageous the oil companies are thinking how do we how do we pull this off they they're going to find out aren't they somehow somehow we subsidize the oil company we are subsidizing the people who are killing us how come the right the 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 one percent can imagine the unimaginable and get away with it and get whatever they want. And we have nothing but old ideas. Uh, they, they came up with a 20 year war that transferred $14 trillion to the richest 1%. How come we can't think of that? How is that possible that we, we just wrapped up a 20 year war 14 trillion dollars was transferred to the richest one percent a, a, a 20 year war that that caused even more income inequality it's outrageous it's insane it's a big swing it, it's a grand slam and they got away with it and it you know whenever i say something like what about 24 hour 
seven day a week soup kitchens for anybody who's hungry. The left says to me, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, they're not going to let you do that. How are you going to pay for that? They want the restaurant companies. Well, I mean, and yet they can tr they can not only transfer 14 trillion dollars to the richest one percent in a war in Afghanistan and Iraq, people die. They kill people and get away with it. We can't even uh, get the government to feed everybody. And because our side is so defeated, they're going, what are you talking about? Soup kitchens for everybody? How, how does that work? How could that, how could we possibly give away free food to everybody who's, who's hungry? I don't know. Uh, how can you give away education to f free to every student in America? How do you give books away? Can you imagine if we wanted to get libraries made now with the Democratic Party, the left, as defeated as it is now. People say, what you're telling me you're gonna build a place that you just have to get a card and you can take out any book you want? Really? You think the book publishers are gonna allow that? Well, publishers love libraries. Everybody benefits from libraries. Everybody benefits by giving away free books. Everybody. But the right wants to privatize libraries. That's a whole other story. Everybody would benefit if we had soup kitchens on every block in America feeding people. It would create jobs. It would end starvation. Our kids would be able to go to school. They'd, they'd have enough nutrition so they could think clearly. It would build our economy. Everybody would be for that, except the CEOs of a couple of fast food operations like McDonald's and Wendy's that give us diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. McDonald's kills more people in one day than Al-Qaeda and ISIS combined. In, in the entire lifetime of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, McDonald's kills more people in one day from diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. But they can, they can stop uh, feeding every child in America because if we feed every child in America, it affects McDonald's bottom line. Where's the leadership? Uh, I, I'm not beating up on the left. I'm not. I'm asking where the leadership is. Where is the great idea that gets us to march? The idea that is undeniable. Medicare for all. We came close with Bernie. Bernie is perfect. Medicare for all. I think most people... I think everybody agrees that the health insurance companies are killing us and we could march behind Bernie on Medicare for all, but there are systemic problems, systemic obstacles that prevent him from succeeding. But he knew the importance of the big swing, the big think. Uh, and I think with the, the green the Mo Green New Deal, I think the big swing is to start thinking about the financialization of the left. And by that, I mean, we take over Wall Street. Uh, if you want to destroy capitalism, the left has to embrace capitalism. Anything the left touches, we destroy. We know that. So we need to embrace capitalism. We, we will pave the way to socialism by embracing capitalism, by getting in on it. The big think, the big swing, the big move, I believe, is, yes, the past is important, but the big move is to say, you know what? Wall Street has done a pretty good job for the wealthiest 1%. You win, guys. Now it's time for Wall Street to work for the rest of us. Again, this is a tactic, not a strategy. It's a tactic. This isn't socialism. This isn't capitalism. This is a big swing where we forget the labels and we stop thinking small. The road to socialism is paved by capitalism. If you want state ownership, by the way, personally, I think 
that the state should compete with private enterprise. I think it should be 50-50. I think the state should run some, some public goods and then corporations, private corporations should run others. I think there should be a tension between the two. Nobody should have a monopoly over the market. But uh, one of the ways we get there is for the state to own a piece of major corporations. This is the Mo Green New Deal. You don't buy me out, I buy you out. This is not even being discussed in America. And we need to, to elect politicians who talk openly about the federal government and city governments buying voting shares in corporate America. I was just reading about uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. They have some kind of economic revitalization program to encourage GM to keep its factories in Michigan. And it's, they say, very successful that uh, more electric vehicles are going to be uh, built in Michigan because Gretchen Whitmer and the government is pumping close to a billion dollars uh, in tax incentives and underwriting to keep GM in Michigan. But do we own? Do we get voting shares? We're, we're giving money, tax incentives to keep the jobs in Michigan, but we don't get a piece of GM. We bailed GM out in 2009. Uh, we had to give back the voting shares, our tax dollars. We don't get a cut of their profits. We don't, we don't have any say in how GM is run even though they are constantly coming to the federal government and Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, for handouts. We're constantly propping up these industries and they return the favor by busting unions, shipping jobs to Mexico. I think if you want tax incentives, you want grants to keep jobs in Michigan, that money should be ownership. We should get some voting shares. You don't buy us out, GM. We buy you out. This is not nationalizing a corporation. It's partly socializing them. There, there has to come a time when a corporation, when it depends on tax dollars, those tax dollars, should manifest themselves in voting shares. Uh, we don't have to run an auto company. We can own 10% of GM. I think Jeff Bezos only owns 10% of Amazon, and he is judge, jury, and executioner over there. Why can't the government get 5% of some of these problematic corporations? When a bank is too big to fail, then we should be buying shares of that bank on the open market and dictating, having some kind of say in how they issue mortgages, who they lend to, who they don't, what their service fees are. We uh, need to think differently about capitalism and Wall Street and our money, our tax dollars. Why shouldn't the United States government own 10% of the big banks since we bail them out all the time? And we, you know, we're in a bubble now. We're always either experiencing a, a, a bubble that has burst or a bubble that is about to burst. And when the bubble bursts, it's your tax dollars that save capitalism. They, they love capitalism until they need socialism. Well, it's socialism for the rich without us getting any of the upside. How come we don't get to own these companies that we bail out? Uh, and labor, you know, tiny unions, they need to look at, the, at their money and realize that it's time for labor to own a piece of the economy. Uh, labor has abdicated its responsibility 
in investing pension funds to hedge fund managers, to money managers who put pension funds into corporations that work against the unions they're investing in. Hedge fund managers, these big money managers that handle billions, sometimes trillions of dollars, they're destroying jobs in America. Unions turn their pension funds over to private equity firms, which their only responsibility is to, to make profits. And they do that by using leverage, by using debt to take over a, a corporation, saddle it with debt, strip it of its assets, and pay themselves enormous fees and profits while raiding the pension funds and destroying jobs. Unions turned their money over to venture capital, a private, ca private equity firms that destroy American jobs. We are, we have to take our money back. There's a big pool of money out there that labor has access to that we're turning over to the enemy, to the enemy, and they don't give the kind of returns that justify giving them the money. Hedge funds do not outperform index funds. Money managers, read what Warren Buffett has to say about all money managers. None of them can beat the market. Why is labor, why, why are we taking our pooled money and giving it over to the enemy, which uses our money to destroy the corporations we work for? Now, this is the job of uh, the government to, to tweak the tax code so that it encourages unions not to turn their money over to, to uh, venture capital, private equity, hedge fund managers. Little tweaks to the tax code go a long way. Uh, for example, when Apple buys back $40 billion worth of its stock, you can demand that a portion of that stock will be taxed uh, very high unless it's awarded to Apple employees. You, 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 can, you can raise and lower taxes to change people's behavior. So when Apple uh, stock buybacks used to be uh, verboten by the SEC, now they're legal. Well, the, you can change the tax code so that when Apple buys $40 billion of its stock, which is really rigging the market, it used to be con considered rigging the market, uh, you can demand that a portion of the stocks that they buy back has to be returned to the employees. And that paves the path for not necessarily employee owned corporations, but corporations where employees own a significant part of the corporation. Pension funds, one little tweak of the tax code and pension funds would start investing a portion of their money in the company the workers are working for. Not all of it, because if it's you know General Electric and it tanks, everybody loses their money. But if you work for a corporation and you have a pension, uh, a union pension, a portion of that money should be in the stock of the company you work for, which would give you a seat at the table, like in Germany. 40% of uh, boards uh, of directors are labor in Germany. The German economy is doing <laughs> a lot better than we are. The German people do better than we do, and their economy does better than ours. 40% of a corporation in Germany, their board of directors, 40% of their board of directors are representing the workers. And it's the board of directors who approve the wages of the CEO. So you're not going to see these uh, wage gaps that we see in America where a CEO gets something like, what, 10,000 times the median salary. Uh, it, it's, it's ridiculous. So uh, 
there are ways to just tweak the tax code so that unions are not giving money to private equity and they're investing in the company they work for and getting a seat at the table. Uh, we need to unionize our money, even if there's no union. Like Apple, I doubt it's a union. I, I, I doubt there are very few unions at Apple, but you can unionize the money. If, if the workers are given stock in Apple, that money can be put into a, a pool and you can unionize the money and have it vote together. You know, it can become a voting block when you go to the board of directors. Uh, imagine if the tax code were tweaked just enough so that when Delta pays some of its employees in stock, those employees are given a tax credit if they agree to place their stock in a pool of other workers' stock that is represented by a worker spokesperson for that stock. You could, you know, you could still sell the stock if you work for Delta, if you wanted, but if you work for Delta and you have stock in Delta, all your stock is put into a pool of voting shares that represents a larger block of voting shares. And then you vote on how you want to dictate the trajectory of the corporation. You have a bigger say. I think that will facilitate more worker-owned businesses. By unionize, if you can't unionize the workers, unionize their money. Give, give the workers stock in the company. Have, keep it all in one pool, have that, that stock represented by one person, and you'll be the, the most powerful voice when, uh, when they're meeting. You'll have control over the CEO. Again, these are little things the Security and Exchange Commission can do, the Treasury Department can do to make corporations more responsive to shareholders and workers. Uh, this is a Trojan horse solution to the excesses of capitalism. It's a big think, but an obvious move. It, it's simple. Nobody could argue against workers owning shares of the companies they work for. And you do that by somehow, I don't know how, getting a government that is willing to facilitate worker-owned businesses. And it starts with a government that is willing to take a portion of the trillions of dollars that are sitting there in Social Security, a uh, portion of our budget, and investing it in corporate America. Again, I'm not saying all of Social Security, just a portion of it. There is a, a left-right coalition. This is hard to debate. Uh, it's really hard to be against something like this. I've mentioned this before. You know, nobody knows how the Federal Reserve works, but they're, they have a thing called quantitative easing. I apologize because I have no idea what any of this means. But Jerome Powell, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, is doing a thing now called quantitative tightening. When the economy runs sour, he does quantitative easing, which is where he goes to the open market and starts buying corporate bonds, right? And somehow that lowers interest rates. The government is buying corporate issued bonds, junk bonds. The, the charter to the Federal Reserve prevents the Federal Reserve from buying stock. They can buy bonds, but they can't buy a corporation's stock. However, there will be a crisis in a week, 
six weeks or another year where the stock market is just going to completely drop 50 percent this always happens more and more people are putting their life savings into stocks and they're going to demand that the federal reserve do something jerome powell the chairman of the federal reserve will violate the charter and start buying stocks to prop up the stock market he'll buy etfs and index funds which are a basket of the 500 biggest companies on wall street and everybody will be for that everybody will be for that in washington you've just saved capitalism the federal reserve just bought you know three trillion dollars worth of uh, stock I don't know what that noise is uh boy that's annoying anyway uh but what he won't do is keep the stock he won't give the American people voting shares he'll sell it back no this is the this is the conversation that has to get started now where we say when the Federal Reserve starts buying stock we keep it we keep it capitalism failed now we are bailing it out and there's going to be a little socialism that is a left-right coalition and again with social security which is not going bust none of that money goes into the stock market none and back in 2005 2006 George W Bush talked about privatizing social security it was a bad idea what he wanted to do was turn social security money over to wall street to invest for us that's bullshit. in the mo green new deal social security invests a little of that money without wall street just the social security administration starts buying stock and one day we look up and realize you know what we own 10 percent of amazon we have more shares than Jeff Bezos and people say well Wall Street isn't safe what what if the market crashes I agree uh, it's it's risky but uh, Wall Street would say buy on the dips isn't that what they say to put a little of Social Security into the stock market to give social security ownership of corporate America is good for workers it's good for social security and it's also good for the stock market it creates a base it creates a solid footing because the social security administration is never going to do panic selling they're just you it's going to be a buy and hold strategy and there'll always be this this rock bottom that the stock market can't sink below because social security has put a couple of trillion dollars into it and then we get to own corporate America we get to own five ten percent of corporate America the Mo Green New Deal you don't buy me out I buy you out this is what we this is the big swing the big idea that the left the Democratic Party has to put in to the conversation right now because the right Elon Musk the the, the uh, Apple you know they're coming up with cryptocurrencies and nf non-fungible tokens they have these ideas that are absolutely insane and we're back on our heels responding to this insanity instead of saying no 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 no, we've got some insanity of our own we're gonna own you that requires us to get our heads out of marks and into the here and now and and get financially literate to to learn what quantitative easing means which they've been doing and now it's quantitative tightening where they're going to be uh, selling all the corporate bonds that they bought up this is all 
smoke and mirrors and uh nobody understands it nobody's supposed to understand it it's religion it's faith nobody can explain how a bumblebee flies they can't and nobody can explain how the federal reserve actually works so it's an act of faith and this act of faith might as well benefit the 99 percent as opposed to the richest one percent they get to control the narrative by confusing us and steal from us we need to take hold of the conversation and say hey we have an idea even crazier than non-fungible tokens and cryptocurrency the mo green new deal you don't buy me out i buy you out I, i'm tired of being told why ideas won't work that's the first thing when i talk to democrats when i say something like you know Bernie wants to give everybody free tuition at public universities yeah it's a good idea but let me tell you why it won't work and yet the right wing the 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 the, the kleptocrats uh there are a million reasons self-driving cars should be outlawed and yet they're not I keep reading that self-driving cars kill people and that they can't work and yet all I keep hearing about is Apple's testing self-driving cars. Tesla is still testing self-driving cars, even though nobody wants self-driving cars. They don't ask for permission. They just wear you down. This is what Joe Rogan does. Just every six months, you apologize for something you did. And people think, oh, he apologized. He's not going to spread any more misinformation about COVID because now he's turned to the Holocaust. Now he's going to spread disinformation about the Holocaust. There's really no difference uh, between spreading disinformation about COVID and the Holocaust or the IQs of people of color. Same toolbox. Uh, we have to think as big as the right there are a million reasons Amazon should be broken up into a thousand tiny pieces uh but it's not being done because we're somehow intimidated by big stupid crazy ideas all right we love big stupid crazy ideas let's have our own big stupid crazy ideas uh yeah the mo green no, new deal where america says to corporate america you don't buy me out i buy you out well like most of you i'm trying to maintain and as you can probably tell i'm not doing a, a good job uh I'm trying to practice gratitude just not sure what i'm supposed to be grateful for someone said you should be grateful because things could get a lot worse okay I tried that and things got a lot worse so maybe it's time to practice ingratitude maybe it's time to look up to the sky and say now it's Ukraine are you effing kidding me Omicron inflation and now Ukraine Th this is a joke right we're, we're going to war again there's nothing to be happy about there's nothing to, there's no there's no there's nothing to be to practice gratitude for every time I turn on the TV everyone is happier than I am JLo and Ben are, are getting married John Mulaney is hosting SNL for the fifth time with his full head of hair his youth and his success everyone is doing great except me and apparently the internet thinks I'm obsessed with earwax uh I know my cookies leave a trail apparently the algorithm says David Feldman is desperately trying to remove earwax 
not just his earwax, but everyone else's earwax. Apparently, the algorithm believes, I think the biggest problem facing mankind is not hunger or climate change. No, it's ridding the world of earwax, watching people ridding themselves of earwax. I swear to you, I have never clicked on a single ad for earwax removal, and yet all that's being advertised to me is some new contraption that removes earwax, all of it. Like, it's like colonics for your ears. There, there are these all brand new, apparently the ears, I don't know if you're, you've got the same algorithm I have, but apparently the ear is like a woman's reproductive system, tiny little opening, but behind it, there's a 40 room uterus with an indoor pool and a basketball court. I can't believe what people are yanking out of their ears, like these 10 year old hornet's nests, uh, these earwax blasters are removing fists and volleyball teams. Apparently the algorithm believes my ears are completely clogged with these malignant fat burgers the size of a, a grapefruit tree, and I need to irrigate my ears with the very same space-aged drill bits used by Exxon to frack the Permian Basin. All I see are ads for earwax removal. And you know who needs to get his ears cleaned or her ears cleaned? God. That's who should get his or her ears cleaned because God is not listening to me. Open your ears. People tell me I should be grateful to God because you have no idea how worse things can get. Wow, that really gives me a lot of faith in the benevolent and loving universe. Thanks. Thanks. God? Is that your name, God? No last name. Just God, like Drake, Cher, Bono, just God. Okay, seems a little pretentious. Is that That's not a nickname. That's, that's the name you were born with. Okay, so they're telling me I should be grateful because even though it's bad, it can get even worse. How much worse? Like Greg Gutfeld gets a Netflix special worse? How worse is it going to get? But I'm supposed to be grateful. Be grateful. I get it. Things are horrible, but God is capable of even worse things, making even worse things happen. So thanks, God. Thanks for not using all the bullets in your chamber. Thanks for just winging me. I'm so grateful for a minor flesh wound. I don't know about your God, but here's the thing about my God. I have told him or her repeatedly, you work for me, not the other way around. Capiche? And I want to speak to God's manager. How many times do I have to place my order until it's finally delivered? How many times do I place this order and wait for it? I have a very simple request. Jesse Waters, Fox News, face breaks out in dear chlamydia. You've heard me talk about this. I don't ask for much, God. I just want to see Jesse Waters on Fox have his face break out in dear chlamydia, a face full of dear chlamydia boils. Is that asking too much? Apparently it is. The one thing I ask for, but I'm supposed to trust in God and keep the faith. And I do. I start each morning with my daily affirmation. I try to keep things positive. O oh Lord, creator of this rancid earth and putrescent sky, pick up your game. I know you're old, but do you even listen when I'm talking? Get one of those earwax removal systems. Seriously, dude, how many honey-do lists can I give you? You're exhausting me. It's been miserable here in New York City. I look like shit. You don't need to tell me. Jesus Christ. The hospital around the corner from me has decided to get bigger. Hospitals in New York 
are tumors. They just keep growing and growing. And because it's a hospital, they're allowed to do construction 24 hours around the clock. That's all hospitals ever do. The entire purpose of a hospital is to grow like a malignant tumor. All the money goes into constructing new wings to perfectly fine hospitals, while other hospitals in America are closing because they aren't making enough money, even though we spend twice as much on health care in America than any other country in the industrialized world. Yes, the problem with health care in America is the hospitals we have left aren't big enough. Silly me, I thought the problem was hospitals are closing. I thought the problem was we didn't have enough hospitals, but apparently what this country needs is fewer and fewer hospitals that are much bigger. Hospitals that are so large, you no longer need ambulances. The gravitational pull will be so huge when you get sick, the hospital will just suck you towards it. So let's just keep adding on to the hospitals as healthcare gets more and more unaffordable. That's the way it works here in America. I know you're feeling horrible. I know Aetna just declined that heart transplant for your daughter, but I think you'll feel a lot better if you checked out the Matisse hanging in the new Sanford wheel wing. That piece of shit, Sanford wheel. I'm up all night, 24 hours of construction noise, so they can build a, a, another monument to Sanford Wheel's greed and destruction. This is the guy who single-handedly got Glass-Steagall overturned, which created the 2008 financial crisis, and his name is being slapped on hospitals across New York City, keeping me up at night. And uh, here's what my old rabbi called a mixed bag. This is what they call Sanford Wheel. Uh, he destroyed our economy, Sanford Wheel. My rabbi calls people like him a mixed bag. My ex-rabbi, uh, unfortunately, he's still a rabbi. He's just not mine. Uh, he calls people like him a mixed bag, like Eli Brode, who was this horrible real estate guy who created homelessness in Los Angeles. He donated to my old temple, and I said to my rabbi, how can you take money from this guy? And my rabbi said, he's a mixed bag, to which I said, yes, a mixed bag of shit. That's one of the few good things about being Jewish. You can talk that way to a rabbi. But no, we must build, we must build more construction round the clock. That, that will save the healthcare system, more construction bigger hospitals. We must add on to hospitals that nobody can afford to be in. The same way colleges and universities keep building and building as higher education gets increasingly unaffordable. They can't seem to understand why uh, college costs so much. And when I try to explain why college costs so much, they can't hear me over the din of all the jackhammers building the Sanford Wheel Library so his idiot granddaughter can get into college. Colleges and hospitals, organized religion are about one thing, raising money to build, to build more. I went to this temple in Los Angeles that was empty. Nobody showed up. Yom Kippur, they showed up. The rest of the year, empty. Nobody came. So, they raise money to build a bigger temple. Yes, I said when I was a member of that temple, let's build a temple that looks emptier, bigger. So they owned the building next door. They evicted all the residents to make room for a parking lot to accommodate all the new people who would be coming to the bigger, shinier, and emptier temple. This already was an enormously empty temple, but they built a bigger and emptier one. I fought it, but who am I? Uh, I said to the rabbi, 
did it ever occur to you that the reason your congregation is empty is because your sermons are empty? Did it ever occur to you that the reason your temple is empty has nothing to do with the building? It's you. You suck, rabbi. You're like the kid in Little League who drops the fly ball and blames the mitt. Remember that in Little League? You know, the kid drops the fly ball and he, he looks at the mitt. You're blaming the building for your shittiness. You suck at being a rabbi. That's why nobody comes here. He's no longer my rabbi. Uh, but it, I do recommend Judaism just for the thrill of being able to tell a rabbi he's full of shit. It's one of the few joys of being Jewish. It's almost required. It's not. It's sacrilege if you don't tell your rabbi he's full of shit. Religion, education, and healthcare, it's all about building. The building fund, the building fund. And so now I have round-the-clock construction going on. I'm not getting any sleep. Look at me. I look like shit. And, and now the construction and one of my neighbors is putting in new cabinets. The, the cabinets in my apartment are at least 50 years old. They look younger than I do. They're, they're younger. My cabinets are younger than I am, and, uh, and they look so much better than I am. And I, I have old cabinets. You don't replay. You don't get rid of the cat. You paint them. You clean them. You don't need new cabinets. Stop it. Just stop. Stop remodeling. Stop building. You're making noise and kicking up dust, and it's bad for the It's all bad for the planet. Stop it. Just stop throwing things out. Just clean them and, and slap on a, a fresh coat of paint. All night long, uh, when it's not construction, the sound of garbage trucks with their backup beepers. Something must happen in New York City after 10 o'clock. And by law, all the garbage trucks must drive in reverse so they can wake David Feldman up with their their backup beepers i'm supposed to get no sleep because a garbage truck is backing up why don't you do a fucking u-turn and drive forward and let me sleep the city that never sleeps how can new york sleep how could new york sleep ray romano's uncle is picking up the recycling so nobody's allowed to sleep I hate New York. I hate New York City. I always did. And the feeling is mutual. And I left decades ago because I knew exactly what this place was. And then I thought, you know what? I could come back and make things right. New York is the, is the first and fourth wife. You know, you divorce, time moves on, you think she's changed and you marry again only to discover she's even worse. This, this is what New York is. There is nothing in New York City. There's no reason to live in New York City other than to punish yourself for a crime you committed. There's nothing here, nothing. The art museums are money laundering operation. They're, they're uh, money laundering operations for wall street defense contractors hedge fund managers who buy their way onto the boards of these museums so they can get inside information on what new painters they should be investing in broadway <clears throat> i guess if you've got three thousand dollars for parking and two seats in the nosebleed section yeah broadway must be great the food in new york if diarrhea is your thing this is the best place to come. The, the diarrhea in New York, I, I've been all over the world. I have never had diarrhea the way I've gotten it in New York. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you're not into diarrhea, uh, otherwise, uh, there's no need to uh, come to New York. But if you want a meal that ends up feeling like the prep 
before a colonoscopy, come to New York City. And of course, the people. How can you not love New Yorkers? Where would I be without New Yorkers? If there were no New Yorkers, who would constantly ask me what school I went to? Who would ask me what I do for a living and how much I make if I own or I rent? Who would ask me if I didn't live in New York, how come I'm not on The Tonight Show? And if you're a podcast host, then how come I never heard of you? Who would ask me that if it weren't for New Yorkers? To live in this shithole, New York City, did I mention I hate New York City and everyone who lives here, including me? To live in this shithole, you must be in a constant state of denial. The entire city is infested with rats. There are something like four rats for every human being in Manhattan. And every apartment building has mice. Mice are crawling throughout the entire infrastructure of every building in New York City. And they gnaw their way through the pipes and radiators, and they spread disease and rumors about my sexuality. You cannot get rid of mice in New York City. All you can do is plug the holes in your apartment and make sure they don't come into your apartment. But they're in the walls. They're all around you. It's really creepy. I'm surrounded by mice, and I can hear them. I just can't see them. And I'm told to just ignore what I can't see. And that's how New Yorkers live, ignoring what they can't see. Rats crawling through the streets underneath the pavement, mice crawling through the walls. But if you don't see them, and if you don't think about them, it's the greatest city in the world. You know, I moved back to New York in the middle of one of my divorces a few years ago. First week back, I, I thought I, uh, I thought my stomach, I thought I didn't have a stomach anymore. I, I, was, I would eat something and it would go right uh, out of me. Like the food, just permanent state of diarrhea. And I'm a vegan. And, and when I went to the bathroom in Los Angeles, I was one and done. First thing in the morning, good to go because I went. I come to New York, my, my colon turned into the Bellagio fountains. And my doctor says, well, you have a nervous stomach. Well, you know what makes a, 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 a stomach really nervous? All the unwashed, filthy bacteria in the food that's served in New York City. All the food in New York City is crawling with bacteria. Every time you go to a restaurant, they serve you food that had to be transported over a bridge or through a tunnel, and it's been sitting around collecting mold for days. There are no farms in New York City. There's no farm to table. You can't have farm to table here. It's farm to interstate, to tunnel, to bridge, to table. So when you eat at a restaurant, unless you spray the food down with Lysol, you're doing a double bill with the Fountains of Wayne. You're, you're off to the bathroom with diarrhea, which is why I stopped going to restaurants because I was tired of going. And when I do go to a restaurant, I make sure the food is so hot it shreds the roof of my mouth. I don't feel safe unless I got that little piece of cartilage dangling from the roof of my mouth, like, you know, hot pizza. Like my friend Eddie called, he wants to have dinner tomorrow night. And he said, bring a friend. And I said, I called my friend. I said, hey, you in the mood to get diarrhea with Eddie? He knows there's a, there's a great place in the village for diarrhea. I know I'm going to get, I'm going to go have dinner with Eddie tomorrow. I know I'm going to get diarrhea, maybe Omicron, but I know I'm going to get diarrhea. I hate New York and I hate 
everybody who lives in New York, including me. And I hope the entire real estate market collapses. We have more empty apartments than we do homeless in this city. There are, <laughs> this place is just filled with homeless people and we have more empty apartments than we do homeless people because people are buying apartments and leaving them empty H apartments a, a basic human need a human right is now an investment vehicle and the people who invest in apartments they view the homeless the same way i'm supposed to view the mice in my building out of sight, out of mind. This entire city is in denial about the homeless. We have homeless because housing has become an investment instead of a human right. So they are not building new housing because it's in the best interest of anyone who owns an apartment or a home for there to be a shortage of housing because of supply and demand. Fewer homes mean higher prices and higher rents if you see a lot of homeless people and you own property that that's a good sign that you're doing good more ooh, a lot of homeless people prices must be soaring tackling homelessness in new york city like in america you're going to run up against the same problem you run into when you tackle health care you you can't provide free health care to americans other countries, every other industrialized country in the world provides free health care to their citizens. Not in America, because health care is a multi-trillion dollar industry. People make money from sick people. They look at sick people the way a, uh, a prospector looks like looks at a, a gold mine. And uh so people make money off sick people, insuring them. And if the government provides health care for free, what are all those insurance companies supposed to do? That's, that's what is part of the argument. They say you're going to tamper with one third of our economy. Health care is one third of our economy. Well, it wouldn't be if it were free, if the prices weren't being jacked up by these profiteers, we're told by politicians who are against Medicare for all, if the government provides health care for free, what are all those insurance companies supposed to do? I don't know. How about drop dead? How about that? How about they drop dead? The argument against uh, housing the homeless. Uh, what do we say to the people who own apartment buildings? who will no longer be able to charge half a month's salary for rent. What do we say to them? Uh, go F yourself. How about that? How about go find a real job? Why don't you, instead of living in your asset or, or, or charging for a basic human right because you were lucky enough to inherit your parents' money or building, how about you actually go work for a living and go F yourself? But we're not supposed to think about these things. You're not supposed to talk that way. Other countries do. New York is the home of Wall Street. It is the financial capital of the world. It is a city that thrives off denial. Just shutting down arguments, shutting down the truth. If you live in New York, you, you, are, you are trained to work on Wall Street because New York trains you to deny what's right underneath your walls, mice, or what's in your lobby, homeless people. You step over homeless people. I'm not looking at you, so you don't exist. And if you don't exist, if you deny their existence, if I don't think about the rats in the dumpster or the mice in my walls or the homeless guy in my, my lobby, if I don't see any of that, then it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And that's how you can work for a hedge fund. You can work for a, a venture capital fund, private equity, just tunnel vision, and you, and you can press a button and boom, 10,000 of your fellow citizens lose their health insurance. Press another button, boom, 500 people in Milwaukee get evicted into the winter night. 
It's just numbers in front of a screen. That's what New York trains people. It, it trains people to think this way. And that's why New York is the financial capital of the world. It trains people not to look any further than what is right in front of them. It's New York City where you can, you can pay $100 million for a Renoir if you never have to see or hear about the parents who are begging the health insurance company to approve the chemo for their kid, right? So you're not supposed to go into Sotheby's and ask anybody, why would you pay $100 million for that Renoir when there's a kid who's dying of cancer because Aetna won't pay for the, for the chemo? It, New York trains the mind to compartmentalize. Our mind is turned into an apartment building with all these different apartments inside of it. In one apartment, there's hunger. You're aware of hunger. And then there's another apartment where people are getting evicted. And another apartment, you need a $5,000 gown to wear to the Met Gala. And when you need that $5,000 gown to wear to the Met Gala, you, the other apartment where there are homeless people, it's been com compartmentalized. You don't see it. Everything's walled off. That's New York. Trains people to think buying a $3 million Rolex, and they have them now. They have $3 million Rolexes. It trains the mind to think that buying a $3 million Rolex is in no way related to people living on the streets. It's two separate things totally unrelated and you're being rude bringing this up why are you mentioning kids dying because their parents have been denied chemo for them when i'm trying to enjoy this two thousand dollar bottle of wine that it has nothing to do with me why are you ruining my meal if you if you want to fix the health care system go talk to your senator who i own even though I pay zero taxes, but I donate to his campaign. This is the shithole of New York City, and the values of New York City have metastasized across America. This is the city that controls America. It is unnatural. New York City is unnatural. This is not natural for people to live or think this way. It is New York is unnatural. There is no nature in Manhattan, the financial capital of the world. That's why nobody gives a shit about climate change. In fact, nobody gives a shit about creating climate catastrophe here in Manhattan because they are completely devoid of nature. It is all glass and concrete. Every tree, every blade of grass is here by design. Central Park is not untouched wilderness. It was designed, planted, plowed, and irrigated by human beings. There is nothing natural about Central Park. Nothing natural. Central Park is as natural as Kira Knightley's lips. Wall Street is the cause of climate catastrophe. Climate catastrophe is all about people saying and doing whatever it takes to keep the money flowing in. Wall Street is not natural, doesn't care about nature because Manhattan is not natural. There are no lakes that are natural, no trees, no mounds. They've just plowed it all down and reimagined, reimagined the city. And this city is just numbers on a screen. The people trading these numbers are just moving numbers from one column to another. The ice caps melt. Millions of people become climate refugees. They don't have water. They starve to death. But they're just numbers on a screen. You live in Manhattan. You live in Manhattan. You become unnatural because you're, you, you're immune to nature. You, you're not exposed to nature. And of course, out in the Hamptons, 
the government is spending billions to build up the seawalls for all those hedge fund managers, mansions that are being reclaimed by the rising seas. The billionaires out in the Hamptons who create climate change and don't pay taxes, who don't believe in government, who don't believe in man-made climate change, when it's their multi-million dollar estates that are about to disappear, the government has money to dredge sand from the ocean and reclaim their private beaches and uh, create retaining walls for them all on the taxpayer dime that's how wall street and new york works by the way hedge fund managers if you're a hedge fund manager uh you can take two percent management fee each year off the top so like if you're running a 40 billion dollar hedge fund the manager gets two percent off the top of that 40 billion dollars and takes as much as 30 percent of the annual profits so if your hedge fund makes money for clients the hedge fund manager takes as much as 30 percent of those profits each year people think it's justified because they are led to believe that hedge funds are very sophisticated ways to invest your money so these people are smart they wear five thousand dollar suits they're evil certainly they're going to outperform the market and uh, what happens is pensions pension funds retirement funds institutional investors college endowments they all turn their money over to these hedge funds because they've been convinced that they'll get a big return but hedge funds lose money for their clients this is from last week's Financial Times they report that hedge funds only gained eight percent on average last year hedge funds on average gained eight percent over the year but the S&P index gained 24 percent over that same period so had you just bought a simple index fund you could have outperformed these hedge funds which take two percent off the top and 30 percent of the profits in other words the geniuses who run these hedge funds are only making money for themselves and yet and yet all the big institutions rely on hedge funds to manage their money why why for the very same reason these same institutions build when they don't need to museums hospitals universities they all build things they don't need for the same reason they give money to hedge fund managers who lose money for them because it's all about favors and kickbacks it's all about people at the very top feathering each other's nests keeping each other liquid at the expense of the people who actually create the money and we don't question any of it how is it possible that America is now threatening to go to war with Russia only months after we pulled out of Afghanistan in ignominy I mean we lost Afghanistan it was an embarrassment and now we're flexing our muscle in Ukraine we spent 14 trillion dollars on a 20-year war to fight terror a war in which America killed more innocent civilians than died on 9-11 think about that our drone strikes killed more innocent civilians than all the innocent civilians who died on 9-11 we fought a war for 20 years against two countries that never attacked us Afghanistan and the Taliban never attacked us they had nothing to do with 9-11 and yet we're flexing our muscle again in Ukraine months after we were defeated in Afghanistan how is that possible well it turns out war is like the construction going on around the block for me it's not about whether or not the hospital needs a new wing war is not about destruction and and what's going on outside my building isn't about construction 
It's not about whether the destruction or construction does any good. All that matters is seven of the $14 trillion spent on that 20 year war in Afghanistan and Iraq made it to the contractors and they kicked it back to the people who gave them the money. There is no shame about Iraq or Afghanistan in America because the money got to where it was supposed to go. That's why there is no shame right now associated with flexing our muscle in Ukraine. It doesn't matter if we win wars. All that matters is we keep fighting them because we're not fighting these wars to win. We fight wars for the same reason health insurance companies are in business, to make trillions of dollars off misery construction around the corner, destruction in Ukraine isn't about helping people. The health insurance companies, the hospitals aren't about helping people. It's about money. All right, I could uh, keep going and I normally do. Uh, let's take a quick break and see if my guest is here. Yes, he is, okay. Uh, let's take a quick break. I'm going to drink some water. And when we come back, we will talk to Richard Panchik. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Office hours every Friday night starting at 8 p.m. And I believe this Friday, it's office hours and hours, 24 hours of office hours. <laughs> It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Feldman Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Let's go to Brooklyn. Richard Panchik joins us. Let me turn on his camera. This is exciting. Let me, and I just lost him. I just, hang on. This is, Richard, are you there? There you go. And you're in Brooklyn. I believe you're in Brooklyn, I'm, I hope. I'm uh, in Nassau County, actually. Nassau County. Well, this is exciting. Richard Panchik is the author of 49 books on a wide variety of topics, including most recently Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers. And we're going to be plugging that book. I was reading it again last night. We had you on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour to talk about this book. Everybody should pick up Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers. Richard is a native of Queens, New York. He wanted to be a writer since the age of seven, seven, having put aside his original age six dream of becoming a baker. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I want to talk to you about the Tort Museum and 
and what tort law is and your book on World War II for kids. But let's talk a little bit about the museum uh, that Ralph set up and your book, uh, Power to the People, A Young People's Guide to Fighting for Our Rights as Citizens and Consumers. What is the effect that Ralph had on you? Because you write a lot about a young Ralph Nader. I think um, it's impossible to talk about this subject without talking about Ralph Nader. Um, I've known him now for about 12, 13 years. Um, and he's had a tremendous effect on me as far as uh, my, my viewpoint on just, just about everything that happens in this country and the world. But um, his museum, having visited his museum was a very informative experience because you would think that law is something that can't be depicted in a museum format. And in fact, it was one of the only topics, uh, existing topics out there that has no, had no museum. There were museums on almost everything you could think of, Pez dispensers, you know, all, almost everything, you, you know, accordions, but not about a uh, museum devoted to law. And so that was what Ralph set out to do. And I think it comes so across- the Atlantic, Atlantic Magazine and The Nation Magazine say that Ralph Nader is in the top 100 of greatest Americans, not living Americans, greatest Americans. That's the Atlantic, that's the nation and some other organizations as well. Not living Americans in the top 100 of greatest Americans. Why? What, what did he do? What, what did he do? I think Ralph Nader single-handedly brought to the attention of our country, the ability of the American citizen to take action against corporations and affect change, um, showing basically that uh, there is a, a way to hold corporations accountable, large corporations uh, of all kinds. And in this case, it was uh, the the automobile industry that was negligent in some ways in, in what they were building and think built in problems that caused accidents and deaths. And these were just accepted basically. These, these just happened. And Ralph Nader wrote a book about this, Unsafe at Any Speed. And after his book came out, there were suddenly a, a number of lawsuits that followed and there were safety improvements to seat belt law. There are all kinds, you know, that alone that Ralph Nader was responsible for saved. What are, the, what are some of the things that we take for granted now that are here because of Ralph Nader? What do we have? Yeah, the, the seat belt law is for one. Uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act is, is another thing that he was uh, behind. Uh, some of our clean water and clean air laws, a lot of uh, agencies and uh, citizen groups and just just watchdogs, uh, the Whistleblower Act, he had a hand in that, that, that came in. He created the word whistleblower. That's right. So there, there's so much in the last 50 plus 60 years uh, in American life, in American- No life. Ralph Nader, no Environmental Protection Agency. No Ralph Nader, Nader no OSHA. Right, and, and he's I, really very modest about this kind of stuff. You know, if you talk to him, he, he kind of plays it down, but he really, it, it was really, the, he was really the impetus for so much of the safety regulations and the protections that consumers enjoy and bringing to the attention uh, of our American citizens, their ability to, you know, file a lawsuit when they have been wronged. And that's what the museum's about. And that's what my book's about. Right. And this is for kids. And it's, I was reading it and I'm, uh, I forgot that it was for kids as I'm reading. I'm like, this is really, I didn't know that. This is really good. Uh, and then I go, oh, this is for kids. Uh, it's it, when you write simply, it doesn't matter who you're writing for. When we communicate, you should be able to talk to anybody at any age 
and it should be simple and inspiring. Would you say that you write for kids because all the things that are wrong in America are because we have forgotten what we teach our kids. Nobody would teach kids the behavior we see in adults. But if you've ever sat in a kindergarten class or a preschool or a high school, the, the behavior we see on Wall Street, corporate America, or politics would never be allowed in a school. No parent would condone that behavior. That's right. I think the problem has been that uh, ch children learn by example and they learn what they watch on TV. They learn what they see on the internet. They learn from their friends, they learn from their parents. And there are a lot of topics in the schools that are just not covered enough. Uh, remember that kids, kids are the future and that sounds corny, but if we don't teach our kids certain things, they will grow up having a prejudiced opinion about those things because we have not told them the truth and they have learned things either incorrectly or through articles and media that are not correct. So I think tort law is one of those things that may be a lot of misperceptions out there in adults. And we need to right. stop those in kids before they grow up to be adults. So let's talk about tort law. What is tort law? Are tort law cases uh, subjective? Are they nuanced? Can you arrive at a truth with, uh, with a tort law case? What is a tort, tort law? Torts are, it's from the uh, French word for wrong. So it's simply, put simply, a tort is a wrong. And when somebody has been wronged and injured by either a person or a thing or a service that's performed, then it is their constitutional right to be able to file a civil lawsuit. Just like when you have been injured physically, it's a criminal case that you, you, you don't file it, but the state will file it on your behalf against the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator. So a tort is just as important. A tort law is just as important because it is our right to protect ourselves against injury. And in, you know, hundreds of years ago, of course, the torts that existed were mainly against other people because there were no corporations per se at that time. But right. as in, in answer to your question, tort law can be very nuanced. And it's all about the details often that distinguish what's an actual legitimate case versus what's a uh, you know, not so much legitimate case. And one example that was in the news years ago was the hot coffee case, the McDonald's hot coffee yes. case. So many of us heard about that. And I remember hearing about it at the time. And we, you know, our first impression and some of the news reports uh, led us to believe this is, this is crazy. This is trivial. How could this you know, somebody spills coffee and then they have the, the company, the corporation has to pay for that. Well, the detail, the key detail there, the nuance was the temperature of the coffee. And in this case, it was, uh, you know, 30 or so degrees plus over the normal accepted temperature for a cup of hot coffee. And such that the woman suffered third degree burns over several parts of her body and had to have skin grafts and had to be hospitalized. So the nuance there, that detail, was very important. Now, another way to look at the nuances of tort law, a very good way is a slip and fall case. So let's take a slip and fall case in a supermarket. There are so many variations on that theme. Some of them legitimate, some of them you could sue, some of them you really couldn't. It really depends. For example, if your doctor you know, said you need to be bedridden, you can't walk, and you try going to the supermarket and you fall, Whose fault is that? If, if you spill something on the floor in the supermarket and you fall, whose fault is that? However, if the supermarket uh, employee spills something and neglects to, to clean it up, then that could be considered negligence. If the supermarket employees are playing a game with uh, some of the products on the shelf, throwing them at each other, that could be considered reckless if they don't cl clean it up. And if somebody goes and 
pours something intentionally on the floor and leaves it there for a customer to trip, that could be considered intentional. So those are three different nuances of types of torts that could be filed. Now, if a random person walks into the supermarket and spills something, then I don't think I could sue the supermarket. You know, I might have a case with that person. So these little nuances make such a big difference in who can sue and, and how you can sue. Right. I, I remember at the Tort Law Museum reading and watching the exhibit about the, the elderly woman who got the, the settlement from McDonald's because the coffee spilled on her lap. I remember as a comedy writer, we wrote jokes about this. It was frivolous lawsuits. And, you know, 80 year old woman spills coffee on her lap, gets two million dollars. I I wrote jokes for late night hosts about no, you know, no 80 year old woman has a lap that's worth two million dollars or whatever. And then I get to the tort museum. I, oh, my God, that is. And she pretty much. I don't have to say she died from the coffee, but it shortened her life. I mean, skin grafts, when you when you see what this hot, scalding coffee in a styrofoam cup, it doesn't tell you how hot the coffee is. And you learn that McDonald's has been repeatedly warned to dial back the heat and they didn't. Would there be tort? Would, would we need as many tort cases if the government regulated better? I think government regulation is important. I think it's hard for something, for example, like hot coffee, it's hard to, to have a regulation about that, but there are plenty of things where regulations could and do sometimes protect, such as regulations regarding safety and toys uh, that protect kids from uh, being injured. And of course, when you have a regulation and a company's violating that, then it becomes a different kind of case for if a company violates that, then the government then has a case uh, you know, against the company for violating the law and they can be fined. Uh, so it is a deterrent. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that so many, the, a majority of people who actually are wronged don't actually file a lawsuit or don't actually start the process of bringing a lawsuit. So while the, the Perhaps the common perception is that there are an overabundance of lawsuits, uh, tort lawsuits. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, and they really aren't because most people don't follow, uh, take, pursue the action that they could. And we've signed away our right to sue. Haven't we lost our constitutional right to sue corporations? We often will sign away our right or, or we'll will go for a settlement and there are often these mass settlements where uh, the part the, 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 the settlement class is several thousand or even million people who by accepting the settlement have given away their rights to sue and they're accepting what they what the uh, description may read you know you're entitled to it could be up to this much but depending on how many people if you do the math if if a million people accept that then you might wind up getting a dollar so right. It, it, it is a tricky situation with, uh, with civil law. And there's a lot of, uh, there's always been for the last at least 40, 50 years, there's been a movement to reform tort law, which is Ralph Nader likes to call tort deform, not reform, because it's really more about uh, limiting the rights of consumers and limiting the uh, awards that juries can, and can give. And so that becomes uh, a function of corporations and lobbyists trying to get politicians to push that legislation forward. I think when we sign up for Apple Music or Spotify or buy the computer, we sign, I think they're called adhesion contracts where we sign away our right by clicking, we agree to give up our right to sue the corporation that we would have to go into arbitration and those are the, the people who do the arbitration, the judges are hired by the corporations and the corporations will only hire judges who are friendly to the corporations. It's gotten harder and harder to sue 
And yet somehow we still believe there's frivolous lawsuits and bureaucratic red tape. It, it, it's almost as though there's uh, a propaganda to convince us otherwise. Uh, there, this is a, a great topic. Uh, you're writing this for kids and for what age? How do you like what? How young for this book? That's and by the way, it's called "Power to the People: A Young People's Guide to Fighting for Our Rights as Citizens and Consumers." And I'll give the Feldman guarantee: buy the book. If you don't like it, let me know, and I will reimburse you. That's what I stand behind this book. I've read it twice. Buy the book. And if it doesn't light your fire, I just let me know and I will reimburse you. This is a great gift for yourself, your kids and your grandkids. And you should buy 10 of these books and give them to your local library. That's a great right idea. Right now. Where, where can you buy this? Uh, you can buy this uh, through, there are several websites that offer it. Um, including the usual ones, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and then there's uh, the publisher's website, Seven Stories Press. Um, and, and to your question about the age group, my publishers have always asked me in the last uh, 20 years, you know, who are you writing? People have asked me who you're writing this for, for, for kids' books. And the answer is always, like you said, it's you read it and you forget that it's for kids. I don't write down, I write up so that whoever's reading it can be enlightened, not feel like they're being talked down to. But I think for this book, generally speaking, it's it's kind of the it ages 10 to 16 area, but 10 to 106 is more, you know, more appropriate right. because it's really, it's really trying to boil it down and make it clear so that anybody can benefit. There's been uh, so much of an anti-democratic push in this country. There, there is a feeling that Americans are too stupid to make decisions for themselves. Jay Leno did a thing called jaywalking where he would ask American citizens, you know, what is the First Amendment? Uh, how old do you have to be to vote in this country? And we would all laugh at how stupid ordinary Americans are how ill-informed they are, but it reinforced the belief that democracy cannot be trusted with the American people. I'm not blaming Jay Leno, but uh, we laugh at what people don't know. Uh, I think the media is somewhat to blame for assuming, they assume we know things that we don't know. They use terms that we don't know, they, they, they're so busy uh, having people argue without explaining what the building blocks of this argument are. Uh, and it behooves all of us to go back to square one and read the stuff that you're writing that should be taught in our schools, I hope it is, but chances are not all of it is being taught World War II, for example, a book about World War II that you wrote for kids. And you look at what's happening now with Tennessee banning a graphic novel about the Holocaust. I would think World War II would be a difficult subject to teach right now. Are, are fascists bad? Can an argument be made in this country? I mean, how close are we to uh, World War II? I'm being serious. You, what you're saying about Mussolini and fascism, how many years away are we from people saying, well, there's another side to World War II that you're not, te why aren't you talking about all the good that Mussolini and Hitler did? How, how many years away are we from that? It's scary, but I, it seems like we're not that far away. But one thing I did in my book, World War II for Kids, is unlike a lot of other writers tackling the subject, I actually talked to people who had lived under Hitler 
not just got this American perspective, but I, I, I interviewed people who lived in Germany at the time, they weren't soldiers, but they lived there and they lived through the war and look at it from their eyes so that everyone who reads the book can see the perspective of people in all, in all those, on all the sides of the, the coin and, and understand the war from a holistic perspective. So that's what I try to do is be holistic because that's the only right. way we're ever gonna understand things in reality. And when I say holistic, I don't mean saying Mussolini's great. I mean saying this is somebody who lived, you know, in, in a burn, bombed out building in, in Berlin and they were scared to death and war is terrible and fascism is, fascism is terrible. And so that's what I try to get. So it's kind of a horrific, in a way it's horrific, but it's very uh, real. Right. Do you talk about Lindbergh? Joseph Kennedy, the isolationists who were against taking on Hitler? I talked about isolationism, yes, in the beginning of the book, um, always coming up against the publisher uh, with regards to space and their interest in saving money and not having too many pages in my books. In, in my books uh, about the Supreme Court, I had to cut a third of my text which would have, you know, which I thought was relevant because they didn't want to uh, have it be too long. So this is a problem uh, with 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 writing books uh, like this, nonfiction books, is that you have stuff that's important and it gets cut because of, of space issues. Yeah, I started this show talking about, you know, Joe Rogan and the controversy over bringing on these crackpot COVID scientists who claim vaccines are killing people and we need to hear all sides of a story that's faux intellectualism and it reminds me of the holocaust deniers it's the same playbook you know we're coming up on the anniversary of the Wannacy convention where uh, the third reich dreamed up the final solution and there are documents that survive now you could read those documents and never see the words exterminate the Jews, exterminate the gypsies. But that is incontrovertible evidence that there was a design to systematically eliminate millions and millions of Jews from Europe. And I, as I'm reading about the Wannacy Convention, I'm thinking, well, you know, Joe Rogan should have a Holocaust denier on who goes over this memo from the Wannacy Convention point by point saying there's no evidence here that they were talking about the Jews and exterminating them and we don't I don't see the word Zyklone B uh how do you teach kids absolute platonic truths that the Holocaust did happen that vaccines cure COVID without it being a value judgment. Do we need to hear both sides of a story, even though if the other story is lunacy? In, in my book, I the, the best thing that I did with the Holocaust in my book is I had a very long and uh, frightening firsthand account by a survivor who's telling the story of uh, being in the camps and the conditions and then being freed and then having to, this is the part that a lot of people don't know is once they were freed, uh, most of these people had then a long trip by foot or, to, you know, they had to find their way home. And a lot of them died on that, on that way home. So those words in my book, the words of the people themselves are the biggest, most powerful uh, right. set. Right. Uh, We're out of time. Will you, will you come back? Whoops. Sorry. Will you come back? Yeah. I, I, we've only scratched the surface and uh, we've been talking with Richard Panchik. Go by Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers. Go by Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers what i love about your book and i've reread it is it doesn't insult a child's intelligence 
and it empowers a child, we cannot be paralyzed right now. We cannot allow this tsunami of bad information to convince us to just lose ourselves in virtual reality and the Super Bowl. We have to fight. We were given, this is what is so great about Ralph Nader. He reminds us that we were given the tools by our deeply flawed founding fathers to fight for the here and now. It's there right in front of you. Take it, because the other side is. They're taking it. They want you to feel confused and paralyzed. But this book reminds us that, the, that what we're fighting for are values so basic, a, a, a child can understand it. We're fighting not just for our children, we're fighting for ba the basic building blocks of humanity that any child would fight for. Go buy right now, Power to the People, A Young People's Guide to Fighting for Our Rights as Citizens and Consumers. Buy it right now. I will reimburse you. If this book doesn't light a fire underneath you, I will reimburse you and, and give this book to, to, to teenagers and children and, and yourself and buy it for libraries and get fighting. Because as Ralph says, it's easier than you think, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll give you the last word, please. Then we go. I would just say that um, everyone, uh, change starts with one person. Change always starts with one person. And Ralph Nader has proven that time and again. So I think everyone out there who thinks that they can't make affect change in this world, whether political or otherwise, needs to remember that it just starts with you and a movement can begin and change can happen. And that's very yeah. simple. Thank you. I'm very proud to have you on the show, Richard Panchik, so author of Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers. Buy this book. I hope to see you soon, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. And people should visit the Tort Museum in Winstead, Connecticut. It's also virtual, so you can visit yes. it online. Thank you, Richard. When we come back, Howie Klein. I have two moral compasses, Howie Klein and Ralph Nader. I do whatever they tell me to do. Howie Klein joins us, and he will bring to us another candidate who we must support. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. We'll be right back. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Let us now go to California, where Howie Klein is standing by with a guest. Howie Klein, founder, treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for the best candidates for office, and he writes Down With Tyranny. Hello, Howie. 
Hey, David, why did you play that song instead of uh, Curtis Mayfield? Uh, Curtis May- Mayfield's song or, or John Lennon's song? What, oh, Power to the People or The People Have the Power by Patty Yeah, yeah, yeah. Power to the People. Because people like you who used to work in the record industry. Oh, no, not sense. people like me, people who I didn't like who worked in the record industry. Uh, will ding me. I'll have to pay. I'll, I, I will have to pay a, a king's ransom to pay to play and pay Patti Smith's The People Have the Power. Well, why don't you introduce us to our guest, please? No, no, before I, before I do, I mean, I really want to introduce you to Neil, but before I do, I just wanted to say something about um, what you were saying a minute ago about the, uh, the right having using the tools that we have. Uh, I was just like reading about um, uh, someone running as a Republican, of course, as for the state Senate in Michigan and someone else running, I think he was running for governor or something in Michigan. And they're, they're telling people to, to bring guns to the polling place. If you don't like, if you don't, if you're not happy with what you're seeing at the polling place, if you think justice is being violated, bring a gun. Right. <laughs> so they're using tools too. Yeah. So Neil Walia is, is a, is a, a new candidate for us. Anyway, he's been running for some time he'll, as I'll tell you, but he, he, Blue America just endorsed him about a week and a half ago. And he's running in the district that is basically Denver. It's Denver County and it's, it's the whole city of Denver. And th- right now there's a, a, a congresswoman there and she's not terrible. She's just there. She, she's, you know, it's not like she's a blue dog or a new dem, but she's not, also not a progressive. And this is a very, very progressive city where there should be someone who is pushing out the boundaries. And, and, when, and once I, I, I met Neil, I realized that he's, he's a, a real cutting edge kind of guy. And that's the kind of person that we can definitely use in a place like, uh, like Denver. You know, it's, it's much, much harder in some of the other districts, not just in Colorado, but around the country, where, you know, there are people who buy all this bullshit about uh, moderates and conservative Democrats and all that kind of stuff. But that isn't Denver. Denver is, is tailor-made for Neil. And uh, so let's bring Neil's on, 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 on the call now, right? Yes, he is. And I want everybody, before you bring him on, to go to neilwaliaforcongress.com, N-E-A-L-W-A-L-I-A, for congress.com, or the Blue America Pack, and give him money. I don't ask you for much. He's endorsed by Howie Klein. That's all you need to know. Give him money, give him money, give him money. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, well, what about saying that you'll reimburse everybody just like you will for, they, for if they buy the book? I wish, you know, I wish I had that kind of money. I, I wish You're going to reimburse if they buy that book, though? I, I think it's against the law to, yes, re- you're right. to reimburse oh, people for campaign contributions. Otherwise, you would do it. But I'll pray for them. And I got a really powerful new Something. God. My new God, I'll pray for you. Neil, are you there? <laughs> I'm here, and uh, I appreciate the high praise, Howie, and it's a pleasure to be on your show, David. Thank you for lending me your platform and giving me the opportunity. Good. Well, why don't you uh, introduce yourself the way you would like people to, uh, to know who you are rather than the way I just did? <laughs> That sounds good. Uh, And I think the best way to kind of tell people who I am is to kind of tell you about where I come from, but also where my parents come from. So uh, I'm the son of Indian immigrants. I'm the first person in my family to be born in the United States of America. And um, I'm going to start by telling you all a story about the time I went to visit uh, my parents' home uh, in Old Delhi. Now, they took us there one year when I was about 13 years old to visit extended family. And one afternoon, they took us out onto a bazaar and I'm not sure if any of you have been to India before, but I think for y'all who have, you know that a bazaar means dirt roads. It means stores on your right, stores on your left. It means tens of thousands of people as far as your eyes can see. And, you know, one afternoon we were making our way through this crowd and I remember we stumbled upon this young boy. Now this young boy had to have been the same age as I was, same haircut, same skin color, same eyes. And yet this young boy was absolutely begging for his life without a single piece of clothing on his body. Now, I remember looking at this boy and thinking to myself in that moment, how is it possible that this young man who comes from the same part of the world as my parents, the same culture, the same heritage, has absolutely nothing, yet I get to go home every single night to a roof over my head, 
to warm clothes and to food in my belly every single day. Now, the real tragedy of this story is that that story is happening right here in my city in Denver, Colorado. And that reality is the reason why my parents came to the United States of America. It was to escape that reality, to come here in pursuit of what was known as the American dream. And like my parents, I've taken every step that I've been told to build a better life for me and my loved ones. I'm someone who's been privileged enough to go to undergrad and graduate school. I have two master's degrees. I've taught English. I worked for a former governor and that took me out to the halls of Congress where I spent five years of my career working in Washington DC. And yet in spite of taking all of these steps, in spite of doing everything that I've been told to do to make a better life for me and my loved ones, my life feels more vulnerable than it's ever felt. Um, I can't afford to buy a, city, a home in the city that I love. Uh, I'm being crushed by a lifetime of student debt. Uh, cost of childcare is something that actively prevents me from starting my family with my wife. And you know something that's personally important to me, which is to see my parents retire. My parents are choosing, or I should say, are being forced to not retire because of the economic insecurity that not only they face, but because they feel like they still have a role to play in providing security uh, to their children. And feeling all of these pressures accumulate in my life and having worked in the public sector for my career and knowing that there are tens of millions of Americans who are going through the same thing as I am, if not totally worse, I decided to run for Congress. And that is why I'm running for office. It's because I believe that our communities deserve to have a representative who is living their struggles, but more importantly, will fight to fix them as if their lives depended on it. Because in this moment, my life does. Um, and that is why I'm running for office and that is who I am as a person. Thank you. Neil, when, when I first talked to you uh, and we started to get to know each other a little bit, one of the things that uh, impressed me the most was your commitment to the, uh, the housing problem. And, and that's not just a problem in Denver. That, that's a problem all over the country. In fact, it's some, some people are telling me that there are uh, some other candidates have been telling me that when they talk to people, um, to their own constituents, whether it's in Seattle or here in California or back on the East Coast, just everywhere, even, even in rural districts, someone from Montana was telling me that, that the other day, that the, the biggest problem that they say they're facing is, is, um, is, is the housing crisis and a growing and increasing housing crisis. And when you and I talked about it, you brought it up as well. So can you tell us a little bit about what a member of Congress can do, what you think you can do to address the housing crisis? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that's actually a major priority for me when I'm elected into office. I want to end homelessness in the United States of America. And I believe that we have the resources as a country to do that. I actually believe we've always had the ability to end homelessness. And I'll give everybody kind of a picture of what's happening here in Denver. Uh, in last year alone, we saw our unhoused population double. Uh, since 2021. Uh, and that has been happening uh, on a regular pattern for the last several years. And what is also happening in Denver right now is that our city has a very, very real relationship with corporate real estate. And so the public private model that we currently operate on simply doesn't have the capacity to put every single unhoused person into a unit. Or I should, I should change my phrasing on that. We have more units available than we do unhoused neighbors. And yet, because the private sector monetizes the most vulnerable amongst us, they will never allow those who are chronically homeless, those who need to be housed the most, to ever occupy those units because those individuals don't have the ability to put money into the pockets of their landlords. So that is the environment that we are in in Denver right now. So let's talk about what the federal government can do to end homelessness in the United States of America. The first step is to build, or I should say, to create a new vehicle for public housing that injects 50 to $100 billion across the country of the federal government's budget into permanent supportive housing that is available for every single human being, no matter what. The first step of ending homelessness in the United States of America is to put people into homes. That's it. Now, in order to take a step beyond that, because I think we all recognize that uh, it takes much more than just a house over your head to build a dignified life for yourself. We have to give the unhoused, we have to give every American universal health care. Health care is a human right. 
and we should treat it that way. That's why I support Medicare for All. That's why I also believe that under Medicare for All, mental health services in particular should be provided to every single member of our population, especially the unhoused, because once our unhoused neighbors, once other people are put into those units, they will need to heal. They will need to recover. They will need to build themselves uh, out of the trauma that they've accumulated for you know, the last several years in order to stabilize. And that's why I believe that they need not only housing, but I believe all of us need healthcare. Now, the final step of that equation for our people who are unhoused and for who, who can work, and I wanna make that point clear, who have the ability to work, we should set forth a federal job guarantee, couple that with the Green New Deal, which says, there will be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs through the Green New Deal that we need to create in order to save this country from a very real climate catastrophe. And in that federal job guarantee, we can target certain populations like the unhoused, who may have historically not had the ability to gain employment for a number of reasons. I think most of us recognize that many of our unhoused neighbors may have felonies on their backgrounds. Um, we can say that for certain populations that have historically not been able to work, there will be a place at the table for you in this federal job guarantee that allows you to take that step forward and build a better life uh, for yourself and to live a life with dignity and to participate in this society that we all want to see. And so in I, those if I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is something I feel very passionate about. Sure. Where do you stand on the mortgage interest deduction? Should homeowners be allowed to deduct the interest on their mortgage, but renters not allowed to deduct uh, their rent on their income taxes. Um, can you explain a little bit more what that means technically? So can you just frame kind of the impact? Well, the homeowner, I think, well, I guess in a, in a broader sense, and I, I, I don't want to eat into Howie's time here. In a broader, no, no, that's okay. This is a good topic. It, we have you read about what's going on in Los Angeles with the homelessness and everybody is saying we need to do something and it's an all of the above everybody it's 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 it reminds me of what Exxon says about climate change we need all of the above solutions no we need to put Exxon out of business that's and with homelessness you said it the problem is there aren't enough homes the problem is, though, when you get to Washington, don't you think the Democrats, the people on our side are going to say to you, Congressman, your, your heart's in the right place. But if we start building housing, that's going to create too much housing and property values will go down. You're going to create a glut of housing. We, we you know, our speaker owns $100 million worth of real estate. You want you you build more housing she's only going to be worth 50 million instead of 100 million what are you going to say to those forces david that did that wasn't your question that you started with well it, it's, it's part of a larger you, I you think, about, about uh, to get to like the larger crux of that which the is larger the larger picture is that people make a lot of money yeah because there's a shortage of housing yeah definitely and i I definitely understand that. Um, and I think that, you know, that pressure is on us as a society in every facet of what we turn, what we're trying to do, especially as progressives. And I think what we have to have the courage to do is to do what's morally right. Uh, instead of focusing on profit maximization, we need to be focusing on humanity. Uh, and we need to be focusing on building people from the bottom up. And I think that the way I kind of think about the economic side of homelessness uh, that maybe people are talking about in your example is, you know, we actually already pay for our unhoused neighbors every single day, uh, independent of what our property values are, you know, for every, you know, arrest, uh, for every emergency trip, for every jail uh, cell that's occupied for our unhoused neighbors, we pay for that uh, every single day. Uh, as taxpayers. And I think there are a number of studies and academic case studies that will show that it actually would cost us less as a society uh, to house every single person uh, who is unhoused as opposed to creating, 
kind of going down the same pathway that we've been going down uh, as a country for decades. And so for me, I think there's tremendous economic value that comes with putting people into units and to actually creating uh, an economy that values human dignity, that values uh, fair labor, that makes sure that every single one of us is able to participate in an inclusive economy instead of one that you've kind of already highlighted as being predatory in nature. So that's kind of how I would answer your question. I don't think I answered the technical part of that as well as I could have, but generally that's how I think about this issue uh, on a larger scale. Great, great, great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Wait, and what, what sort of um, response do you get outside of the activist, com not so not in the activist community, but other people as you're campaigning, H how do they feel about these kind of proposals uh, that, you, that you, or do you talk with them? I assume you're talking with them about housing and the unhoused. How, 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 what kind of reaction do you get? Well, I mean, it really depends on the individual that I'm talking to, right? I think that what's really special about Denver here is that we have a D plus 24 district. And so when Howie is saying that Denver is progressive. I mean, this might be the most progressive district on this side of the United States of America. And so there are actually a lot of Denverites, a lot of progressive individuals who understand exactly what I'm saying, and they will support that uh, because they understand the, the pragmatics, they understand the policy. But, you know, I usually don't get hesitation from folks uh, on my policy ideas. Actually, I think most people are in line uh, with people who support ending homelessness. They support the Green New Deal here. They support Medicare for all. Like everyone in Denver is united around that. I receive more uh, conflict from people who are rooted in the establishment, people who are currently profiting and benefiting off of the status quo uh, that currently uh, have a positive relationship with our sitting incumbent uh, that don't want things to change. And um, that is a big presence here in Denver, but at the end of the day, uh, what we're seeing happening right here in Denver is a transformation. Uh, people, unfortunately, are more aware of the fact that the status quo uh, is, is brutal. Uh, people have uh, been crippled uh, by the economy. Uh, people cannot find jobs, you know, the small businesses are getting wiped out left and right. And they recognize now more than ever that we have to transform. We have to change from the way we've been doing things, but uh, like, you know, David alluded to, there are a lot of people who currently make a lot of money off the way we do things now. And th that's where I get more resistance. It's about people who are asking me, well, why would you challenge a Democrat? Why would you challenge a sitting incumbent with seniority? It's not my policy ideas that get attacked. It's really just kind of the, the spirit of my campaign and bringing you know, a challenger to someone who's been around the block for a quarter century. And how do you answer that, by the way? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for me, I have always believed in the power of storytelling, right? For me, I'm trying to make people feel something because I think that, like I said, a lot of people get the policy ideas, right? People are united over here on what it means to be progressive, why healthcare should be a human right and all of these things. But um, what I want to inspire people by is showing them that there is someone here who is living their struggles. There is someone here who empathizes with the American struggle that so many of us are facing. I think beyond that, uh, there are also people here who recognize that corporate PACs are ruining the Democratic National Party. And so for me, I have never made this campaign about the individual. I will never attack Congresswoman DeGette. I'll even go so far as to say that I think when she started her career 25 years ago, she brought the progressive spirit that really made Denver a special place. She was one of the few women in Congress. She had a JD background. She was bringing issues to the table that not a lot of people were talking about, specifically women's reproductive rights. We should give her credit on those issues. But the thing I ask everyone is, what happens to any candidate, any politician who's been in one seat for 25 years, who has accepted upwards of $5 million in corporate PAC money throughout their career? They become stagnant. They become committed to the party, they put party over country, they put their donors over country, and they no longer commit to community. And that is what I am trying to challenge here. I'm trying to bring a people powered community focused campaign to the citizen, or sorry, I should say to the constituents of our district that can actually transform uh, the society that is currently oppressing us. So 
that is typically kind of the uh, story that I tell when people resist uh, kind of the nature of why I'm, I'm challenging our, our incumbent. Have you, uh, and, and uh, to get um, debated yet or, or had a community forum or anything like that? So I don't think, I'll just put it this way. If I'm Congresswoman Baguette, I'm not likely going to treat me uh, seriously until I make the ballot. Now, uh, I have until March 15th to collect 1,500 signatures to make it onto the ballot. I will tell you that I will be on the ballot 100%. Uh, I have full confidence in that. And so I don't think there is necessarily a reason for her at this moment in time to debate us. But I will tell you that there are a lot of people in the community out here who are looking for that to happen. And thankfully, uh, our grassroots campaign has now secured the endorsements from people like not only Blue America, but Marianne Williamson that was endorsed by the National Working Families Party, Progressive Democrats of America. We have a number of state and local uh, officials here who will begin to endorse us in the near future. And I think that once we're on the ballot, once we've kind of built that pressure, uh, we are hoping very, very soon for that debate to take place. And you know, I'm looking forward to having uh, many conversations with Congresswoman DeGette leading into the primary. Right. So, um, is when you forget for a minute what, what you want to talk to your um, to your voters about. What, what do they bring up to you? What, what do they say they're, uh, they're What are they looking for that uh, that the federal government could help them with that they don't feel they're getting now, and they think that maybe uh, they'd be interested in you if you could help them with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're talking about my generation, which is, you know, the millennial generation, and this isn't just a Colorado problem. I mean, this is nationwide, right? I mean, we're talking about individuals who are in my position who can't afford to buy homes, um, especially in, you know, the cities uh, like Denver that they've been raised in. Um, people want to take that step. That's what they're talking about. More importantly, uh, everyone here in Colorado is unified uh, on battling the climate crisis, right? People are genuinely concerned uh, with the state of our environment. I mean, I think you all know that we had uh, the largest fire that we've ever had as a state. It was called the Marshall Fire. Upwards of 600 homes were destroyed in December. Think about that for a second. We are having wildfires that we typically have in the summer happening in December. And so people are gravely aware that there is a threat, there is an existential threat upon us and they are committed, they are excited for someone to champion the Green New Deal, to break away from the oil and gas industry that continues to fund every politician in our state, even progressives, right? And I think that is something people are really excited about. It's someone who is detached from the status quo that has essentially helped build the problem that we are going through as a city and as a state right now. Um, and I think people are really excited for someone uh, to go to Washington DC and speak real truth to power. Um, I think right now there are so many, so many progressives who are frustrated with the Democratic Party. And I'll say sometimes that it honestly feels like the Democratic Corporation uh, who is prioritizing their donors and uh, corporate PAC money uh, over actually making a difference in the lives of of their people. So they want someone who's actually going to go to DC and not just talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. Is there anyone uh, in Congress now who you would look forward to, um, you know, working with and uh, writing legislation with and, uh, you know, someone who you admire and respect? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think, when I think about the people who are doing it right, in my opinion, most of those individuals are the members of the squad, right? We're talking about uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, we're talking about Representative Omar, we're talking about Representative Ayanna Presley. And I'll even go so far to say is, there are some members in my very state that I think are uh, doing well on certain issues, right? Uh, our representative uh, in the second congressional district, his name is Joe Nagoose. He's the first uh, African-American to ever be elected into the history of Colorado to represent us in Congress. Uh, he is a major proponent of certain components of the Green New Deal, specifically the Civilian Climate Corps. I would love to partner with individuals on those efforts. And for me, it's about people who really are committing to the transformational progressive policies that we recognize can change the lives of our, our country, of our people. 
And so those are the types of individuals I'm really hoping to build partnerships with. But beyond that, you know, I often think about how legislating in Congress, you know, it's a broken vehicle in a lot of ways, right? Like the types of ideas that I'm championing, these are bold transformational ideas that will take time uh, to move the country forward on, which is why I am expecting once I'm elected, it's not enough to just put your name onto a bill. You've got to be ready to organize. You've got to be ready to advocate. You've got to get ready to stand with community, local government, state government, and empower your region to motivate other individuals, especially Democrats, to move beyond the status quo, to commit to the types of transformational policies that we are hoping to achieve so that someday in the future, we are able to say that the United States has a universal healthcare system, to say that every person in the United States of America has a home, to say that every single person in this country uh, won't wake up um, you know, to being terrorized by, let's say, ICE, uh, other institutions of our government um, that have really been harming our communities, especially immigrant communities like the ones I come from. And so um, that is hope, something that I'm really hoping to do when I'm when I'm in Washington and uh, I hope to partner with people who are like-minded uh, like I am. www.neilwalia for Congress, N-E-A-L-W-A-L-I-A for Congress. Go there right now. We need to send you to Congress. Once again, Howie Klein, if he's endorsed by Howie Klein, that's, we don't even need to have you on the show. We just need to have Howie say, give you money yeah. and we give you money. No, no, you're, I hope you come back. Thank you, Howie. I'd love to come Thank back. You. And the last pitch I'll make to all of the listeners here is that you have the opportunity to help us make history in the first congressional district by sending the first person of color in the history of this district to represent our communities in Washington, DC. But more importantly than that, the only individual in this entire state at the federal level who doesn't accept money from corporations. And so please donate generously to this campaign. Campa candidates like me are not meant to succeed in this political climate. And yet we are on the cusp of making real history for our communities. And so thank you again, David, so much for having me on here. I look forward to being back. Thank you I for supporting this campaign. And thank you everybody here for tuning in. And I look forward to you being in Congress and Howie and I saying, I was going to make a joke. I look forward to seeing you in Congress. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Thanks, David. Talk to you next week, I hope. Thank you. Let us now go to California. We're back in California where David Cobb is joining us. He is a lawyer, but a good, a good lawyer. We don't hold that against him. He ran for president on the Green Party ticket. And before that, he ran Ralph Nader's presidential campaign in Texas. And he's got his finger in a million different projects like public banking. Welcome, David. Can we pick up? I know you come loaded with stuff you want to talk about, but I want to pick up on the conversation that we were just having with Neil. When Bill Clinton became president, Democrats said, and I, and I heard it from Obama, and Biden. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. As though it was settled as to who America is, as opposed to Kennedy, Johnson, and Roosevelt, who told us who we should be. I don't want to be pigeonholed anymore by my candidates. Don't tell me who we are, because I know who we are, and it ain't pretty. I want a candidate who tells me who we should be. That's what leadership is. We, I don't need you to tell me who we are as a people. I, I want to march somewhere. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, David, uh, thank you for framing it so uh, clearly and unambiguously. Uh, I completely agree with how you've assessed it. I only had the privilege of hearing probably the last uh, maybe seven to 10 minutes of uh, Neil, uh, but it was, it was inspirational. It was profound. Uh, I loved the clear and unequivocal 
uh, description of the Democratic Party leadership uh, as a corporatist and his pledge uh, to do different. And here's the other thing that I heard very clearly and unambiguously, I will not seek nor will I accept corporate money. Uh, so uh, what I will say is this, I think that what we're experiencing now in this election cycle, uh, and not just this election cycle, but in this historic moment, is really a, uh, a genuine struggle for what, it, what America is actually going to mean. Uh, uh, now, I have a, uh, an assessment, uh, an understanding that the uh, social, political, and economic institutions in the next, from now to the next five years, will determine whether we are some version of fascist or some version of eco-socialist. But the neoliberal center is literally collapsing before our eyes. So what, not, and whether I like it or not, right? It, it, and whether your viewers and listeners like it or not, it is my assessment that that is what is objectively happening because of the ecological catastrophe and the economic catastrophe and late stage capitalism and rising fascism. What I don't hear enough in democratic party circles are people speaking so clearly and unambiguously as Neil spoke about what actually needs to be done. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we, we need to talk about what is our aspiration? What do we want America to be? Uh, because what America is now is fundamentally racist, fundamentally sexist, fundamentally class oppressive, and our social, political, and economic institutions are destroying the planet. Yes. It is an election year. And one of the th great things about seeing Neil and you, I'm, I spent the weekend curled up in a ball, terrified. And then you meet people like Neil and people who are doing things and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop reading, stop watching television, stop thinking. Things aren't as bad as uh, they really are. <laughs> they are. Listen, I gotta, I, I will say, keep thinking right right and remember like and this is really uh sincere david that i think that it's important to remember that theory is our understanding of how the world operates right uh and uh, it is an interconnected set of beliefs and ideas uh about how things work so theory is critically important and thinking is critically important and acting is equally important done well we have a theoretical understanding that we then put into practice in action and then we're willing to constantly reevaluate both our theory and our action i often say that theory without action is mere contemplation but action without theory is just doing shit. right right like there is no such thing as a strategic planning without a theoretical understanding of how society operates how things work right and what i was really impressed by in again seven to ten minutes listening to neil neil has a clear understanding of how power is operating in this system i don't have to agree with him on every single policy issue i don't even have to agree with him on what party to affiliate with when i hear him talk i hear somebody who understands how unaccountable power operates and how mass movements and ordinary people are capable of governing themselves. So like, again- You ran, you ran for president on the Green Party ticket. You managed Ralph Nader's campaign in Texas for the Green Party. Bernie, I think is the greatest politician of the 21st century. I think he's a miracle of democracy. He distilled everything down to Medicare for all. This was a socialist in his mid to late seventies who has heard every argument, has sat in every committee, 
heard every side of every story and concluded there's one issue to lead on, and that is Medicare for all. Do we run the problem of not focusing on one specific thing? The right wants one thing, money, 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 money. They'll, they'll throw millions of shiny objects like critical race theory and transgender people using the bathroom. But this is they want money. Well, it's a, I, first of all, I disagree with you. I think that that the the the, uh, the broad swath of uh, the conservative movement is actually not nearly that monolithic. There is clearly a, a very big component of it that are just greedy pigs. Um, that's definitely true. Uh, I also disagree that uh, Bernie ran only on Medicare for all. Uh, Bernie actually, like at least in my mind and almost everybody else was, Bernie was constantly railing against the billionaire class, right? And so Medicare for all was one of his signatures, but so was the climate crisis. So was racial justice. Bernie actually had a, a very comprehensive program, right, of, of policy proposals. But what his, I believe his genius was to be on message constantly uh, that was, he had, he had a narrative and that narrative had a villain and it had a hero. And the hero were ordinary people just like you and me and, uh, and the villains were the billionaire class. So I just have to- I'm gonna back. push back a little. I'm gonna push back, back a little. My recollection of Bernie was similar to Mayor de Blasio of New York City, who ran on universal preschool. He said, vote for me and you will get universal preschool. People voted for him. They got universal preschool. You can really run on one issue. If you want to get elected, I think you have to stand for one thing. You have to distill your campaign down to one issue. And I think Bernie's campaign would have been about, had he made it to the general, Medicare for all. Yes, of course, the Green New Deal, free tuition at all public universities, forgiving student debt. But the bedrock of his campaign would have been Medicare for all. And I worry that we're not we're doing that all of the above as opposed to no we're going to put the health insurance companies out of business first and then everything will all good will flow from that why can't we concretize everything into one and stand for one thing medicare for all listen uh, uh, because you're back to the the earlier comment like because we don't run for office only candidates are able to to run for office uh, and 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 run their messaging campaign. So I will say, I'll just like for folks who don't know this, uh, the Labor Party, which was an effort to do exactly what you're talking about, specifically and and, and very seriously from uh, '96 to 2004, whenever they they finally just closed up shop, their their whole point was. We exist to advocate for Medicare for all. So that approach was actually kind of tried. Uh, but the problem is that only candidates and campaigns can articulate a campaign message. And, you know, I, I, I do like, like what I remember about Bernie Sanders and the slogan was not me, us. A uh, political revolution is coming. A, a future to That's Obama in. clap trap. That's those are Obama bromides. They, that means nothing. Look at, look at Bernie Sanders. Sanders for all. Go to go to Bernie Sanders website, and and uh, that's what you would have found. Those were the right. slogans that he used. The policy positions included Medicare for all or healthcare. I think he called it healthcare for all. He also talked about uh, a Green New Deal, and he talked about uh, racial justice uh, issues. I mean. Part of what I was so in, inspired uh, and impressed by Bernie Sanders is that he had and the ability to get into a policy discussion at the drop of a hat, but his clarity was around a political analysis about power. And I think that that is why 
I have cousins, rural Texans, who voted for Donald Trump, who told me, uh, basically, screw Hillary Clinton, but I would have voted for Bernie. Right. And I, I can't tell you how many folks in my own personal orbit said that. And I do believe Bernie Sanders would have beaten Donald Trump. I also believe that the Democratic Party leadership would have rather, I'm not saying they wanted Donald Trump. I'm saying they would have rather risked Donald Trump than allow Bernie Sanders to have actually won uh, the, the Democratic Party's nomination. When you ran for president, you ran for president. What was your single issue? What, did you have a single issue? I did. Uh, and my, my single issue was, let's make the promise of democracy a reality. And my whole point was that we have been, I was promised uh, a, that, that in this country, we would be the great shining light on the hill. And that not only were we special, but that we were going to bring democracy to the rest of the world. And I grew up and I realized that I had been lied to. And although I could accept that, uh, uh, that lie was not told to me viciously by Mrs. Armstrong, my third grade teacher, or my mother, or uh, all of the other people who loved me. See, they told that lie because they believed it. They thought mistakenly that the United States was a democracy. And I've come to, co I've come to grips with the fact that there's not a Santa Claus, that there's not an Easter bunny, and that there's not a tooth fairy. But I'll be damned if I'm gonna go gently into the good night that the United States doesn't get to be a democracy. So I'm gonna fight like hell to make this country the democratic republic that it's supposed to be. And it's never been that. That's kind of the point, right? There is no great future to go or past to go back to from the founding of this country. 5% of the people were of we the people were actually people with inherent and alienable rights that would be protected under law. From the founding of like again, the rejection of monarchy as a form of rule, way to go founders, that's worth saving. But the idea of protecting property rights over human rights, the idea of manifest destiny, the idea of slavery, the idea that women uh, are not the equals of men, like we got to get rid of this founder fetishism. We got to actually look long and hard in the mirror and say, who is it that we want to be? And what I want to be is part of a society that is loving, compassionate, racially and socially just and ecologically sustainable. And that's what I'm fighting for. And if like, and honestly, David, like I no longer try to convince people, right? If that, if that doesn't inspire them, okay, I've got, I'm, I'm creating that world here in Humboldt County with Cooperation Humboldt. And I kind of, uh, uh, I find it very humorous that there are all these folks who love to pontificate, but are actually not organizing anybody. I agree with You're you. You're actually organizing people and it's working. Right, right. What, what did you come loaded for tonight? You know, it's interesting because I, what I came loaded for, what, what I came thinking that we were going to talk about uh, and what might be interesting to talk about uh, is the fact that fascism is in fact rising in this country uh, and that the leader, like, look, I, I really want to acknowledge that uh, you know, I will critique the leadership of the Democratic Party as neoliberals, right? So I'm not a Democratic Party apologist. And we have to come to terms with the fact that the current leadership of the Republican Party are neo-Confederates and neo-fascists. Like this is no, like I disagreed with almost every policy position that came from George W. Bush, that came uh, from George Bush, that came from Ronald Reagan, but they were not fascists. This current Republican, like, we should stop for a moment because I saw your facial expression, because fascism has a particular ideology. Uh, and uh, the social, political, and economic ideology of Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and these folks are different than what you were hearing from Ronald well, Reagan. My understanding of fascism is corporate controlled government with a strong military. Ah, but the difference- the racism, the racism, we, we didn't see the racism that comes with fascism in the Bush administration, but it was there. There was the demonization of the LGBTQ community. 
that we saw. Again, you'll you'll never you'll never hear me uh, trying to promote or even defend or protect uh, the Republican Party ideology. What I'm saying is that fascism requires a mass base of agreement on a level of how to organize all aspects of society. And what we're seeing with, like, look, remember this, Ronald Reagan and the Bushes respected the result of elections, right? Like that, like I, I, I what I'm trying to get oh, to- Oh, I'm not trying to be difficult. Okay. 2000? Look, I think George Bush successfully stole an election using the uh, using the electoral process because Al Gore refused to fight for the election that he actually won because, just to name it, instead of actually asking for a statewide recount in 2000, uh, he instead only uh, asked for recounts in three counties uh, and uh, and then lost those. Right? Like he he did. Like he chose poorly. But what I'm saying is that what we're seeing with Donald Trump and the big lie is literally at a full scale abdication of even the pretense of bourgeois democracy. Again, yeah. the empire, like let's just call it a continuation at best, right? Like what I'm saying is the, the, the acuteness of what this ecological and economic crisis is uh, that we're experiencing is making it even more clear. Because I could just as easily argue that under uh, Bill Clinton and the Obama administrations, there was the same basic uh, policies underway, right? What I'm saying is we are, there is a quickening that is happening and I'm not seeing the Democratic Party leadership in any way, shape or form rise to the challenge. Well, yes. Uh... I don't want to diminish how dangerous this Republican Party is, but they uh, have, they've never changed. <laughs> they just haven't. I, I don't see the, the, the changes that Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, these people never used to get the amount of press that they get now. They, but that's part of it, but they were never in Congress either. They oh, were never in the mass movement. I think with social media and the 24 hour internet, and everybody needs a fresh t hot take Matt Gates, Louis Gohmert, uh, I don't think we, I don't think 20 years ago, we would have found out how stupid Marjorie Taylor Greene is. And Matt Gates, I think Congress, they, they do look for stupid people. If you're the speaker, you want morons in the House of Representatives who will do what they're, they're told. You don't want original thinkers. You don't want the squad. You want mindless robots who march with you. They recruit the Louis Gohmerts. They've always been part of party politics. They never were able to amplify their their thoughts or lack thereof before the way they can now. Listen, I, the point that you're making, I think, is a profound one and uh, would not in any way, shape or form try to uh, 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 to to refute it. That and that is this, that the rise of social media uh, and the lack of filter uh, that it has over uh, the, the kind of discourse has been hugely problematic. And uh, the, it is very clear that the algorithms that have been uh, created and used in order uh, to allow the, uh, and not, not only allow, but to incentivize the kind of, you know, rhetoric and polarization at, uh, is, is just the anathema uh, to discourse. Uh, and I think that, so the point that you're, I agree with the point that you're making. I don't think it changes my argument that this current moment is a reflection of objective material conditions that are making the, the, the Gateses and the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Donald Trumps and the Steve Bannons. I mean, 
Look, I'm old enough to, 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 to say with confidence that Steve Bannon would have been a joke uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Like, like people would not have taken him seriously. But he, uh, but he is still a joke. He is still marginal. Let me ask you this. I, I'm just making conversation. I hope I'm not being rude. It's, uh, it's a chat. I, I, I don't want to. I like I, talking to you, David, because you right. don't you don't agree with me, but we have good conversations. I agree with time. I agree with everything you're saying. I do. I, I'm just wondering. You know, I'm just as worried as you are, and I wonder if the frog in the proverbial boiling water is a narcissist <laughs> and, and that the, the, the water is boiling and he's noticing it and he's going, this is the hottest water in the history of boiled frogs. Um, I am fully aware that the water is boiling and it has never been this hot. I hate this joke. I hate the joke. Can I, I, in other climate change, it, I'm not talking about climate change. It is. I'm talking about fascism, that everything now is the worst it's ever been. And is that partly because of our cultural narcissism? Narcissism where everything has to be the worst, the most frightening, the scariest, that fascism is on the rise like never before. Civil war. I mean, seriously, again, I, I'm always wrong. And, you know, they'll, I, in a month, they're going to come knocking on my door and put numbers on my arm. But a civil war like that not seen like Breyer is saying there's a civil war brewing, not since. 1861 don't you think we have an overinflated sense of our time and space uh look uh yes I, I mean when you when you phrase it that way yes and uh may i because i don't think that there's enough uh poetry in uh in political discourse you remind me of one of my favorite haikus are you ready Mm -hmm. And you know, 575, right? A haiku. So pay attention, folks. My zip code. Ah, how about that? A haiku zip code. A frog in water does not feel it boil in time. Dude, we are that frog. I didn't make it up. That's a haiku that, uh, uh, that, that uh, I know. And it's true. Dude, we are that frog. And like... What I'm trying to do, and I, I, I mean it sincerely, to the very best of my ability, I'm trying to galvanize other people to jump out of this boiling water. Right. 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 Dr. Harriet Fraud, again, I agree with everything you're saying, but I think paralysis sets in, at least for me, if, you know, it's like these, they were the worst of times and the worst of times. <laughs> But you know, like, because like, Dr. Fraud is with us, and she's a uh, a therapist. So I'll, I'll ask her to yes. check my homework on this. When I tell you the antidote for cynicism, the antidote to despair, the antidote for the feeling of helplessness is to actually organize with other people to try to make the changes that you want to see. Part of the reason that I have such an astute and acute and clear analysis of just how horrific everything is, and I continue to come onto this show week after week with optimism and hope and trying to preach inspiration is because I had the good fortune to be working with people here in Humboldt County and in the Weyot tribe with Dishkama Humboldt and Cooperation Humboldt, because I had the good fortune to be the co-coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. And I could literally tell you hundreds literally hundreds of other examples of folks who are trying to do what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do here that are happening everywhere. We don't get uh, on the media, right? We don't get the opportunity because again, the, the, the neoliberal empire controls uh, uh, the narrative. We need to do what Antonio Gramsci encouraged us and that is to create our own cultural apparatus. Uh, and again, as Harry, uh, Dr. Fraud talks about all the time, 
We need a mass movement and a people's party. And I just don't think we have one in the Democratic Party. And that's why you'll continuously try, hear me try to get away from talk about the Democratic Party and electoral politics and talk about building cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, housing cooperatives, do public banking, do participatory budgeting, building community land trust. These concrete tools exist. Yes, they're merely reforms, but they're non-reformist reforms. Most of the reforms that the Democratic Party machine will allow us to talk about never challenge power, never challenge the concept of uh, capitalism. And next week, I want to, uh, because I know that we're coming up on Dr. Fraud's time. So I want to ask this, can we please next week, and Dr. Fraud, I'm going to invite you if you could come on my segment so that we can do it together. I'd like to make a challenge to say, I'm going to break it down without dumbing it down and talk about what capitalism is and what a solidarity economy uh, economic framework can be and we'll actually talk about what those differences. Is that a deal, David? Well, I'm whatever you want to do, I'm up for. Dr. Fraud, can like I don't know what yeah, your calendar is, that's but okay. That's okay with me. Could what you capitalism count? is and what socialism is or could be also. Yeah, look, I, they're all very important because the reason they are alternatives and they are alternatives, but the reason that I want to stay with what is capitalism and what is uh, a solidarity economy framework is because. I, I want to stay very much in the uh, in the economic realm because socialism gets us into the political uh, conversation. Now right. we can talk about it as long as we talk about socialism as economic democracy. Okay, that's fine. Great. Thank you, David Cobb. I have I'm thrilled Dr. Harriet Fraud joins us. She is the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. And every Wednesday at is it 2.30 on WBAI? What is the name of your radio show? It's called Interpersonal Update. Interpersonal Update. So I've been talking on the show today about homelessness. Mm. And I found a stat that interests me and it reminded me of you and what you wanted to talk about today. You've always said that our economy began deindustrializing in around 1974. Yeah, the middle to the late 70s is where they when they outsourced the jobs. And homelessness has gotten worse since then, and I've noticed that home ownership doubled since 1975. Twice as many Americans own their own home than they did when we began the de industrialization of this country. And it makes me wonder how many Americans are living in their asset and think that I need housing prices to go up in order for me to have any wealth or any income if I have to refinance. And so, we can't tackle homelessness in America because too many people own homes. And if we start building more homes, that means there'll be a supply of homes and prices, home values will plummet and rent will plummet. Americans who own homes don't want the homeless problem solved because the value of their homes will decline. I think that's too mechanistic. First of all, I don't know what proportion of Americans own their own homes. I think that in the recessions that we've had, big corporations buy individual homes and probably own many, 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 many homes because I think that the proportion of homeowners in America is small and people, one of the things that's happened is rents have gone up, at least in New York City, 22%. Salaries after a big fight can go up as much as 5%. Inflation is 8% and homelessness is often caused not by plotting by homeowners, but actually 
by raising rentals and lowering salaries and unemployment and no social programs so that people have to spend their money. One of the biggest, the top three causes of bankruptcy and homelessness is medical debt. So, you know, that things are out of control. I don't think there are so many homeowners that want to increase their asset and have it be borrowed against that they are a problem. I think the problems are rather prices have gone up because all those bosses who set the prices, it's not consumers who set the prices, lost money during the pandemic and want to make it back by jacking up the prices, obviously. And the priorities in our country are, are skewed. You know, we have the most deaths in the world, even though we're about a quarter of the world's population. And um, no, I'm sorry, 4% of the world's population, not a quarter. But, you know, I think that what has happened is that the American people have, are panicking. As Yeats's poem said, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. The American dream that used to be somewhat achievable in families headed by a white male, the dream of having a family wage, maybe having a house, maybe not, but having a position in a community after years and years of work in the local factory where you get recognition, at the store where people know you, at the luncheonette where people know you, have all gone. Those small businesses are, re are replaced by Walmart, Home Depot, et cetera. And you are anonymous. You no longer have a job where you get seniority and recognition. You're dispensable. You're often a temp worker because they hire as many people as they can as temps so they get no benefits. You can't accumulate any kind of status or seniority on your job. And the whole thing has collapsed and people have stopped believing it. And when capitalism starts to fall apart, then you have real trouble. In 1922, which was the first established fascism under Mussolini, the big capitalists were scared. Gramsci organized huge strikes in Torino showing the power of labor and people needed a change. A new decade was beginning. World War I immiserated people. And capitalists had a choice because this, you know, they had to invest in something that held on to their money. And that was fascism, even though they might have thought that Mussolini and Hitler also were kind of dumb, like they think that Trump is an uncultured imbecile whose uh, father was a money grubbing immigrant landlord you know, and who turn their noses at him, which is why he hates those elites. So what, are, what, are, what, what, is, what are Americans feeling right now? They're depressed? Yes. Angry? Fearful? You say disassociate. What does disassociation mean? Dissociation means when the situation is something you can't bear or you don't really want to see, so you just put your mind somewhere else. No kid gets through life without dissociating. Your parents are doing something that's awful. You go somewhere else in your own head. It's your only way of travel. And Americans are depressed because their standard of living is out the window and they don't have health care and their public education is bad and things are more dangerous and everything is shaking the basic economic base of a steady job that supports a family is out the window. And marriage, which was the emotional center for people's stability, however unhappy it was stable, is also up for grabs. The majority of the people get separated or divorced, 50% formally in the legal system and another 15 to 20 who just split because they don't have assets to fight over or children to fight over. Right. So that's 
pretty much in collapse. And that's only within the first five years that that collapses. And there isn't the social structure. And where you need help, corporations will get it instead of you, like in COVID. Turns out that Biden gave the big drug companies $17 billion to develop drugs against COVID. Wow. Whereas inventions were made on COVID drugs that don't have a private patent on them, and those weren't accepted. The whole thing is so infected and so corrupt. And so the people are depressed because they don't know what to do and it's been robbed. And their idea that voting will make a difference doesn't make enough of a difference. You know, Obama was the same neoliberal politics colored in brown, which was a change of pace, but it turned out to be the same thing. And in fact, blacks lost more of their wealth during Obama than they had before because he bailed out the banks instead of the subprime mortgage people. And so those things are disappearing and people are depressed. And one thing they've done is just not want to pay any attention. So they watch stupid television or movies or they're on social media all the time. They want to be distracted. They don't want to see what's going on. Or they deny it altogether, like Trump's followers. America's the greatest. We're the greatest, greatest, greatest. And these people who are holding us back are refugees and uh, Black people and uppity women. And this has to be stopped. Sexual, other, other sexualities, get them. You know, that's uh, a denial of the real enemy and a displacement onto others. Displacement is another thing that's happening where people are getting all involved with denying vaccines instead of saying the government is no longer on my side. It's that they don't trust the vaccines or they make conspiracy theories that there are reptiles taking over or pedophiles operating with the Democratic Party in the basement of pizza parlors or whatever else. And, or they think that they'll be safe displacing their need for safety on gun ownership. Gun ownership went up 40% during the pandemic. Now, obviously, owning guns is not going to protect you from COVID. But, and, you know, women bought guns as they never had before. So that people are displacing their means, their solutions to the problems onto other things. The LGBTQ community is buying guns like never before. Everyone uh, is. We're seeing the Black Panthers buying guns. Everyone is displacing their need to protect themselves economically and socially and protect the social cohesion of their society by arming themselves. Gun dealers constantly run out. They have to run to the pawn shops to temporarily stock up. There's an article about it in Harper's, this issue. But it's, it's identical. I was talking about this on the show last week. Uh, the NRA, you cannot separate the National Rifle Association from the military industrial complex. Right. They are in the business of selling arms, and you can't have a military industrial complex unless you create these fictitious boogeymen. And the NRA creates these fictitious boogeymen that we have to be afraid of. We have to be afraid of the jackbooted thugs in our government, black people, and and Biden has us all being you know get afraid of China. We're right. the only ones who've ever invaded those countries. They haven't invaded us. The United States has never been invaded. And our only war has been the Civil War. So what is this? The French so sent troops to support us and the British sent their troops in the American Revolution. It's a long time ago. But it's, there's a sense of being invaded, taken over, because their lives are taken over by corporate America. And also people are understanding for the first time in a while, that work, your labor creates wealth and ought to be paid. So there's more strikes than ever before. There's 13 million people who dropped out of the labor force 
the formal labor force or doing other things. So there's a, a recognition that you're being ripped off and it's no good. Right. Which is, which, and we don't have a unified party with class awareness that would capture all these things, the climate movement, the labor movement, and people like Sarah Nelson are trying to do that in the labor movement, but the labor movement, the Black Lives Matter, the movement of LGBTQIA, all of the sexual alternatives as valid, all of those movements together, because what we have is numbers. Right. And what they have is money. What, one of the things you've taught me is it came too late in my life, but <laughs> to how to function in uh, a capitalist society that your boss, anybody you work for is like Regan in The Exorcist when she's possessed. She will say and do anything to lull you into her web. And once you begin to realize that you are just constantly, constantly being lied to. And when you go to work, it is about money. This is not your family. These are not your friends. This is about money. Keep your mouth shut. Do your work. Take the check. Ask for more money. Solidarity. Go home. That is. Uh, yeah, your boss does sees you as a cipher in a profit ledger. Yeah. And that's it. And, and only a fool. And I've been a fool most of my profession. Naive person. I'm sorry? Or a naive person. No, in my no. case, I'll say fool to think the people I worked for saw me as anything other than a commodity. You know, they might convince themselves occasionally that they're not Scrooge and that they actually do care. But when push comes to shove, I'm a commodity and I should view myself as such and not take it personally. So it's a great lesson that I wish I knew uh, when I was in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, I think it's a little too late for me now. But what is, if, if I said to you, we're all scattered and we have to focus. We, we've all identified the problems. We need a, a platform that prioritizes. If you were helping a candidate run on an issue, what would you say is the number one idea that, that can be implemented that could, could change things? I, I think it's Medicare for all. I think if a candidate is running, the candidate should only speak of Medicare for all or at least 90% of what the candidate talks about should be Medicare for all. I think they should talk about both Medicare for all and then a jobs program, the equivalent of what FDR did. He hired 11 million people and gave them decent, well-paying jobs. The population is doubled. We should give 22 million Americans decently paid jobs as well as Medicare and social benefits and we can get the money by taxing the top. 70, the billionaires just of the United States made $70 billion just during the pandemic, while huge numbers of Americans lost everything. Okay, obviously they don't need $100 billion. They could be left with $500 million, which is already too generous, and they could pool that money and pay for all these programs. And that would be easily done. You know, FDR did that. He didn't do it by himself. He did it because people were screaming in the streets, marching in the streets, threatening in the streets, hanging bankers that foreclosed farms and so on. So, you know, he adjusted. And I think that's what would do it. And you give those jobs regardless of gender, race, sex, anything. Competence, opportunities across the board. Two, heal this country to make safe and beautiful parks everywhere, to create affordable housing, my God, to create programs for children 
in childcare centers, in daycares, in after school programs, in summer programs, create safe places for older people. Really, the country is in desperate shape and needs help. You know, other capitalist places like Germany, they passed a referendum in Berlin to take 142,000 units of housing from the most, the biggest, most powerful landlords and make them affordable housing to help affordable housing in Berlin. In New Zealand, they don't allow foreigners to buy houses. You can't buy a vacation home or something like that in New Zealand in order to keep the prices down for New Zealanders. You'd need, you don't need no government the way Reagan sold us. You need big government like FDR. You need a good government. That's the difference that really is representing people. And you'd need to have proportional representation so that if you got 10% of the votes, you got 10% of the seats in, the, in the, our parliament. And you'd also have to have everyone have the day off on election day. And you'd have to have a choice of candidates that are a choice of different economic systems not just two capitalist candidates. Capitalists, socialists, monarchists, if you wanted, fascists, whatever. But people would have a choice and everyone would get the same amount of time and the same amount of money to campaign and no private money in elections. If you did those things, this country would change. Right. And right. I think everybody who's thoughtful and upset would probably like to hear about such a program but that's not on our media. Right. It's a you really good program. One of the bromides is get the money out of politics, which makes, which means nothing. Over the weekend, I was thinking about like, what are the biggest problems? I wrote these down. Like, what are the, what, what are our basic, you've talked about, what, what are basic human rights are education, healthcare, child care, housing, food, and water. Those are non-negotiables. They should be non-negotiables mm -hmm. in this country. Should not be in the hands of the private sector. It should be provided by our government. It's a building block of civilization. It is, you know, in every other industrialized country, they're non-negotiables. Here in America, you, you cannot talk about child care you can't have the government provide child care because child care is a multi-billion dollar industry even though they're some of the most underpaid employees they, they they make below a livable wage the people taking care of our kids but it's not the government providing child care it's private enterprise getting it's commodified. Stuff. Everything is commodified. And look, Head Start's a public program. It's quite successful. And during Reagan's era, there was a law passed to make Head Start available for every American. And Reagan vetoed it in the name of the family. It's, right. Of course, it's achievable. We had wonderful daycare during World War II to get women into the munitions factories and so on. But but this, it's so frustrating. I mean, I'm getting angry because what little television news I watch or what little, you know, I do read mainstream media, they will not have that conversation of why, are, why isn't the government providing child care? Why are we turning it over to for-profit institutions that are going to cut corners and pay the people we trust our children with the least amount of money. It's just not, it's just not even up for discussion in this country. No, it isn't. Everything is commodified. It's an unadulterated capitalism. You know, in a city like Vienna, there are almost no privately owned apartments and no, they have a law in Vienna. You cannot pay more than 25% of your income on rent. And they're all regulated. And that's been so, even through fascism, they couldn't get rid of it, it's too popular. Of course, it's all possible that our basic needs would not be commodified. And 
that's you'd need an anti-capitalist movement. You'd need a pro-socialist movement. And I think if Americans had a chance to hear about these things, they really would go for that. Because most people do want a decent life for everyone. And I, wonder, hard I, yeah, I, I wonder if I do a disservice, because this is an echo chamber. I, I don't want yes. I, I don't want to hear what the other side has to say because I think they need help. I, I think they're mentally ill. Every attempt I've made to reach out to the other side is just an attempt to get them to articulate what they really feel, and that is they hate people. They 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 want to see children die. I mean, when you what my exposure to the right is asking them questions until their blood boils and they say people who don't save money don't deserve health care people who don't work deserves to die it's not my responsibility that and all i want to do is get them to articulate that and once they say that they're ready to throw a punch uh I think we have to have this conversation with the other side and get them. They're just well, not asked these questions. They're not, they, nobody ever they're asked. Not, they're not, but also nobody listens to them about what's really su making them suffer, which changes their minds. When I've talked to some right wing people, after I talk to them and ask them questions, and I do so kindly because they're still human. Barely they usually come around. They see things they didn't see. And they understand that maybe some people who aren't working have tried to find jobs and can't, or they have children at home and no one will care for them. And daycare is too expensive, so they can't afford daycare. And if they leave a baby at home, they'll be arrested. So they don't have good choices. And the worst are the Democrats the 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 hyper educated credential democrats who say uh who say the same thing as these right wing demons but it's cloaked in intellectualism yeah it's the same it's lack of compassion and yeah. lack of understanding right but i i do think that it's possible to cut it through and cut through it. And at the bottom of it is this depression that people are not only losing their reasonable livelihoods, they're losing their culture, they're losing their neighborhood, they're losing their standing among people. Even the churches are losing. Right. The churches, you know, are another way of dissociating to heaven. Right. Well, at least the churches feed people. Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, but and you have to pray first if it's the Salvation Army. Before they give you a meal, you have to pray. Right. Yeah. And promise not to turn gay. Salvation Army is very homophobic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. They, they still have Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I believe, in the Salvation Army. You know, I, I know we're out of time. I have been talking to people about a very simple idea, because I think in the end, if you don't want a bloody revolution, which I don't want, no. the, only, the solution has to be political. And we have to we have to find the leadership that unites enough people behind one or two simple ideas that are achievable. And you need to put numbers on the board. You need to accomplish something. Absolutely. Um, and you have run to not allow obstructions like I right. mentioned. You, have you to can run on a critique of capitalism. You have to tell people, give yourself a raise, give your, vote for me and I'll give you health care. And one of the things that I just find so mind boggling is a very simple Christian idea that the government, so I've been running this by people. I say there are government buildings all over America. Right. And 52% of children are living in poverty. People can't afford to eat properly. 
we have enough money to go with a basic every we we identify public buildings and build out soup kitchens that serve healthy food 24 hours a day and no questions asked and you make it nice and you 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 pay you pay artists for their work and you pay chefs for their work and you have musicians and poetry readings and you create almost a civic minded institution that already exists based on food and you encourage billionaires to come that it not be stigmatized that you have that it becomes a cool place to be so that people who need food are not talking to other people who need food yeah. everybody shows up and everybody eats and everyone needs food so if you had quality food just like if you had quality education or quality anything else a lot of people would come and get it there wouldn't hopefully be very any more billionaires because they would finance this but right. you could have big you could have public restaurants you already do mcdonald's is a public and, restaurant and i and i and i when i run this by people they immediately tell me why that can't happen and i say of course it can you know, collateralized debt obligations can't happen backed by the government. You're going to bet on a mortgage and then take another bet against that bet. And if it fails, the government will bail out something that doesn't even exist. But somehow that can happen. But a, a, a feeding anybody who needs it, well, it's a threat to the fast food industry. If they That's go, if they treat it is a threat to the fast food industry because you'd have a healthy alternative with some amusements for the kids and a way to relax with healthy, nutritious food. And people would flock there. They used to say that people will never go to a public kitchen. Well, McDonald's is a public kitchen. The public That's toilet is what McDonald's is. It's a toilet. It's that bad food, but it it's public it's that it's not that the american public wants to cook at home they don't they're exhausted they're burnt out and some of them return from a work day already burnt out and the kids are demanding and there's laundry and everything else you want to be that's why people go to mcdonald's because they can sit there and relax and their kids can play you and know you, and you can give your kids cancer heart disease and diabetes that's right mcdonald's but kills moments of relaxation Yes, we have to wrap it up. Dr. Harriet Fraud, God bless you. You uh, are the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. And every Wednesday on WBAI at 2.30, the name of the show is? Interpersonal Update. I, I knew that. I was just testing you. How do people contact you? hfraud at gmail.com or website harrietfraud dot com and fraud is f r double a t is in a david we love you thank you I so love you all you have a great show and wonderful people so uh, thank you all thank you it's a great show because of all the wonderful people. you bring nah, you together uh <laughs> you're right you're right i can't I, I, all right we will be back with our old friend mike racine we will be back you're listening to the david feldman show DavidFeldmanShow.com. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comments too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an enemy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you.
He's got a lot to say and he's coming way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Mike Racine joins us. He is a brilliant stand up comedian as well as a friend of Professor Ben Burgess and Michael Brooks. Is that how you met Professor Ben Burgess? Through Michael uh, Brooks? Yeah, probably. How did you meet so. Michael? How did I meet Michael? Yeah. I was, uh, I was a fan of his, and uh, um, so I would listen to a lot of uh, Majority Report on YouTube and stuff, and then I was like, oh, I got to have this guy on my show someday, but I'm going to try to find a way to like, ease my way into it. Right. And, then, uh, and then he reached out to me. He sent me a message on Twitter, and he was like, I really like your... Uh, I guess I did like a Sam Harris impression that he thought was funny. <laughs> so I would, I would go on a show, and I would do Sam Harris, and Dave right. Rubin and uh, yeah, and then I guess yeah, I met Ben through through Michael. Yeah, and so you you and you do a Sopranos podcast with Ben Burgess. We do, yeah, we do like a monthly show where we talk about every episode of Sopranos. So I think we're on like episode ten from season one. So yeah, so like in eighty years, we'll have we'll have a finished uh, podcast. Right. I am. I'm doing a, a soprano. We've talked about this. I'm doing a Sopranos cleanse. I'm wow. proud to say, and I'm being serious here, that I've gone three years without watching the Sopranos. Okay. It's tough, but when you yeah. really wait three years and then come back to it, you're seeing it for the first time. For it, sure. It, is it the best? Show? Funny. Go ahead. Yeah, I think so. It's funny to hear the term Professor Ben Burgess because he doesn't. I don't, I, he came to one of my shows in Atlanta. He didn't look like a professor. Like he, he looks like a guy eating chicken wings at a, at a bar, you know? Right. So you're, you're, you're doing stand up. You're originally from Philadelphia, as I recall. Jersey, South Jersey. But you lived in Philadelphia. No. But you're, but I, I, my accent, I'm Italian. You're Italian. My accent. Right. Somebody said same difference in the chat. Yeah. Don't read the chat. They'll they'll undermine. They'll we'll, we'll get inside your head. Weren't you doing a podcast with your dad? Um, no. But I think the last time we talked, I was on vacation with my dad. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You don't yeah. do a podcast when you're on vacation with no, your. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where were you? You went on a vacation with your dad. Where was Seattle? That? I went to Seattle. To to do what? Uh, I guess just kind of like my dad wanted to do a little like boys trip with me and my brother. So we all just went to Seattle for like a weekend and shared a hotel room. And uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was okay. fine. Fine trip. Nice trip. Yeah. Um, but you were talking about the chat and I, so I did, so my podcast was about the mafia and uh, you know, how Sammy the bull from the Gambino family, he has a podcast now. And I heard that he gets very upset about like haters he gets very upset about like trolls and haters, which is very funny to me that people are trolling uh, Sammy the Bull. Yeah, that that's. Please yeah. keep it up, all you yeah, trolls yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah. Go after Sammy the Bull. I thought he was behind bars. He was dealing. I thought he couldn't help himself, and he started dealing again. Yeah, I think so. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what. I don't know what happened. So you have yeah. a podcast about the mafia. I did it was and then and then uh we started we stopped doing it about the mafia and then I ended that podcast uh last week and I'm starting a new one with a couple a couple friends because I can't I can't seem to get out of life either you know so what it <laughs> they'll pull you back in they'll what is pull you what, back in what is the name of the podcast about the mob it was called the sit down so those episodes are out and they're on YouTube and everything and yeah the five families Mm -hmm. why did J. Edgar Hoover not acknowledge the mafia? Um, I don't know. He was racist. <laughs> they remind, we reminded him of Martin <laughs> Luther King, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we were a little too close to, yeah, all the civil rights leaders that he didn't do like. The, do, the five, do the five families still exist? Um, 
not that I know of. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read anything about them. But that the leader of the Gambino family got killed by uh, the QAnon guy in Staten Island. What? Do you remember that a few years ago? He was like the he was like a Sicilian guy, and he was shot. He was shot to death outside his house, and then they found out that the guy who killed him was like a twenty-four-year-old like QAnon guy. And he like, I guess he wanted to date the guy's niece and the guy said no. So, oh, so, so like, every- like Castellano got killed by Gotti and and Sammy the Bull because they wanted the Gambino family for their yeah. own. This was just done because over love <laughs> of yeah, a I think woman, so. not love of money. Yeah. And everybody was like, oh, the mafia is back. They're going to start killing each other again. And right. then there was just the guy. It was just a crazy guy. Right. Yeah. When I was growing up. I grew up in New Jersey. We knew there was a mafia and we knew which homes mafia lieutenants lived in. And we knew that, you know, at school in in gym class, dodgeball, there were certain kids you uh, didn't didn't (laughs) really (laughs) take their head off, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Just don't stay away. Yeah. And they uh, were the kids whose nails were manicured and they didn't <laughs> they didn't have to wear they didn't have to change for gym. They didn't have to change out of their suit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it existed. There was no question that it, it existed. But I often wonder now the kids have kids and those kids don't go into the mafia. They go into banking, right? They 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 learn Right. They're like the FBI. The FBI is accountants and lawyers, mm-hmm. the mafia, the, the sons and daughters of the five families are doing the same work that the FBI does. They're, they're accountants and lawyers. You don't need to kill anybody anymore. You just wander money. Right. It seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you grew I'm not up- as familiar with what the, the way what's going on today, but but that that is kind of what it seems like. So growing up in an Italian family, did you feel the mafia? Uh, were you embarrassed? Is your father embarrassed by the mafia? A lot of Italian. No. There's like an Italian anti defamation league. Remember Joe Colombo? Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he loved being like, they're portraying us like we're murderers. <laughs> Can you believe this? <laughs> there, yeah. was, there was an anti. Do you think yeah. making fun of Italians on television is that, that, that it, it seems to me that you can make fun of Italians on television with no repercussions? And on, and on Twitter. Yeah. Why is that? Um, my theory is that people who are actually racist just know it's okay to you make fun of us so they can like, they can like get it out, you know? Well, why is it you know? okay? Why is it okay until I like, really, you can make fun? Because I grew up with Italians. And if you made an Italian joke, uh, they, yeah, well, I think it's because we're kind of. We're kind of like white now, you know, like we're not really eth- we're not really ethnic. We're not so ethnic anymore. I used to do a joke about that. I used to say like Italian when you're Italian, it's like white what other white people don't really respect you, but then you're you you can't audition for Hamilton. You know, <laughs> you're in this weird like limbo. Where they're like, this is for Columbus? people of color. <laughs> is yeah. Columbus Day was invented to to make Italians white, as I understand it, that they were coming uh, into Louisiana mm-hmm. and they, there was a, that I, I think, or, you know, in the turn of the 20th century, Italians were viewed mm-hmm. like black people. Is that true? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't, I'll be honest. I don't always feel white, you know, I don't always identify with white people. Sometimes I feel a little, I feel a little ethnic. Uh, my parents hit me, you know, which is like uh, kind of an ethnic thing, right? Right. So, uh, so yeah. Why is why is that? Well, it's a lot of like a lot of like um, comics, a lot of uh, you know, like 
Spanish or Indian comics, you know, like more ethnic comics will be like, yeah, my, you know, my mom used to beat the shit out of me. And uh, they're like, oh, you mean, you know, you go to over, you go over to a white kid's house and they're all cursing at their parents. And stuff. <laughs> my, my mom would beat the shit out of me. But like, I don't I don't really identify with that because my mom, my mom would beat the shit out of me. <laughs> my dad too until i got started until i started lifting weights <laughs> it is interesting i was telling a friend the other night that i i know this is virtue signaling but i i would ne i have no desire to you know smack any of my children kick them really uh -huh. I, I, yeah desire to kick them no okay uh, no but i've ne i never felt the urge to smack my kids uh how many kids do you have well, about 15. nice and uh and and my generation of parents the idea if you even did you know raised your hand to make a move to hit them they'd call the police on you it, it's yeah. and right yeah, yeah. and rightfully so i don't believe yeah but, uh, so I just had a I just had a baby eight months ago. So are you I'm hitting like, yet? what's that? You're not hitting yet. Not, hitting, not yet. No. <laughs> um, but it's but it's weird because because so I'm now I have this baby. I'm like I cannot hit my kid. That's like a thing. I'm not gonna I'm not right. gonna do it. So right. I'm like I, I'm not gonna do it. But I have like I have smacked my dog a couple times. Like on the street, he likes to pull on the leash a lot, and it's like this, there were there were a couple times. I think I dropped my coffee and I just kind of like whacked my dog. And so then once you once you hit your dog the first time you're like well now this is like who i am and you just <laughs> you do it again and again no but you do it like more times you know so right. i'm so what i'm what i'm hoping right now is that because my, my my kid's great he's eight months and he's like very happy like nice baby right. and everything but i'm just hoping that it never gets to the point where it's just that one time i hit him and then i go well now Seals now you're a, a child beater and yeah what's the difference between one one and every every friday yeah <laughs> i first of all do not hit your dog or your cat it's wrong no i know i know it's wrong right it's but wrong. i've already done it right i my favorite dog in the world was cody and he was out of control he, and we we put him on Prozac, we put him on everything. Yeah, I'm gonna get a lot of complaints, but sure. my friend Christopher was over and he understood dogs. And I'm I'm gonna tell it. So Cody was jumping and you, we, he was on Zoloft or Prozac or what it Paxil and Valium. He was just out of his mind. And Christopher said, "Here's here's what you do." And he went like this. And he smacked Cody hmm. a couple times under the jaw it wasn't pat you know it was and cody just looked up and then looked at me and goes why don't you do that mm, right. he just completely calmed down uh-huh and again he didn't he, he kind of it didn't hurt i think just, cody was craving discipline he was craving discipline again boy this is but it, it did because i would never hit yeah. an, an right. animal or anybody right it, right he said publicly uh <laughs> no I would I wouldn't but yeah. he did look at me the dog like you should do this to me just you know I I couldn't here's what I invented you have a boy or a girl boy here, here I have the greatest disciplining technique and I'm being serious boys are a pain in the ass and they, they will when they misbehave give them shoulder rubs establish dominance uh -huh. just dig your thumbs into their into their shoulders and whenever you if you have an urge to dominate and or maybe smack just give them very powerful painful back rubs and I've told that okay. to people over the years and they've mm -hmm. thanked me because you do get angry at your children right and you want to establish physical dominance Right. And the best way to do that is to give them powerful uh, back rubs. Because when okay. they tend to misbehave because they're stressed out. Okay. You know, you okay. give them a back rub, mm -hmm. 
and then you charge i i yeah. kept running do you, do you smell them do you smell them a little bit do you like uh <laughs> creep them out you just do something so weird they don't yeah, they, like they, joe they biden behave again yeah 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 just joe biden style sniffing so are you married or did you just steal a kid from um, yeah no i'm married i'm married and and is this kid from her or did you just grab it off oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah and do you like the kid he's great yeah he's uh he's really good he's like you know he's moving well so they say that you get material when you have a baby and i just like i don't i have about i have maybe about five minutes of material about my wife giving birth mm -hmm. um like i talk about my wife's pussy like you know that's fun people like what because i because i talk about how like they don't um you don't do anything when the when the, you know like the you don't do anything when your wife's giving birth right and you want to help and i'm like does somebody want to step on my balls or something you know i feel like i should be doing more and so you, you tell as much pain as she is is that an nypd mug yeah. mm -hmm. okay i i drink blood to get through the show so i drink it out of a nypd i you know here's the thing you drink yeah. you, you get one of their cups mm -hmm. and you'd be amazed at how it calms the idiots down okay I wear like an NYPD cap uh -huh. when I when I go outside. Okay, and the, it, you'd be amazed at how you're treated if you were an NY. I look like a retired cop uh -huh. who right. hits some money right under you know underneath the running boards of my car and in the ad. I, I look like a corrupt cop, and people mm -hmm. don't mess with me. You wear an NYPD cap, you'd be amazed. No charge, no charge. It's for you. That's for uh, you. So we were talking about your, your, your kid and he's a boy. Yeah. And so I don't have that much material from the, from the baby. I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't, uh, you know, I don't have, they say you get a lot of material, but I don't really have anything because he's pretty easy and, and good. So I don't know. Yeah. So it's a waste of time. What's it's the waste, point? It's a waste of time. Nothing. No, I, I mean, I have like maybe seven minutes about him, you know, about, uh, you know, the, his <laughs> birth and, and can't do the, the problem is when comedians have kids, they can't do the jokes that are really funny about the kid and the wife, because especially now the stuff that, you know, you, you can't say in public, the, the really funny stuff, but maybe you yeah. can't like what? Yeah, I don't want to. Uh -huh. I don't want. Well, what's an example of like? Do you have an example of like another comics bit about that, that they can't that you? I don't. I don't say? Yeah, I yeah. don't. Want to yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's amazing. You know what's amazing about humans, and it gives me hope. Mm -hmm. When we discovered fire, mm -hmm. we started cooking our food, and our brains got really big because our mm -hmm. stomachs no longer had to process the the food for energy. So fire made our brains smart and we okay. developed these big heads but women's uh vaginas didn't grow they stayed the same size they stayed the same yes so childbirth we're the yeah. only animal that cannot give birth right away. alone alone we so by our we are communal we we have to work sure. with others sure and so most of our problems stem from women's vaginas not being big enough so not being big enough to, yeah. to be able to give birth alone and yeah. we wouldn't yeah. be so reliant on others it, yeah. it, <laughs> that was my conclusion when i read that but doesn't it scare you how when you have a kid how dependent you are on others you you cannot do this by yourself yeah yeah i think so I do talk about on stage, like my wife, you know, if you, if your wife died, that'd be really bad just cause I don't think I have to get like a roommate and everything. And like, you know, um, so I do a whole bit about that, but like, uh, yeah. And then, and then you also have to, you, cause sometimes I'll, I'll go to work or I'll have to, I'll be on the road or whatever. And I have to like, uh, I have to call my mom, you know, so she'll come up and watch the baby so I can leave and go to gigs, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll have to be like, yeah, yeah, the vaccine is made out of aborted uh, fetuses. You're right. <laughs> like, I just have to, 
kind of humor the stuff that she's heard on uh, Tucker Carlson. Oh, is she one of those? Yeah, she watches a lot of. Uh, yeah, she watches a lot of Tucker, and I, she's vaccinated, which is which is nice. But uh, my aunt's not vaccinated, and I, I my mom told my wife that uh, she's been looking at like alternative cures, and she's been like uh, eating a tablespoon of baking soda every every day for to COVID. Ward off the corona, for COVID, yeah, to ward off the corona. How does this happen? What 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 is this about? How does this happen? I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess it's just like uh, the, the the media that they consume, you know? Because we were just talking to Dr. Harriet Fraud about reaching out to people like, is it your mother? Yeah. Would she come up? Would you bring her on the show? Sure. You know why it would be interesting? Mm-hmm. I would have to treat her with respect because it's yeah. your mom. Yeah. I'd have to be gentle. Oh, okay. So you wouldn't be like you, hey, you fucking dumbass. Well, hey, that, you, that goes with that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's why hey, you fucking wop? <laughs> that's just why that's, are you such a stupid wop about that? Uh, could I have a conversation with her about the vaccines and ask her questions? Would she, or would she just eventually get angry with me? Yeah, I think I, so. But she is very, she's very like kind of stubborn and, and defensive and has a hard time, you know, like admitting that maybe she made a mistake because they're all they're all so entrenched in this uh this ideology you know they're all so into it they're really they've really bought in and i don't think they're going to be like oh yeah it's interesting you know and i know that my aunt my aunt listens to like candace she likes candace owens a lot so i guess they just get into that but it but it's it's funny um i don't know i guess i thought a lot about like what what the whole what the game is of people being so anti you know, like, like even before the vaccine, like anti, uh, anti mask and anti vaccine, and they're all like, right. and they're like dying. Right. What, what is the, what is the, I don't know. You know how the, you know, Planet of the Apes, they would keep Charlton Heston in a cage and study yeah. him. I, I would yeah. like to put, well, not your mother, my aunt, my aunt, aunt, aunt in a cage yeah. uh-huh. with a clipboard. Yeah. And study her scientifically with a, a team of professors, just to, yeah. not to argue, but to ask, why do you think this way? This is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Without it being, but I, it would have to get belligerent, wouldn't it? There's no way you can do Probably. that without her trying to own us and make us feel, Probably. right? Probably. Or just, yeah, or getting defensive or whatever, yeah. How do you reconcile? She's, nice, she's a nice person. I. I'm I'm sure she is. How do you reconcile that? You I can don't know. It's kind of tough. you love your mom? Yeah, I mean I do, but but it's like you but you've kind of seen over the in the past couple of years like she's they've she's gotten a lot like angrier and just kind of a little more difficult to be around. My brother doesn't really talk to her that much. He's got uh his girlfriend's parents are um they're very liberal, so that's like his new family. He hangs out with them. And I just like I guess I just kind of like, you know, I, but I like having them around to, to watch the baby and stuff like that. So, so I do try to, I, I, I do my best to, to talk to them and kind of meet them where they are. And my brother does too, but um, yeah, it is, it is very weird. It definitely like drives a wedge between you and your family for sure. So what, what is this about? Because is, is the politics a, a means to alienate you and fight with you is it about the politics or is it about aggression and wanting to be yeah. oppositional i don't know it's just very weird because i told my mom i was like if my if our aunt if my aunt gets covid she's probably going to end up in the hospital she's in her 70s and i was like she's probably gonna end up in the hospital and my, and my mom was like well well that's her choice <laughs> so i don't know they must not like life very much <laughs> They must be they must not enjoy life really you know they must they they just seem like kind of miserable people that like missed out but we all are yeah everybody's that way wait i want to read this comment in the chat there's no solidarity among white something did you see that uh there is no solidarity around white people (laughs) that's funny minorities can take solace in that fact hopefully 
That's from Joe H. I think he's in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, that would be a fun show to do, to, to put people in cages and not mm -hmm. fight them. Mm -hmm. Just to bring them on and yeah. ask them, okay, okay, I'm not fighting with you, but yeah. okay, so you don't get the vaccine and you and she so she doesn't think the vaccine is safe i guess i guess not yeah but is there some kind of like is there some kind of sinister like uh misinformation type of thing or i mean i don't know or is it just kind of an ideological thing where you're like oh, i don't need medicine because I, I i don't know i honestly believe that I, i'm not making a joke that hate is more powerful than love mm -hmm. and that our side refuses to accept that and the other side doesn't mm -hmm. i think we could move mountains and get medicare for all and uh, you know free child care free homes mm -hmm. free food uh if we came from a place of hatred Mm -hmm. Don't you think you're, you're a saying, You're saying we got to we got to play a little dirty. No, I think we tapped. I think hatred is sacred. You're a comedian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you, you don't make people laugh through love. Right, right, right. Have you ever made as you have you ever said something that was loving and tender that made an audience? No, no, no. Only yeah. hate. Only yeah, you said you wanted to put my aunt in a cage and, and hose her down like a monkey. Yeah. 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 So you, you're saying that we should get people, we should try to get people like riled up and we should create like villains and stuff. Yeah, not your aunt. Yeah. But, you know, if we can, if you can train a country to hate, oh, I don't know, the Taliban you mm -hmm. could train the same people to hate Aetna and United mm -hmm. Healthcare and the people it, yeah. like we want to hate. Right. Just right. Teach us to hate. We'll hate. We'll hate. Yeah. Just tell us who to hate. But yeah. And we don't use it. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and, and the left and the Democrats are afraid to use it, you know, and so you get, you got to vote your hopes not your fears uh, what is this from who is this joe says voters are motivated number one by hate uh, joe is this you saying this or is this a study hate nostalgia jealousy inspiration in that order i love that that's basically how i have developed all my opinions through hate not nostalgia jealousy inspiration yeah and inspiration is fourth Nobody wants to be inspired. They want to hate. Yeah, imagine if you were on a debate stage and you were just like, yeah, um, Joe Manchin's a scumbag and I'm going to throw his uh, scumbag family in jail. Yeah. You're like, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're like, if you were running for president, you were like, Joe, just so you know, when I'm president, your your whole scumbag family's going to be in jail. I would vote I think for people, people would be like, ah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Good point. I think we got some place where I think this is was a good conversation. Can you come back? Anytime. Plug away. Anytime. Plug, um, plug, plug all man, your stuff. Uh, I had some I had some gigs that got canceled, so what? I I don't have a gig. This uh, is I don't know going on. The, the the hotel that was the Holiday Inn that was attached to the the comedy room said no, so I can't. I'm not doing. It. But I am starting oh, a new. Yeah. No, I don't think, I think it was just like a, I don't know, the guy sent me something. I just saw the gig was canceled, but, um, but I am starting. So I'm on Instagram, Racine.Mike. I'm on Twitter at Mike Racine, and I'm starting a new podcast. The pot, the, the premise of the podcast is like, just in case I die, I'm putting all my kind of life lessons for my son on a podcast. So what? I'm like leaving my son. Yeah. The podcast. So if you have any ideas, um, you have any ideas for like, lessons you wish your dad had taught you or things that things that you knew or like stuff that you just wish you know anything dad related anything dad related uh 
send me an email, michael.rusine at gmail.com, and I'll read it and we'll have something to talk about for the, the new show. Why do I wish my dad, let me just think here for a second. Yeah. Uh, how to stop working. Yeah. My father never taught me uh, how to do anything other than work and read. Yeah, you should be enjoying your life instead of podcasting. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And, and so it would be, what are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm at work. And what are you doing later? Well, I was thinking of going home. You going to yeah. work at home? Yeah. <laughs> Marriage is a job. You're raising kids. Yeah, yeah. Toughest job you'll ever have is raising a kid. Can I just not work? Do you, yeah. does your, did your father whip the work ethic into you? Yeah, he's still he's still where he's almost 69 and he still works. He still works at a bank. He's like a loan officer at a bank. Oh, really? Yeah, so we're like Cusimano Italians more. Like <laughs> not I mean not me, but you know. Well, Cusimano like a doctor. Wasn't Cusimano? Cusimano doctor? Yeah, Cusimano was a doctor. Yeah. 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 Such a great name. Yeah. Yes. All right, I'm going to try to get you back on next week. Mike, yeah, I'd, love to, I'd love to come back anytime. Oh, great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Let us now go to San Rafael, California, where Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer Peter B. Collins is standing by. Hello there. I'm running on time. This is not bad, right? This is remarkable. Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, I'm just moving through the show today. And uh, Peter B. Collins, go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of interviews and radio shows. And I would assume you want to talk about Ukraine and uh, our impending doom, our war there. Well, we did talk about that last week. I proposed in the email that you didn't read that, uh, we, did. talk, that we talk about Neil Young and uh, Neil Young, the Spotify thing. Yes, I saw. Yes, I, I'm, <laughs> I did read it. I swear to you. I read it. <laughs> well, that's that's a, a novel development. I'm yeah. glad glad to hear that. Well, uh, let, let, me, let me just see if this works here. Uh, I don't know if music that I play on my desktop comes through. Oh, but be careful because I don't want to get dinged. Oh, it'll be short. Is it how how many? If I is it copywritten? No. That's uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and no, we didn't hear it, but that's okay. Oh, okay. It was a clip from the song "Him or Me." What's it gonna be? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never heard Neil Young cover that song, but uh, that's essentially the ultimato that he delivered to Spotify last week. And I, I want to begin by noting that Neil would have had much more impact in expressing his views about Joe Rogan if he'd written a song about it. And instead, he served up massive amounts of free publicity to Joe Rogan. Uh, he brought along Joni Mitchell and a guy I really like, at least musically, Nils Lofgren. And I guess there are a few others who are uh, de-platforming from Spotify. But, you know, in the consolidated world of media, uh, it really doesn't mean very much to stage a protest like this. And now Sirius XM and Apple Music are claiming that they are the people who provide access to the, uh, the, the freedom fighter, Neil Young. But Sirius XM has the war room with Steve Bannon. Uh, they carry a lot of other uh, right-wing crap where people lie with impunity. And Spotify itself has a, a, a host of uh, dangerous people, including, I believe, the David Feldman show. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, 
you know, I, I compare this in some ways way back in the 90s. Uh, I was on KNBR, an AM station in San Francisco. Home when of the, the management, Gi- pardon me? Home of the Giants. Yes. When management announced that this uh, weird and unknown fellow named Rush Limbaugh was being added to the program lineup. And I suppose I could have quit in protest and said, I don't want to be associated with uh, a dangerous, racist, uh, divisive figure like Rush Limbaugh. But I chose to stay there and try to develop an audience of my own while at the same time uh, persuading some Rush Limbaugh listeners that there was at minimum another point of view and at the maximum that there were valid viewpoints that uh, they would never hear from uh, the guy who later became addicted to OxyContin. So I view this uh, and, and certainly Neil Young and any artist has the right to pull their work from a platform. They can solely determine how they distribute uh, their product, whether it's music or a podcast. But to imagine uh, that they have achieved what appeared to be their desired effect, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's just fantasy on their part. And I wish Neil Young would have launched a campaign to fight for better split of the royalty stream at Spotify and at Apple Music and at YouTube. And instead, he, he initially picked on Rogan, and then he deleted his post on his own website about that and has since uh, told Rolling Stone that, well, I have other grievances with Spotify. But Neil Young emphasized the, um, the algorithms in their uh, compressed MP3 files, which is a, a very accurate complaint. Uh, there is greater compression and therefore less bandwidth uh, for the listener on the music that plays on Spotify. They do it because it saves money. Uh, And Apple and YouTube. And he uh, said Amazon, he specifically told us to go to Amazon Music, which now I have to choose between Joe Rogan and Jeff Bezos. (laughs) So what do you do? And and it amazes me because as you know, I do spend some time on Facebook. I value many of the friends who show up in my timeline, but there are also a lot of people who, uh, you know, are listeners or or people who I basically don't know. And most of them are all aboard with this left cancellation. And I refuse to use the phrase cancel culture. First of all, it's a Trump term. And secondly, I don't think there's any culture involved in canceling people. Uh, But we deplore the book bans that are being promoted by Trump followers and other right-wingers to try to control the education system, the effort to uh, uh, prevent the dangerous teaching of critical race theory, which doesn't really happen, uh, and other phantoms. Uh, and, And yet, the lefties fall right in line when it comes to tr- yeah when it comes to trying to defend the the complicated and conflicting commentary on covid-19 and let me just give an example in recent weeks we saw dr fauci And he is a spokesperson. So I don't personalize this. I don't hate Fauci. I don't demonize Fauci, but I humanize him. And at one point he said, yeah, you know, if you test positive, you should quarantine for 10 days. Then they cut it to five days. Now, some of this, I believe, is based on science and that Omicron 
appears to have a shorter uh, active life than the previous variants did, Delta in particular. But it also appears that particularly the medical workforce was being infected at such a rate that they couldn't staff the ICUs. And so they announced <clears throat> that five days is enough for the quarantine and that healthcare workers who test positive can continue to work. Now, I believe that those mixed messages to be generous are open for discussion and debate. And to the extent that Joe Rogan chooses to bring people that many regard as crackpots onto his show is perhaps regrettable and you can criticize it, but for Christ's sake, you don't have to listen to Joe Rogan. Okay. Well, let me let me respond to that. Yeah, I, I want to hear it. Bring it yeah, up. Yeah. There are uh, community standards. There, we are a nation with values. Right wing, left wing, Republican, Democrat. It was the Republicans who gave us the FDA, the, the Federal Trade Commission, and the FCC, which I believe Herbert Hoover gave us. I That's believe true. that it, the FCC should be in charge of the internet. It's not, but I do think we need an FCC. I believe we need a, a, a Federal Trade Commission and a Food and Drug Administration. I believe that a, a, uh, a powerful FTC prohibits people from selling the kind of crap that they're selling. You should not be allowed to sell certain supplements and call them immuno boosters. You should not be allowed to sell certain drugs and cures. People die. That's why the Food and Drug Administration was set up to prevent snake oil salesmen from killing Americans. Our government needs to protect us from charlatans because charlatans get us killed. So, yes, there should be a discussion about the safety of mRNA vaccines. But that discussion should not be held in front of millions and millions of people on a corporate owned, unregulated show run by a mixed martial artist commentator who is trying to get downloads. You know, they gave him a hundred million dollars, but they have no newsroom over at Spotify. There's no money to build a nightly news program. They leave it to a, a comedian, a mixed martial arts aficionado to bring on both sides of a scientific story. He's not equipped to, he, he doesn't have the background. I'm sorry, but you you go on a plane you want a pilot who has the credentials you go to a doctor you want a, a doctor with credentials you want to be taught you want a teacher with credentials yes they're all flawed but it's still better than getting your information or your health care from somebody who has some mercenary ulterior motive. That's why we have a Federal Trade Commission. It's why we have an FCC and a Food and Drug Administration to protect us from quacks and charlatans like Alex Jones, Joe Rogan and Jimmy Dore, who are who who care first and foremost about commerce. And nobody's saying to cancel Joe Rogan. He's free to say whatever he wants. But Neil Young, and I agree with you that Neil Young probably struck out because Joe Rogan is more popular right now than Neil Young. He, I think it, he whiffed there. But everybody has the right to say, I don't want to be a part of some organization that is 
giving credence to anti-vaxxers or even raising questions. It, it's, it, it reminds me of the Holocaust deniers and the people who pr- want to present evidence that people of color have lower IQs than white Anglo-Saxons. It's, it's from the same playbook. It, it's, it's, you can say it, but I have every reason to say, I don't want to advertise on this. I don't want to listen Ooh. to it. And, I'm, and I think it behooves this organization to take this stuff down because it gets people killed, right? Well, you make a number of points, and uh, I agree with some of them. Okay. Um, and I, I want to reference because uh, last night I listened to a good bit of your podcast from last week, uh, where you went into a lengthy comparison uh, of fighting the Nazis and fighting COVID. And there were some valid um, uh, comparisons and linkages there. At the same time, uh, I really think it was a bit overwrought. <laughs> that's, my, that's my style. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there is no cure. Right. <laughs> and there's no 12 step. Right. Uh, because, and, and just this afternoon, I was listening on my satellite radio where I could have been listening to Steve Bannon. Mm-hmm. Or I could have been listening to a Joe Rogan clone, a, a vaccine denier, uh, uh, somebody who even denies that COVID is, is a serious pandemic. Uh, the point is, you, you made it clear that Spotify is an unregulated corporate platform. And I don't disagree that we need more media regulation in this country. And we need to have clear standards, but we're not going to get there anytime soon. Even at the FCC licensed facilities, the news anchors, the opinionators, they're not required to have any personal license. There are no credential qualifications. They have been hired to appear. And as long as management considers them uh, valuable in some respect, they are generally permitted to stay there, except, you know, Jeffrey Tubin, who uh, didn't understand how to turn off his, his camera. Right. Uh, so we get into a, a very complex game here of trying to make decisions about what is appropriate, what is not, and who gets to decide that. And we have made a commitment, and, and I, I understand the First Amendment, and the First Amendment I reference here as a model, not as a controlling standard, because it, it doesn't technically apply uh, to this type of speech. But it's not gov- the gov- First Amendment applies to religion, state sanctioned religion, state sanctioned speech. So the, the government has nothing to do with the First Amendment, this Joe Rogan issue. Correct. But as a nation, we have embraced a standard of free speech. And Donald Trump is allowed to hold a rally where he tells lies that are much more dangerous than anything. And by the way, I've never listened to Joe Rogan. I choose not to. Uh, And I've read enough about him to get a sense of what he does and, and kind of what the, the range of his, uh, his uh, uh, brief happens to be. And I consider Trump's rally speech this past weekend much more dangerous to our country and its people, much more at risk of the violent revolution that you talked about with Professor Fraud. And I see people distracted at a time when the potential war with Ukraine is much more important than Neil Young's war with Spotify. Right. Although right now more Americans are dying listening to anti-vaxxers than in Ukraine. 
that that, you... that is that is a claim and i heard joy reed utter that uh earlier today and i'm sorry that that's not evidence well what did she say that's... what did she say that the she had a guest on who whose name i didn't catch and he claimed that joe rogan never prepares for his show and therefore he is irresponsible and joy closed out the segment by saying and people are dying as a result and i'm sorry there is no evidence that you could persuade me with that there is a direct connection between his podcast which is heard by some 11 million people they claim and we all know that downloads don't equal listeners. I was a podcaster for 11 years and I had, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of downloads for every show, but the metrics showed me that half of the people only listened to half of the show. Right. And, and so this idea that the 11 million number is uh, a dispositive is not accurate. But, but you don't think... This is interesting. You don't think uh, people who have a big audience have a responsibility when it comes to issues like COVID to encourage people to get vaccinated? Well, from what I've read, Rogan himself is vaccinated. No, he's not. He's not. Okay. I read an article from The uh, Guardian today where he said that he, I guess he said he's not opposed to vaccination. Right. He, he, when he caught, when he caught. He did get sick, yes. He said, I, I was going to get vaccinated, but I didn't. And he's promoted the idea, for example, that if you have COVID, it obviates the need to get vaccinated. Now. Well there, there are people who believe that because the antigens or the antibodies uh, did provide a greater protection against, uh, you know, catching the virus again. So I, I, to me, well, I you know, Don, Donald Trump has, has well, I, put I, I, out I, much I, more really disinformation. This is, great. this is great. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, and thank you for this. Uh, there is a there's human decency you know and and when it comes to the first amendment i believe you should be allowed to say whatever you want to say but we have a corporate dominated media where sensationalism eclipses the truth yeah where People are more interested in hearing what they want to hear than what they need to hear. And Joe Rogan it gives people what they think they want to hear. And one of the things they think they want to hear is that you don't need to get vaccinated, that it's your choice, that ivermectin works. And when you create a run on ivermectin you're making ivermectin more expensive and unattainable for kids in india who really need the ivermectin to wipe out river blindness so there are consequences to what people say and if you have 11 million 5 million listeners human decency dictates that you don't talk about things you know nothing about like covid that it should be left to people who have certain amounts of knowledge and degrees and i know that they're problematic but they're still better than Alex Jones, Jimmy Dore, and Joe Rogan, who are pushing their own quackery. I mean, the, the, All right, I, let, let's let's talk about Dr. Mercola. Okay, he is a frequent guest on Rogan's podcast and others that challenge the uh, consensus view about uh, COVID, about mRNA vaccines, 
and dismissing ivermectin and uh, hydroxychloroquine as treatments. All right. He, he doesn't the times, believe that. Right. does and, believe that or he doesn't. Uh, no, he's a skeptic, but he promotes his own. Uh, uh, they're not pharmaceutical, but they are uh, uh, treatments. That, oh, that he's the one. He's they did a study of hate, the hate speech group out of England says he and Bobby Kennedy and a few other uh, are responsible for like 80 percent of all the misinformation about COVID. Is this the guy? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. He's selling. Isn't he selling something? An he He's selling herbal or, you know, other uh, non-traditional and non-pharmaceutical. Shouldn't, shouldn't we have a Food and Drug Administration that cracks down on that? Shouldn't we have a Federal Trade Commission that cracks down on this? I <clears throat> my short answer is yes. I would like to see effective regulation, but we don't have it. And the whole pandemic has been so heavily politicized that there are otherwise reasonable and rational people who have decided that they trust big pharma less than they do Dr. Mercola. Now, both are predatory uh, entities, in my view, who are capitalizing and profiting from the fears of a mass population. Merck makes ivermectin, and they're saying don't use it for COVID. There, there's a difference between, yeah, I'm, I don't, it, it pains me to defend big pharma, and they have captured the regular, big pharma has captured regulation in America. That being said, uh, there is, I agree with you about the Food and Drug Administration not having it uh, sharp enough teeth, but uh it's not, it's not a first amendment right or a freedom of speech right to advertise geritol as uh something that will cure depression and uh, give you energy uh the the federal trade commission has every right to crack down on phony miracle cures okay but the the fda uh, turns a blind eye to what are called off-label uses of drugs that it is approved for specific uh, conditions or diseases. And I, I want to complete my thought about okay. the dark side of pharma, because when it comes to vaccines, the public is not fully immunized, right? We hear that they work 90%, 95%. That's, that's really impressive. But the pharma industry is 100% immunized from any ill effects of the vaccines that they sell. Congress passed a law creating a secret vaccine court. All the proceedings are secret. And when people are injured by vaccines, and this is what started RFK Jr. on the path that has led him into depths that I deplore, okay? But before COVID, he was a fairly reasonable skeptic about the vaccine industry and this immunization, legal immunization that they enjoy. And so uh, th there's a, a so-called documentary that made the rounds about a year ago called Plandemic. And I watched it very carefully. And at the time I, I was still podcasting when it came out. And I said, look, this pushes my buttons because it appeals to my critical view of the pharmaceutical industry and but this she, whole- But isn't she, hasn't she been discredited? I think it's, I, I did not embrace it, okay? But she makes certain arguments that resonate with people who have a deeper understanding of the whole picture of the pharmaceutical industry and vaccines. My biggest point is that trying to suppress, whether it is through active censorship or the passive effort that Neil Young has embarked on, he's not actively trying to censor Joe Rogan, but he's trying to make his program either disappear or much less accessible. That is his goal. 
And it backfires because it makes the information more uh, se sexy and seductive. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. For the you. people who are inclined to think along those lines. And so the antidote to the speech that we are critical of is more speech. I agree. And you're right. A song, a, a song making fun of Joe Rogan. I agree with you on that. I it, would agree. Have, it would have much more impact. And I want to honor your clock, but I'd like you to invite I, Professor Marianne in. Okay. Because she and I have been trading messages on Facebook, and we have uh, I, I, maybe not identical, but a similar point of view. And Marianne pointed out that Neil Young had, uh, in the 80s, uh, he had made uh, homophobic and uh, anti-AIDS statements. Is that true? Because I looked that up, and it came... Oh, yes, I remember it. I mean, I was shocked in the mid-80s when I heard about a Neil Young being a big fan of Reagan's, being pro-con, and making statements about gays, it, like the F word used liberally. I, and, you know, yeah. I, you know what? It's kind of problematic that way. I Excuse mean, me. I couldn't believe it at the time. How could Hang a guy on, who wrote about Nixon love Reagan? Like, right. I looked that up and all I could find was one website and it was a, it was a f like f freedom something. And it was a, a pro Trump website that ran a JPEG of the story, but I cannot find the melody maker interview or the Rolling Stone article. All I can find is a JPEG of him using the F word to describe homosexuals. Are you certain? I found, I found the Rolling Stone article. Can you send it to me? Sure, I'll send it to you. Okay. Well, but, I mean, I'd like to point out. I remember hearing it at the time. You <laughs> remembered like, it at the time? I'm that old, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get my mind around, like, how could this guy be writing about Nixon and Four Dead in Ohio and all that kind of stuff and love Reagan? I, I, I just, it was really, I felt really disappointed because I love Neil Young's music. Well, I like his music people. too. And I, I want to point out that uh, his wow. This Notes for You uh, was a slam at the beer industry and at sponsorships, particularly of concert uh, tours. And mm -hmm. uh, I really respect him for his 2006 album called Living with War, which included uh, the song called Let's Impeach the President. And the lyrics were powerful, uh, very left of center, uh, and, and I fully approve. I'm sure that there were many supporters of the war who uh, you know, had the same reaction uh, uh, that we're seeing in reverse today. And so I, I pick and choose. I support Neil Young when he agrees with me, and I don't support him when he doesn't agree with me. And that's how things work in our country. And I can cancel my Spotify subscription if I want to. That is my free choice. But you know, I am technically banned by California law and an act of Congress from embracing boycotts of the state of Israel over their political uh, positions. And so this- In a federal, as a, as a teacher or a federal, the, the state of California can't, uh, California can't prevent you from encouraging people to boycott Israel. California has a law that requires any contractor right. who does business with the state to certify that they don't support BDS. That's disgraceful. And, and there is a teacher in Texas who is uh, fronting a lawsuit because they tried to get her just to renew her contract uh, as a teacher to sign a statement that she doesn't support BDS. And I, th I think there's a similar case in Oklahoma or someplace like that. And, and so I'm pointing out the inconsistencies and the incoherence here. And ideally, I I'd like to see a fair regulatory structure 
that did not try to regulate content, but that required outlets to present various points of view so that Fox News would have to have a liberal and not an Alan Combs who was just a punching bag for Sean Hannity. Uh, that is the way to, I believe, uh, try to foster speech that can promote uh, informed viewpoints of different kinds. And so this kind of a boycott to me is a joke. Well, I don't think anybody is calling for a boycott of Spotify. Well, I guess they are. Oh, they yeah. are. Yeah, I guess they are. They're all over my Facebook feed and they're calling it a boycott. Well, you know, we're consumers and we're citizens. As Americans, we are not listened to as citizens. Our vote doesn't count, but our dollar does. So I'm all for boycotts. I, I, I support people's right to direct their dollars in ways that fit their values. Yeah. And that includes people who, even for the wrong reasons, in my view, are currently uh, canceling their Spotify subscription isn't it, and trying to jam up their customer service lines. Isn't it interesting that because we don't have a Justice Department that enforces antitrust law, you're left with the choice of going to Amazon, evil, or iTunes, evil. And when Neil Young said, go to Amazon for your streaming music, I went, all right, I'm just going to cancel music. I mean, this is just <laughs> evil. It's all evil. Neil Young is in his mid-70s. He's got more money. He's got hundreds of millions of dollars. And he's going to speak his mind. He's going to say what he, he's, he's at that point in life where he just doesn't give a damn and he's cranky and. Well, I've, I've actually met Neil Young. Uh, he wouldn't do local radio interviews, so I never got to sit and talk with him at length. Um, but he's a pretty rude guy. Uh, he's really full of himself and uh, dismissive of, of, people he considers lesser. Well, he's Canadian. You know what they're like. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just describing him for people who only have, uh, you know, a view of his public persona. It doesn't stop me from enjoying his music. And I want to recommend a song on the beach. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> you can't hear it on Spotify. <laughs> Well, you know, but what was really funny was that both he and Joni Mitchell left Spotify in a huff, both Canadians, and uh, somebody pointed out, and they go on Sirius XM, which hosts Glenn Beck and Michael Savage, otherwise known as Michael Weiner. I know that. And <laughs> I mean, Steve, and Michael Steve, Savage is Steve just Bannon. Like a, yeah, I mean, he's just a rabid anti-vaxxer. I mean, so it sort of makes... Look, I'm sure they got a lot of downloads of their music. I mean, I think they made some money this week, so they're all good. I mean, Let awesome. me ask Peter B. Collins a question about Michael Savage. Yeah. I, he is my guilty pleasure. Oh, God. I, Michael Savage, w w objectively speaking, if you take out the fact that the bad always drives out the good and he's a danger, but just in terms of entertainment value he's not an idiot oh no he's michael savage he's got rhythms he's got stand-up these jazz rhythms he riffs uh i think he is uh of all of them of all the right-wing monsters out there i always found him to be the most entertaining I, I found he didn't insult my intelligence and he played it like a madman Mm -hmm. Professor Marianne, what do you say to that? I, uh, I think I was his first phone call from the WLS audience back in the 90s. WLS was the big blowhorn, you know, radio, um, Mike Malloy was on that. He was like the, yeah. like the token liberal kind of ranter. <laughs> He's great. Right. I used to be on his show all the time. So nobody was calling into Michael Savage. I almost felt bad for him. So I called in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Marianne from Aurora. 
And it was interesting because I think he put out some, I think it was about some amendment, the amendment where uh, uh, senators were elected directly rather than by the state legislatures. And, uh, and he thinks that it should, be got, it should be put back to the state legislatures. And it's, just, it's the kind of academic nonsense just to get people riled up. But you know, we had an interesting conversation for several minutes, which is a very long time when you're on that kind of format show, talk show. I think right. it's because it didn't get any callers because people didn't know who he was. But, uh, you know, he was very smart and knowledgeable. And uh, PhD. And I told him, oh, was he a PhD? Did, his PhD is in nutrition. His PhD is in nutrition. And uh, his really? listeners slavishly refer to him as Dr. Savage. And uh, Savage, Dr. Weiner. yeah, Savage is not his real name. Uh, <laughs> I, always I, I will say, you know, you, you pointed out his uh, abilities uh, as a broadcaster, and he, he's good at it. He knows how to uh, launch a topic, get people's blood pressure immediately uh, doubled, and find a crackpot caller who he can abuse and hang up on. Uh, Still, he is a sick, twisted fuck. Yes. And, and let me offer this. Uh, it requires me to uh, share some partially confidential information, but I used to serve on the local board of my union, AFTRA. And Michael Savage is virulently anti-union. Hmm. And all I can tell you is that the <clears throat> member of the San Francisco local who called in with complaints about his working conditions and his, his pay and all that stuff. Number one, by far, was this anti-union asshole. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the union is required to serve all members and our staff <clears throat> uh, did their level best, but he was such a pest and the other thing, which is not at all sensitive, is that when his program was picked up by uh, what was then a clear channel station here in San Francisco, he demanded an office with a view and he required a, a studio that would be built that was only for his use. He showed up at the office uh, four times in three years and he used the studio twice because he's highly phobic and he prefers to work from home, which, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but why do you demand as part of your contract, an office and a studio, and then you never show up. So he, he's, he's a, a strange guy. The last thing I'll say about him is that he was not, uh, he, he wasn't consistent in his devotion to Trump. He embraced him as a candidate and then after he was in office, uh, he frequently was critical of Trump. And I found that quite surprising. Yeah, I always look, I he started in uh, San Francisco on the weekends and I can remember listening to him and he was outrageous on the weekends because it was in the 90s and he was saying things that should not have been said in San Francisco. And I remember driving to gigs, listening to him and just laughing out loud because he was, I thought he was just trolling San Francisco just to get people pissed off. I always felt that he was somebody who had reached the end of the road, changed his name to Savage and created an act that would have been ultra left wing if that would have worked for him, or if, you know, it just turns out ultra right wing work for him. He was just looking, you know, he was a lonesome roads looking for a, a way to connect with his audience. And the only way at the time was to play the, the far right idiot, which I also think Rush, well, Rush Limbaugh, it, Rush Limbaugh was ultra right. But a lot of it at first was a goof just to see what he could get away with. Mm -hmm. Then he thought, oh, my God, these people are taking me seriously. I, 
I, sh I, I don't need to be funny. I could just say this crap. And then you begin to believe. I watched Dennis Miller go through this metamorphosis where he would say things on stage and the yahoos would cheer and yell and laugh. But then they stopped laughing and they just cheered and yelled. And he thought, I'm tapping into something that I didn't realize is out there. And, and it's very intoxicating and it, it pulls you into the dark side to, to appeal to the yahoos. Yes, the it people, does. The, their, uh, his son owns Rockstar Energy Drink. That's right. Which is owned by PepsiCo. He's a billionaire. Uh, Rockstar, the energy drink made by uh, Russ Wiener. Is that his name? Yeah, Russ, I think, is the son. And, uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, thank you for... Uh, he's, one of the, I'm, he's one of the 500 richest Americans. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. What was that energy drink in, in uh, Face in the Crowd that he was promoting? I don't know. Is that, but, you know, it's I Ilya. Saw, I just saw that movie the other day and there was a, you know, there was a big energy. This, for those who don't know, Face in the Crowd was a movie made in 1957. And it was Andy Griffith's first role in a movie. And he played just a, a drifter, kind of ends up in the jail. The, and, uh, but he's kind of making friends with everybody and impresses the locals with his, you know, ability to spin a yarn and be charming. And then he gets picked up by local radio gal, media gal, uh, Patricia Neal. And then the whole story is that, you know, he goes national and he gets political and he's just like a, a Rush Limbaugh, you know, like decades before Rush Limbaugh. And the movie is complete with an interview with Mike Wallace, the real Mike Wallace, too. Wow. And it just, it the is, it the just, ending is so cute because it, it, it never happens in real life. It, it's like what, it's what you wish would happen to all of these guys and, and never but does. But it does happen, but there are no repercussions anymore. You know, I was thinking just that. I'm going, yeah, maybe 20 years ago that would have been death, but you know. Now it doesn't, it, 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 facing the crowd, I would assume most of my listeners have already seen it. It's uh, directed, I believe, by the horrible Elia Kazan, who yeah. has a granddaughter who nobody should hire because she's an actress trying to make it in Hollywood and she should be blacklisted because her grandfather, who she's proud of, Elia Kazan, named names and destroyed many lives. And that's why Burl Ives is in every Elia Kazan movie, because Elia, uh, because Burl Ives named names. Uh, bad guy. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. It ends with somebody leaving the microphone hot so you can hear Lonesome Roads right, waving. That, that was the Patricia Neal. She left the microphone hot at the end of the show. And so it went out live instead of the commercial you heard, instead of like somebody reading out the, the sponsor list, you heard what Lonesome Rhodes was saying to his crew. That's it, you idiots. Bye-bye, you morons. You'll listen to anything I say, you stupid morons. And in his career, now, you know, you just go, uh, that's not who I am. Well, um, Joe Biden had a hot mic last week and called Pete Ducey a son of a bitch and a moron. No, that was probably on purpose. <laughs> First thing he ever said that was true. <laughs> well, uh, Peter Becon's fantastic. This was a jolt to the brain. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Nice to be here. I hope Carry to on, Marianne. You. Thank you. <laughs> you Thank you so me. much. Peter B. Collins, go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of this man's interviews and radio shows and podcasts. Joining us is our only elected official. Mm -hmm. 
Marianne Collin, Marianne Cummings is a physics professor as well as a parks commissioner in Aurora, Illinois. And we are bringing your candidate on, but this person, uh, there have been some scheduling problems. Yeah. And so we, we were. Well, we are really, I'm helping another guy. And I tell you, it is not pleasant in the 10 degree weather to go door to door getting signatures. But they gave the candidates a fairly small window of time to get to get signatures to get on the ballot and for the uh, for the primaries that aren't happening until June. So we got about three more weeks. So uh, that's kind of what's going on here. I'm uh, really appreciative of the candidates who come on this show mm -hmm. because we're not dealing with hypotheticals. We're not dealing with ideological abstractions. We're dealing with change. How do you, ch how do we do this bloodlessly? Mm -hmm. How do we change things bloodlessly? And the only way to do this is to run for higher office. And, uh, and every candidate who comes on the show, who's vetted by you or Howie Klein, they inspire me. They they clear the cobwebs in my brain, and it reminds me that it's a fight, and it's constant vigilance, and you never stop fighting because they never stop fighting. How? Why? Tell us why you do this. What? What is? How does it make you feel to get out there? Because you don't need to. You you're a painter. You're an amazing artist. You could sit and be warm and paint and teach. You don't need to be out there. What, what is it about knocking on doors? What insight do you get about this country and well, the system? For me personally, you know, because, the, because we were so traumatized, the Bernie Sanders supporters by what happened in 2016 and, and at that convention, which was just downright abusive. Um, but, you know, we all gathered uh, that for that big meeting, August 1st, you know, that was broadcast that, that Bernie Sanders spoke to us, you know, like about almost to the day, five years after, or uh, two years after he announced he was going to run. And, uh, and he told us to do something even harder to run for office ourselves. And uh, I don't know how he did it, but he got a lot of very demoralized progressives to nonetheless, you know, consider running. And uh, I didn't even sign up on his website and somebody asked me if I would consider running for this position, which was coming up as an elected position. Now, so after the disastrous November election, when, when all our other friends were just literally in fetal positions over the results, I mean, we had to get out there and get, and get signatures to get on the ballot. And I found out that I, you know, it was just a weird time. But when I was going door to door in my own area, I was just talking to a lot of people and it's going, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, it's not a total disaster. Everybody's still here. These people are really nice. They're giving me the time of day. And by the way, um, when you're running for office yourself, it's a much different energy than when you're going door to door for somebody else, even somebody you like. It, it just is. And it's almost kind of healing to have just gone and talked to my neighbors and, and got my signature. I got all the signatures I needed, but I was just going door to door and introducing myself. And in the way I got I got a hundred signs made by the uh, by a union company, so I was putting my signs everywhere. That was fun, and uh, so um, I think that it was just because it got you out of your immediate. We all get in ruts, you know. Like I don't want to go outside. I'm just warm and it's cold and it's this and it's that. But then once you're out there, you you, you turn into something a little different, something a little more energized than you would if you just stayed home, you know kind of like curling in the defensive position. Right. So I like that. I think that's very healthy. And it's, you're talking to people. That's very healthy. Right. So. When you talk to people who don't agree with you, mm -hmm. it's so, politics has become so, on, on the national level, has become so dishonest on both sides because people 
have to stand for something. Uh, it's it's team red, team blue. But when you talk to people personally, they're not as angry, or are they well, as angry? You know, there's two kinds of anger. I mean, there are some anger that is just get the F off my porch or I'm going to shoot you kind of anger. That, that, that doesn't happen very often. There are some people who are angry and they start talking and they might even start yelling, but they're not telling you to go away. <laughs> so it's like some people really want to outgas. And if you just stand there and listen and, you know, and I, and I just kind of, I, I, I'm actually agreeing with them most of the time. God damn these Democrats. No, Hey, I'm a Bernie bro, man. I'm right there with you. And it's like, yeah, I want to just toss the whole system out. But, 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 you know, actually it's not hard, at least not hard for me to find empathy with anybody who's willing to give me the time of day and actually talk to me. And that's kind of like why I didn't know. There are very specific things in my area. You know, the fact that we don't have access to, we, we don't have access to our bike trails. That was four years ago, that's improving. You know, of course that, that uh, horrible wreck of an old abandoned hospital, that's getting dealt with with a new park. And uh, it, there's more, far about twice the number of kids now learning to swim in my zip code than were like five years ago. And you know, the, you're dealing with very concrete things that actually help people. And they may seem small, but as I said, you know, I was not going to run again unless I saw at least the park beginning to go up. And seeing a park being put there, people didn't believe that a park was gonna go in that vacant lot. They just didn't believe it because nothing happens in that area. And when they saw something happening at all in that area, that was great. So, um, now you live in Aurora and it's it's frigid. Uh, we had a blizzard that started. Yeah, it, was, it was 17 degrees below zero about four days ago. Now it's in the 20s. It's, you know, kind of normal January. We had a blizzard, I believe, Friday night. It's all a blur. I went outside. I wanted to experience it. Wasn't where I live. It wasn't as bad, but it was kind of scary and then I walk the streets I ran an errand and I see the big trucks salting the road and plowing the road and I thought wow like I'm so in my head about you know what's going on in this country but the streets are being salted the roads are being plowed I go into the local bodega and it's things are functioning Things are fun. People are polite. Nobody's at, you know, there are no, uh, but if you stay indoors and only read and watch TV, you'd think it's a war zone out there. Uh, I yeah, found I was, in, uh, I was like last week, it was very wintry, very icy, but I had a good excuse to wear my airfoil Eddie Bauer boots, snow boots. But I was going in these neighborhoods in Joliet, and my God, the front, I mean, these are little bungalow houses, but you literally have to scale like the Iron Throne. You have to, it's like you're not climbing up the front steps, you're scaling up them mm -hmm. to get to some porches. However, I looked at, you know, I, I did talk to a couple of people, and I'm looking at their porch, and I can see, um, I think it was the Chicago tributary of the Chicago I can't remember which river I think it might even be the Fox River that goes through Joliet downtown Joliet and it's such a it was just such a cool vision and there are things going on it's, it's very run down it was like Aurora I mean because it had been a big manufacturing center and a lot of the manufacturing left so it's the kind of the same demographics it's the same kind of um, post-industrial situation but people are doing things and my friend uh, Rachel Ventura who ran against Bill Foster. She ran for Congress, then she ran John Lash's uh, 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 mayoral campaign. So she suffered two really hard losses. And that's, it's so discouraging because you see firsthand what you're up against when you take on, but you know what? She's right back in there. And, and I, this, this looks very winnable for her. So she just feel, felt that she needed a win. I think she's gonna get it, but still we gotta get her on the ballot and we, you know, we have to let uh, Democrats know that there is a Democrat that might actually be on the ballot. Um, 
But this is a good time for people to consider running. This was an excellent time because, I mean, it's not just Republicans who are gerrymandering. You should see this new map of Illinois. Holy crap. But I mean, for most of the incumbents, most of their districts are gone. I mean, they're not in their old districts. So the usual incumbency advantage is greatly diminished. So this is an opportunity for people. And I think Junaid kind of looked at the demographics in his area. We, we now know what the, the districts are and he says he's got an excellent shot at uh, taking out his opponent, but it's a lot of hard work because now the democratic establishment is really digging its heels and uh, they, they do not like, they do, they do not like progressive challengers. They're, they're okay with challengers to a progressive who's more in there. So, um, so we're doing, uh, so this is the kind of thing we're doing, but the, the, the uh, weird thing that's happening. So uh, John Lash lost to a Republican that Democratic, that the Democratic organizations were supporting around here. Many of them didn't even believe he was a Republican. And now he's announced a month ago that he's running for governor as a Republican, you know, not, not nine months out from uh, his inauguration as mayor. And the ads he just ran are unflipping believable. I mean, my jaw literally dropped. He was showing jackbooted thugs, you know, pushing on protesters. And what he was showing were the were the police that were that were intimidating Black Lives Matter protests in Aurora. And he says, and when rioters came to our city, he he, Richard, did not put up with it at all. Of course, they let the looting go on. They so, were only, well, so anyway, that's kind of what's going about on. About freedom of speech. The, oh, <laughs> the, the, yes, the Supreme Court has ruled that you can pretty much say whatever you want on television about your opposing candidate. Now, you can't, Pepsi can't lie about Coke, but... Joe Biden can lie about Bernie, take out ads yeah. about it. Is well, that, you know, I, why can't we enforce truth in advertising when it comes to politics? We can, but there's no political will to, as both parties, as I said, have taken their shortcuts to power for the last 30 years, and here we are. Um, the new platforms like, you know, YouTube, we're, we're supposed to cut through the old, you know, the old broadcast media, even the at that time, you know, established cable media. I think the biggest problem, and this is why I, I cringe when lefties are calling for censorship because it always, it always bounces back on us. I mean, Jordan Sheridan, for instance, uh, he's run Status Quo. He's done great work on a variety of issues. He's had like 10 or 11 videos just yanked off of YouTube. He's had his account suspended and it's just so frustrating because it's just violating community standards or whatnot. And you have no, there seems to be no recourse to find out what it is that, you know, that, that what made your video so, you know, offensive or violated community standards. And I, I'm not defending censorship. I don't believe in censorship. I believe, in, well, but I, think the, I believe in correcting speech and we have a problem when somebody has a bigger audience than the people correcting the speech. There's a problem. I don't know. I, I mean, you know, Joe Rogan's own friend. I, I haven't listened much to Joe Rogan since he went to Spotify. I'm not on Spotify. Sometimes portions of his videos come up and he had a doctor friend on recently and, you know, I, I saw this on, on Facebook or someplace, you know, Dr. Owns Joe Rogan on his show, and it was a friend of his, and he was basically countering some old information, an, an old article from about almost a year back with new information, and Joe shut up and let him talk. So Joe Rogan does these one to three hour interviews, and they're all over the map. And yes, you have to have an attention span for them. But, you know, I mean, I heard him, he had, he, he had Eric Weinstein on, um, but he was, he was an evolutionary biologist and 
uh, two years ago, he was talking about, you know, the gain of function that was going on and in, 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 at the lab in Wuton. Then he had Dr. Michael Ulsterholm, a, a guy whose book I read four or five years ago. It was the first time I actually saw him interviewed. And he just went through all of this point by point, how it's extremely unlikely that it is, but he's very concerned nonetheless. There's a whole universe of stuff at these labs other than the maximal Franken virus. But my God, two hours. I don't think I could even begin to make that conversation as interesting as Joe Rogan made that conversation interesting. So I, th so I think we it should- is a, It is a trick. I agree with you, but it is a trick that Bill O'Reilly and Fox News have perfected the illusion of fair and balanced, giving voice to legitimate opposition to, say, the war in Iraq, which gives credence to all the crackpots who overpopulate your show. So it, that when you when you throw in a legitimate scientist every now and then, all that does is lend credence to the quacks who you have on most of the time. Oh, well, I'm, all I'm saying is that, um, you know, I've listened enough to Joe Rogan before he left uh, for Spotify to be kind of impressed with his his uh, uh, interviewing skills and the, just the array of people he had on. And, and that interview with, with uh, Bernie Sanders was fantastic. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm just not going to worry about that. I think... I have a feeling that a lot of this, this controversy is to generate the clicks for everybody involved in this controversy. I agree. I that, um, you know, PolitiFact, I, I, I'm so old, I remember back when Rachel Maddow was taking PolitiFact to task constantly because they were supposed to be the fact checkers and they were just kind of systematically nitpicking on the left position to give a you know less than truthful rating and then they were just completely covering for the right to give a you know sort of half truth rather than pants on fire lie and you know she so i think that the only antidote really to bad speech is more speech i mean that's been kind that, of that but we're not hearing here's the problem yeah well we don't hear good speech well, we don't, people don't read good books either. And there's a lot of bad books out there. So. Well, you have, we do have public airwaves that are owned by the public that don't give voice to left of center intellectuals. We are censored and uh, you're more likely to hear right wing generals promoting war or corporate mm -hmm. executives promoting uh, raising interest rates to combat inflation than you are labor organizers. So you hear no in labor organizers on these. I'm shows. sorry. You hear hardly any labor organizers. Exactly. On these shows. Exactly. So, so so complaining about Spotify giving a uh, hundred million dollars to somebody who books his own show he says he books his own show and yes he's wildly popular and so is pornography and and so are bum fights so is uh, mixed martial arts there will always be an audience for that he is a great interviewer but if you have a hundred million dollars for joe rogan you should have a quarter of a billion dollars for a nightly news program, a news gathering well, operation. We, we have allowed our politicians, because we have like systematically may, may not made these demands of them for 30 years. And they've allowed these laws to pass that, you know, basically forego any kind of, you know, fair use policy of the public airwaves. Um, I agree with you. You said something about how Facebook and Twitter and, and, and YouTube should all be public at the, um, utilities. I agree, because I think one of the biggest problems with, you know, you're, we're leaving it to a bunch of billionaire dweebs to decide what gets out and what doesn't. And a lot of very good reporting from independent journalists who actually need that YouTube outlet. 
you know, they, they don't have the audience right. yet. They need to build it up. They, it's like saying you can't have, we don't like you, so you can't have your store at the Fox Valley Mall over there. I mean, you know, it's just kind of that sort of situation. And we need to have transparency. If there are rules of engagement, if there are rules about what you can post and what you can't, then they need to be transparent. And if somebody's post is taken down, for instance, Jordan Sheridan was interviewing people. Some of the people who had gone to the uh, January 6th riots had gone previously to a, uh, to, to a Second Amendment rally. And he had interviewed these people. They took that down with no explanation, except that this is violating community standards. You know, this is... You know, I don't know if they're taking it down or demonetizing. There's a difference. No, no. Taking it down, like it disappeared. Because uh, yeah. I, I, I actually, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a paying subscriber to his Patreon and to his YouTube channel. So we get notices. So, yeah. But that's yeah. also, I, I'm, I'm just saying yeah. a, a marketing trick is to constantly talk about how YouTube is shutting me down, pay for, you know, the censored stuff that you can't hear anywhere else. It is a marketing trick. I'm not saying that YouTube isn't demonetizing and censoring, but I'm also saying if you're trying to make money, mm -hmm. one of the ways to do it is too hot for YouTube. Here, here is my, here's what I know is right. That we need a, a federal an F FCC. We need a federal trade commission. We need a food and drug administration. We need regulators to forbid anybody like this doctor, I think his name is Mercola, anybody who is selling snake oil. We agree, that's one of the building blocks of civilization is tribal leaders cracking down on poison, making sure that our water isn't poisoned and nobody is trying to pass off some cure-all that will get you killed. We, well, we, we need a food and drug administration with teeth that says to Alex Jones, this stuff doesn't give you a boner. This stuff isn't going to boost your immunity. You're, you're, you're not only ripping people off, but you're contributing to their demise because they're taking this instead of the vaccine. Is that asking too much for a government to protect us from quackery. It's as old as the progressive movement under Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. and unfortunately, all of the all of the considerable bureaucracy that should be doing that has been largely captured by big pharma and yes. other interests. And but that doesn't that, but that doesn't make what Alex Jones or what uh, no. Joe Rogan or Jimmy no. Dore what they say the stuff they say I about vaccines. I, I, well, unless they're selling vaccines, but I think what is, what's a much bigger problem is that we need to take back the commons. I mean, we have allowed private industry to just you know gobble up which should be public utilities, which should be the commons, which should all of this all of this technology that the pharmaceutical companies are making billions and billions off of. I mean, I was just reading an article today where two years in a row, the deaths from uh, diabetes is well over 100,000. Right. And the cost of the medicine is going up. This, this should be free. I mean, they should pay zero dollars for this kind of thing. Uh, you know, we have, there is so much that has come out of our national labs that we should at least be be charging, having the companies charge, charge the companies royalties for using this technology. There's so much that, you know, just the idea that there is something we all publicly own. We should all publicly own the backbone right. of the internet. That should I, be I, I agree with you, but let me get back to censorship and uh, correcting speech. You are a particle physicist. Mm -hmm. If I I'm taking a class with you, professor, and I, you asked me about uh, Newton's uh, laws of motion, and I say uh, objects uh, will stay in motion 
uh, even if there's a, a force that blocks it, that the, oh no, it'd be huh? a nasty emotion in that case. Well, I'm getting. Okay, I, I'm saying that emotion stay unless another force comes into play. Right, and I'm but saying I I'm saying I don't agree with you that if another force can come into play, but if the object in motion is powerful enough, the opposite force won't have any in other words am i if you correct my paper or if if i say this in a classroom do you have a right to correct my speech or is that censorship <laughs> i'm being serious it's not a democracy i'm sorry my classroom is, done, is not a democracy you have a right to say anything you damn well please unless it's like unless it's hate speech or attacking somebody else but uh I'm, if I'm go that. if i go on That's my opinion. <laughs> okay so if i okay and then you hear me telling 12 million people that objects in motion stay in motion no matter there's no way to stop an object in motion and you hear that on spotify and i'm telling that to 12 million people and that's why they're opposed to airbags because i'm giving them false newtonian laws of motion and people are dying because they refuse to you know activate their airbags what is your obligation as a physicist when you hear somebody spreading falsehoods about newton's laws of motion apart from laughing at first I, well, but I people would say are believing it and because people are believing it and they're not wearing their seat belts and they're deactivating their airbags because they're being told that airbags cause more damage it's it, that it, that it's better to get into a, a an alleged crash than to have an airbag explode in, in your face what is your uh, obligation that, that's that my obligation probably isn't much I mean police will I mean police were pulling us over and checking for uh you know, wearing seatbelts. But we have the right to correct speech. If Joe Rogan is telling kids yeah. under the age of 30 that you don't need to get vaccinated, you're good to go. He's not a doctor. Kids should not be listening to him. You have a right to correct that speech. You have a right to call Spotify and say, do you really think it's a good idea for 10 million people to hear this? I'm not calling for censorship. Yeah, I'm sorry. Or you, can, or you can go on Spotify. But you're not going to reach 10 million people because Joe Rogan is charismatic and we're not. Hey, look, you know, if every single church spouts an ideology that I find ludicrous and it's millions and millions and millions of people and that ideology, the, these religious beliefs are dangerous. They have real consequences in the real world, but we have a First Amendment that kind of protects you know, they can you know, they're not allowed to break the laws like you know human sacrifice which would go against our homicide laws but you know they are allowed to do a whole universe of stuff that's just but we keep it we're supposed to keep it out of our government well we're supposed to keep it out of people's lives yes you know that uh i mean what happens if a family does not believe in mental illness you know it's like their kid is the problem with their kid isn't because he's suffering from schizophrenia and he's just not praying hard enough to Jesus. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a whole universe of stuff. But my point is, is that a censorship always seems to backfire. Um, you know, I, well, I, but we don't have to call it censorship. It's correcting speech. Nobody's yeah, well, saying, nobody's exactly saying that Joe Rogan TV. doesn't have a right to do a show. Nobody's saying to cancel Joe Rogan and destroy his life. People are saying say people that. are people are correcting his speech and they keep saying to Spotify, you're you're allowing him to spread misinformation about a disease that has killed close to nine hundred thousand Americans, partly because of misinformation. Would you agree that people are dying because of misinformation? I would say that. Pfizer and Moderna are more responsible for people dying now than anybody, even a big platform on any YouTube, Spotify, that's, whatever the other platform. That's the third world overcharging for vaccines. No, but because it came back here. No, it came back here. If the leaders of the world had decided at, at the beginning of last year 
that we are not we are we are not going to respect IP here. This is a global pandemic emergency. We are you're forcing the companies, that's AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson and, and Pfizer and Moderna to give their formulas to third world countries. I was reading an article today where I'm going to interrupt you. Hang on for one second. I'm going I'm I'm to push back a little. I'm going to push back. Yeah. Uh, my, my question was, are people dying because they're not taking the vaccine because they don't believe the vaccine works? People are dying because of a lot of reasons, and, and one of them is they're not taking the vaccine now. Okay, so w would you agree? Let me just pursue this for one second. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people in the ICU, a vast preponderance of whom are unvaccinated. We're being told that a vast preponderance of the people who die from the vaccine are unvaccinated where are they getting this information that vaccines don't work? Well, I'm not sure it has, all of it has to do with getting information. I just was able to find somebody in local government that will, who has told me that they're going to get to the bottom of why my zip code has only a complete vaccination rate. Now we're talking the two vaccines plus the booster of like less than 42%. Right. There, the there, socio there are socioeconomic that's, issues, that's but there big. are people. I mean, that's a very big component. It's a lower, you know, the, the low, it, it goes almost inversely as, as economic bracket. The, right, but there are people reasons. who don't, who, there are people who have a fear of needles, who can't take a day off from work to get the vaccine and then have the hangover the next day. If you're looking for an excuse not to get a vaccine, you can find one. And the purveyors of those excuses yeah. are, are getting people killed because everybody well, should know, get the vaccine. You're talking about something that's kind of hard to really quantify. But would you, would you, you would agree that of the 900,000 people who died, of the people, you would agree that a significant proportion of the people now who are dying from COVID refuse to get vaccinated. There's a good number of them. Or don't get vaccinated. There's but a they, difference. They don't think it's safe. Don't. They, don't, they don't think it's safe. Would you agree that some of them don't think it's safe? I think some of them don't even have doctors in my opinion. I know that, but would you agree that some of them do it because they don't think it's safe? Yeah, hmm? they might. Yeah, okay, and where do they get that idea from? I don't know. I haven't asked them. But now, don't we have an obligation? But don't we have an obligation as citizens of the world to encourage people that the vaccines are safe and they should get vaccinated? Yes, we do, and we also have an obligation to make sure that people, like people in my area who don't even have cars, are able to get the vaccine locally. And that has not happened, not here. I mean, it's happened in all the richer areas. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a lot of, th there's a very complicated issue right now. And I think that, you know, there's, there, I think but way before Joe Rogan, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy out here. I mean, you know, he, did, he didn't invent this. Um, and some of the people have just a little, I mean, I, I think that there were reasonable discussions like, Maybe we should vaccine. We should prioritize vaccinating the most vulnerable uh, first, and have a lockdown, and so we're not vaccinating into a tsunami of the disease going around. But you know, again, I'm kind of less inclined to blame people who individually don't have much power. If we didn't have the real game changer, changer of course, for the for the epidemiologist and their modeling was the variants. The variants that were so much more infectious were the vaccines, which still definitely prevent a lot of death and prevent a, a lot of hospitalization. Uh, you can just see that in the raw numbers. Okay. But, you know, they, but, but that basically should never have gotten over here. And if we had a worldwide response a year ago, these variants 
may have not been able to evolve. The, the, the COVID may not have been able to evolve into the variants that are of some concern. So uh, I think that- So I had a boss years ago, briefly, who was obsessed with the IQs of people of color. Mm -hmm. And he would keep bringing it up to me. And I'd say, why are you bringing this up? Why, what does it matter? What does the study mean? Well, why, why are you, what are you, what, is, what are you getting at with IQ tests and how they're different from, and w why would you want to discuss this? To what end? Um, a conversation about IQ tests and breaking them down along various demographics. Should that, I'm not asking you, that conversation should not be had. Well, but it was had. It was a book called The Bell Curve. It right. came out about 15 years ago or something like that. And it was a, it was faulty. Mm -hmm. And, and IQ, we, and we've since learned that IQ tests are more than culturally biased. And I remember saying, why would you want this guy on your show? To what end? What are you trying to prove? How does that move the conversation forward? It only enables hatred and prejudice. And what is the, well, no, this conversation should be had. And I would say, and, and what about Holocaust denying? Why don't we discuss Holocaust? The, the, the decision to have these conversations when child care is not free in this country health care is not free in this country when homeless people are being created by the real estate industry when we can't feed everybody because mcdonald's and wendy's says they'll lose money if we create soup kitchens in impoverished neighborhoods that's the conversation that needs to be had not whether or not the Holocaust happened or not, whether or not certain people have higher or lower IQs, or whether or not the COVID came from gain of function research, or whether or not these vaccines work or not, especially when, now you're qualified to talk about this, you're a physicist, a scientist, and, but the conversation that should be had, the conversations that should be had do not include whether or not vaccines are safe, whether or not IQs matter, or whether or not the Holocaust happened. There's, a, there's an agenda underneath it when mm -hmm. those conversations are had. There's a reason, well, there's, people, there's, there's a, a reason agenda. people are talking about these topics instead of the really important ones like why aren't we feeding the the 20 percent of american children who have food insecurity hey i mean you know we had people feeding into a russiagate paranoia story for four years and now we've got a population at least part of them is hopped up to have a hot war with a nuclear power so right. but what's so, happening there? Are we going, are we going to, I don't think that, but you know, look, but I, I think, again, I always come back to, um, you know, the, the antidote for bad speech is just more speech and you have to get on some of these. I mean, more, I speech is more speech is correcting bad speech. Yes. Well, look, I, I used to get on some of these right winger shows on WLS and I think, they didn't really um, screen out liberals. I think they just screen, screened out people who couldn't even spout out their name and where they were from and what's your point. You know, I know how radio works. I used to, I used to do it in, in college, but uh, you know, I remember having a conversation about the bell curve, and the one guy is yelling at me. Said, "Did you even read this book?" I said, "I read about four and a half more chapters than I needed to because in the in the introduction, they talked about IQ points and they said, an IQ point is not a quantifiable thing. I said, okay, done. Then why are you doing quantitative analysis? 
on an object you can't. And we had an argument, we had an interesting conversation about this. I think it was great for, you know, they let me on their show. Uh, and I think I had, I mean, it would have been worse to just shut it all down. You know, you're, 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 and then you make martyrs out of these people. And besides which, you know, as I said, the uh, censorship or trying to deplatform someplace always kind of backfires on lefties. You know, we always get the brunt of it. So you, 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 this was great. This was what a great show tonight. I'm so, so blessed. I happen to believe that uh, people are cut from a certain cloth. And the people who fixate on vaccinations and, and COVID are the same people who tend to say, we should hear all sides of the story when it comes to IQs. And we should hear all sides of the story when it comes to the Holocaust. They are cut from the same cloth. It is the illusion of being open-minded when in fact they want to uh, insert vile, pernicious conversation into the, the national dialogue, a uh, hateful dialogue at the expense of the really important dialogue of how do we feed and educate every American? How do we house every American? How do we provide health care for every American? Uh, that's well, you focus on a couple, you know, you focus very narrowly, David, when in fact, every conversation just about that goes on regular media is a distraction away from, from how we're being screwed by people who want perpetual war, by people who want perpetual illness. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's not a healthcare industry for people who want to keep most of us in poverty or debtors or virtual debtors prison or everything else. I mean, everything is a distraction. Right. And again, um, I, it, it's not going to be easy and there's always going to be detractors. I mean, I had like 20 years of, uh, I have 20 years of, of arguing with uh, creation scientists and, you know, uh, and, and, oh, what was that? It was kind of the public publicity, the publicists got a hold of those guys. What are they? Oh, intelligent design. Yeah. Right. That was creation science with the publicist. You always have this bad stuff going on. And you know what I, I'll give you what I would say is I'll give you intelligent design. I'll t you, you want the earth to be 5,000 years old. Give me soup kitchens on every block that <laughs> that feed every American and provide free daycare. How's you can have the earth is 5,000 years old. Fine. Now g give me a universal uh, health care. How's the plan? Are, are you pushing the plan to push uh, soup, you know, free food in Aurora? No, I haven't pushed it in any form yet, but you know, I'm thinking you know, about as it. an intellectual we got, we got empty buildings around here. Um, we got to start doing some stuff. I mean, having a free soup kitchen as a way of kind of attracting people and then having little businesses in the building because you have. Yes. Soup. Yes. And you have a little bookstore over here and you yes. have another little business over there, a little, you know. Or, or a free library that gives out books and you pay, uh -huh. I mean, it, it, you know, Keynes says the way you get out of a depression is the government says, here's a shovel, go dig mm -hmm. some holes. We'll pay you to dig holes. Okay. You dug the holes now cover the holes with the dirt and here's another, and that's how you jumpstart an economy. That's you know, if, if, if that had been the, the new deal, that alone would have been good because it was a big psychological boost more than anything else. But we have structures and buildings, bridges, the Aurora Zoo, all kinds of things that were here because of the WPA program. This so, is why this is why I love you because you're an intellectual who makes things happen. You're not saying to me, as so many do, uh, well, there are reasons we can't do this. As an intellectual exercise, I want to hear the arguments against converting a, an abandoned building 
into a a kitchen that provides 24 hour vegan soup to anybody who wants it where you can sit and drink coffee and talk and hear music and see your art hanging in the back i want to hear the argument against that how that doesn't create business like as you said how you can't build around that and create businesses how I want to hear the argument against it because there will be one I, I hear it from the left we have a big you know what that gives me another idea there is a big homeless shelter Hesed House which is getting bigger and we're, we still have a homeless city with a bunch of propane heaters over on Park District land just about six blocks from where I'm living right now but uh well I, you know I'm not even talking what I'm talking about is for the homeless I'm talking about for me for you for any I, I, I get your I get it it's open for everybody but it's oh, because a, then a way it, of hiring people directly to run this you know because somebody has to run this which is a good crazy that. job that's a good job to have. And that might be the sort of job that you give somebody who wants to get their life together and who's you know needs a little support from the community and that might be fine as an entry-level job or, I mean, we had the, or we a permanent the job that pays a livable wage with a pension <laughs> what what I, I mean in terms of like daycare you know you take an abandoned building and you say okay now we're serving food for free and in the back room we have free daycare free licensed daycare mm -hmm. not run by a for-profit company run by the city and and the the people who do daycare for you it's not a start it's not not a beginning job it is a career the same way being a teacher is a career and and you, you treat people who do daycare with the same dignity as you mm -hmm. do a kindergarten teacher, which my son is. Daycare is the most important effing job in the world. Daycare. In other countries, it is a much more prestigious job. In, but anyway, yes, I hear you. And, and it should be run right by ahead. a private ent. It should be run by. Okay, thank you. We got to wrap it up. Thank you. I'm out of my mind. I want to hear Professor. I don't want Professor Steinell to go off and you know. I know. Be too impatient. So sorry, Professor Marianne okay. Cummings. Thank you so much. I hope to see you uh, Thursday. You are a a miracle. Thank you. Well. Uh, what am I doing here? Professor Mike Steinell joins us in Dent. Are you and you're here? Hello. Well, I lost him. Are you there, Professor? All right, you're listening to the David Feldman show. I can't. I can't seem to unmute myself. Wait a second. Uh, and I can't able to stop. mute myself. Hang on a second. Okay. While you're unmuting. Unable to start video. Hmm. Asked to start video. I just did it. All right. There you go. There you are. Yeah, it said you had uh, stopped my, the host has stopped my video. Well. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Thanks a lot, David. I see you and I hear you. I see, let me see. I see Thomas Dewey. That would be, look at you learning the tricks there. Uh, that would be uh, Admiral. I thought, wait, 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 back up. Stop, stop. We have to play a little game. Okay. Okay, remember last week we went down the rabbit hole of who killed Dorothy Kilgallen. Yes. And then you held up the Dewey, <laughs> the Dewey thing. So I've got a little game for you called okay. Know Your Deweys. Okay. Oh, I, I, I was going to get a bell. For, uh, I don't have a bell. Uh, 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 well, I, I have. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about each right. Dewey. Okay. You Dewey that. Okay. Just a short sketch. Okay. In no particular order. There you go. All right. Oh, that's great. There's four Deweys. George Dewey. Am I, is my volume okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Was an admiral 
in the Navy, Admiral of the Navy, one of the few, I think the only time we ever had Admiral of the Navy. Spanish-American War, I believe. Yeah, now we're getting to that. We're getting to that. Melville Dewey invented the Dewey Decimal System. John Dewey was an educated philosopher and progressive, great, great person. And Thomas Dewey was governor of New York and, and ran for ran for president twice, got beat by FDR in 44 and, and uh, Truman in 48. Okay, so when you see the pictures coming up, which ones, who's who? Oh, I can, okay. All right. All right. Now, I, read him in no I read them in no particular order. Okay. Here okay we they go. should be coming up. Uh, and you tell me correct or wrong. The first one, that would be Thomas Dewey. Wrong. No, no, the first one I see is... It's wrong. <laughs> just, I just wanted to hear the buzz. No, that was right. Okay, from from left to right. There you go. Okay, who's that guy right there? Who's the guy? I'm sorry. Second on the right. Second from, on at the, the right, at the top. The the, must, oh, the guy, the, the guy in the shirt and tie. Yeah, the guy just just disappeared. Who's that? He would be the. Uh, a Dewey Decimal System guy. Wrong. Definitely wrong. Mm. That's John Dewey. That's John Dewey. Okay, wait till they come up again. Right. For those at home who can't see this, I have spent all day. I, <laughs> I have spent all day making a little video that's behind me that shows these wonderful pictures of these. Okay, there's right. there's Thomas, Thomas Dewey. Tommy Dewey. John. John Dewey. Well, so who's this guy? That would be Ringo Starr. <laughs> no, that's the Dewey Decimal guy. Okay. Oh, you give yourself the ding ding. No, no, give yourself the the buzzer. <laughs> and the, the and then the bottom right guy is Admiral Dewey. Yeah, it's a dead giveaway. He's got, I couldn't find a picture without him in his in his suit. I was I was gonna include I was gonna include Dewey Cox, but. Uh, I thought that would be too obvious. How about Huey, Louie, and Dewey? Huey, Lu or Huey, yeah, Huey, Louie, and Dewey. Uh, hmm. Hue, Huey, Dewey, Huey, Cheatham, and Howe. Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Okay. One got kicked out of school for drunkenness and leading a herd of sheep into the dorm. Which one was that? Well, you know, Her William Randolph Hearst got into trouble for that. Anyway. You're avoiding the question. I'm going to go... <laughs> with the uh the educator no 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 it was the admiral well if you're in the navy you need sheep <laughs> one one was on the faculty of columbia thomas dewey nope the the uh not dewey decimal Yes, he was. He Louis was. Decimal? He was the Columbia librarian, and then he became the New York State librarian. Okay. So the Columbia <laughs> Columbia came up with the Dewey. De it started at the Dewey Decimal. Actually, he started it in 1916, but in the 30s he was at he was at Columbia. Amazing. Did you ever figure out the Dewey Decimal system? I oh could... yeah, it's very yeah, it's great. Hmm. You know, because yeah, it's fantastic. When I was working on my master's, I used it a lot. And when in my teaching, I'd go over to the library and you walk through the stacks and, you know, you, you find the book. It's great. Here we go. Two were instrumental in pushing a presidential candidate to run. Well, I'm going to say Dewey the candidate. Thomas, who did he push to run? Wilkie. Nope. Wilkie uh, was much earlier, so... He's, he wasn't that old. He was, when he first ran for president, he was 38. In, Eisenhower. Uh, he pushed Eisenhower. He, he pushed Eisenhower, and then he also forced Nixon on him. He was a big Nixon supporter. Oh, so he was a bad guy, Tom. <clears throat> bad guy. But he did put Lucky Luciano in jail. He was a, a DA for Manhattan. He was a Manhattan uh, DA. Not so lucky. Yeah. One was quoted as saying, the president would be an easy job because it's only a matter of executing the laws of Congress. I would say uh, 
the uh, educator Dewey. No, <laughs> no, it was the admiral. It was George Dewey. No, oh, okay. Uh, give yourself the buzzer. Oh, come on, man! <clears throat> I've waited all day for that. I've, I've been thinking about the buzzer. Okay, um, one admitted he never voted in a presidential election prior to oh i'm going to give it oh, away. Yeah, 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 yeah. thomas dewey because he was a prosecutor and they probably felt he should be unbiased he might not have voted but he, he wasn't the one that admitted it was uh, george it was the the admiral george dewey yeah okay here we go one was released from his position for sexual harassment they didn't have did they have sex back then <laughs> sure they did they didn't they had a, such a term as sexual harassment back then well that you know modern writers have, I, I, I have cancel my time machine <laughs> i was building a time machine apparently oh, that's a good bit that's a good I know, bit apparently they had sexual harassment <laughs> A womanizer in the 2022 who just wants to go back and he wants to go back in the, into the 50s so he can right. be like madmen. I like the woman. I remember the abdominizer. I don't know that show. Oh, the abdominizer. It was a machine that you would strengthen. You get a six pack. They should have a womanizer too. <laughs> oh, there so, was that was a real thing. The abdominizer. The abdominizer. I, I want to sell the woman. Well, who was which one? Which one was a harasser? I'm going to, well, it couldn't have been the Admiral Dewey because there were no women in the Navy back. Okay. The creator of the Dewey Decimal System, I would think a librarian wouldn't get accused of sexual harassment because he would say, shh, and they would keep their... Would... Okay, give yourself the buzzer. The librarian? Mm. Yeah, he was he was very handsy with the ladies, <laughs> very handsy, like and would kiss him. Un, he would kiss him really without being. Yeah, he he was like, um, who else does that? Don't we know somebody who did that? They're like the Stewie. <laughs> also, okay, who Joe was Biden. you're talking? Who, Joe Biden. He was. I ain't saying. I ain't saying that. Right. Okay, one That's was true. a outrageous anti semite who had a club, and which was. And, and a racist who had a club and didn't allow uh, Jews or blacks. And there was an empty lot, and he bought the empty lot just so that to prevent a Jew or a black person from buying it next to his club. Okay. I would say all four of them, but... No, no, no. no. I'm going to go... Well, this might be a trick question an anti-Semite and a racist. Uh, I'm going to go with the educator, Dewey. God, no, 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 no. It was, it was, the, it was the, the librarian. The librarian? He was horrible. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is the guy who invented the Dewey Decimal System was God. a misogynist. And, he and racist. And Jews? an anti-Semite. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is the last question, and it's just a kind of a like a uh, greatest Dewey and worst Dewey. I'm going to say the worst. I'm going to answer this one for you. Get ready for the ding ding. The librarian, <laughs> Mel the Melville Dewey, was a horrible person. Mm. Hey, you, no, I get the ding. I get the ding. Nah, I was, that's <laughs> right. Okay, who was the greatest? That's a man just because he hated Jews, women, and blacks? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do judge a man for that's the entire content of the man's character. Yeah, wow. yeah sure it is. Uh, you know what? Good... That's it. Uh, you know what? We should we should cancel the Dewey Decimal System. We I'm should... ready for that. He was they actually in in 2019 there was a big award. It was called the Melville Dewey Award for like the most outstanding librarian in the country. I don't know what you do to get that. I guess you have, they have a, a contest. We would like to do the judge, the shushing now. Shh. Right. Right. Shh. Right. You, need, you get points for, you know, accuracy mm -hmm. and uh, style. What else would they do? Well, I do know that uh, Dewey invented the term, hey, you're stacked. <laughs> oh, oh, he, here's the thing. He had this 
in his school, he was running a school for librarians. And when women applied, he asked for a picture and their bust size. Seriously. That's why they well, call that's it been, that's been reported. Yeah. They, yeah and, and then he would take them to the stacks and see how they, if they were stacked. A bad a time. I don't think I've used that term. <laughs> stacked. What that's a, a funny guy. term. What he a was bad. a bad guy. You know who was a great one? I tell you, John Dewey, fantastic person. Um, some of these guys, two of these guys were born before the Civil War, including John Dewey. He was born in uh, 1859. That's pre-Civil War, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, Melville, 1851. And John Dewey died in 52. And he wrote 40 books, thousands of articles. I have this little book here. Experience he was a great, Education by John Dewey. Yes. Great little book. And, and also somewhere. I, I, go ahead. Who invented the Dewey Decimal System? Melville. Oh, Melville Dewey invented the Dewey Decimal. Yeah, yeah. But John was the great, and he's the father. Melville didn't write any books? No. Okay. He just filed them. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if Melville Dewey died in the stacks and nobody could find him? <laughs> That's good. You know, your joke count is, is pretty good today. I'm just um, swinging, for, I'm swinging for the fences. You're yeah, swinging for the fences. Striking out. But. You're swinging for the defenses, but um, I want to read something, John. He was a great proponent of democracy. This is the kind of guy we need today. Here's now, what he. I mean, it sounds like there are people talking in the background. My That's point. my wife downstairs. Should right. I tell him to be quiet? No, no, no. Tell him to speak up. No, no, no. Beverly, no, no. you're on the radio. No, 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 no. Don't do that. <laughs> say hello to say say hello to Mr. Feldman. It's Mr. Hi, David. She Feldman, says, tell her Mr. Feldman is my father's name. Reverend Mr. Feldman, Feldman. is my father's name. Call me you, Reverend Feldman. You, you could call him Reverend Feldman. Okay, enough of this. Okay, here's what John Dewey wrote. <clears throat> okay, now I have to be quiet now, dear. First, Dewey believed that democracy is an ethical idea, ideal rather than merely a political arrangement. Second, he considered participation. Marianne Cummings, not representation, the essence of democracy. Hmm. Third, he insisted on the harmony between democracy and the scientific method, ever expanding and self critical communities of inquiry, operating on pragma pragmatic principles, and constantly revising their beliefs in light of new evidence, provided Dewey with a model for democratic decision making. Finally, Dewey, Dewey called for extending democracy conceived as an ethical project from politics to industry and society. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. He was a great man. Yes. You know who else was a great man? Who? Mo Green. The great Mo Green. He had a, yeah, he had that a, Mo Green New Deal. Somebody put a bullet through his eye and I said nothing. <laughs> nothing, because this is the big deal. I wrote a song called... Uh, the Mo Green New Deal. Did you really? Yeah, you want to hear it? I tell you, I listened to you. You were a little crabby this morning. This morning. It seemed like a long time ago. Very crabby. Your, your monologue. <laughs> At one, I was taking my walk. At one point, <clears throat> I just got over to the side, and I laid on the lawn of somebody's lawn, and I curled up in a ball, <laughs> and I just <laughs> tried I to... <laughs> I was crabby. <laughs> yeah, you were pretty crabby. But anyway, I thought the Mo, <laughs> when I heard the Mo Green New Deal, <laughs> I about <laughs> fell out. <laughs> so I've written this song called the Mo Green New Deal. You want to hear it? Yes, please. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to, th I think I'll just play organ. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I had a dream last night And it all seemed so real 
I solved all the problems with the Mo Green New Deal. I stood my ground. I told capital what to do. I said, you don't buy me out. I buy you. I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night And it all seemed so real I solved all the problems With the Mo Green New Deal First of all, you're all done You don't have any muscle anymore We're not giving you the keys to the bank So you can fund another stupid war I had a dream last night I had a dream last night And it all seemed so real I solved all the problems Of the Mo Green New Deal We get our money By emptying parking meters We made our bones When you were going out with cheerleaders I got a dream last night <laughs> All right. Where's my heart? Where's my heart? First of all, you're all done. You don't have any muscle anymore. We're not going to give you the keys to the bank so you can fund another stupid war. I had a dream last night about the Mo Green New Deal. I had a dream last night about the Mo Green New Deal. I had a dream last night. <laughs> I won't leave. That was so great. That was, I was limping into the end of the show and you came. Uh, so you heard the beat back. I mean, can you uh, record that? I love that. I'll, I'll, I'll work that up. You know, that's the same, I'm using the same bed as Who Killed Dorothy Kilgallen. Oh, but I think this is, a, this is a little funnier. This is great. This when great. you said, <laughs> you don't buy us out, we buy you out. That that is so great. That is so. I watched that scene. I, 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 I it took me an hour to find something that would rhyme with cheerleaders. Right. I made my bones when you were going out with cheerleaders. Alex Rocco, great Alex Rocco. Was that who played Mo Green? And do you know? I swear to God, like this is God's honest truth. I took my family to Umberto's Clam House in Little Italy. And Ooh, that sounds like fun. That's where Joey Gallo got whacked. And we walked in, and Alex Rocco was eating there. And I figured it out. I go, my kids went nuts when they saw Alex Rocco. He played Mo Green. But yeah, sure. And I, it occurred to me that he never had to pay for a meal at Umberto. <laughs> Probably so. Did he yeah. have the big? Did he have those big glasses like in the yeah. movie? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, that's such a great scene. Michael Corley, yeah. he's just leaning back. Pacino is so great in that. Yeah. You know that movie? Um, Coppola didn't want to do that movie. That was a throwaway. He he did that to raise money for his vineyard. And isn't that weird yeah. that? something that it, that he th turns out to be such a masterpiece you know david sometime i think when i'm long gone you know people will look back and say i'm a pig for love was really great <laughs> <laughs> for me it was just a throwaway i just did that yeah. just keep Turning the stuff out, you I never just, know. Yeah, just do yeah. that, you know. To you never know what will stick. <laughs> I for that, I just I did that not to not to start a vineyard, just to buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, I, that's not true. That's not true.
How are things in Denton? Well, Landon's on the way. Thursday, ice, ice storm. Landon? That's what they're calling the next winter storm. Landon? Landon? Is it a massage you think therapist? Who <laughs> calls a storm Landon? I've had, I've had students called Land. I've, I've had a couple Landons in my time. Not that way, but, you know, just as students. And uh, they were very nice young men. And I think there's nothing wrong with Landon. Landon, first of all, I'm thinking of Michael Landon. Well, that's Let's probably, go. that's what happened. That's why people, you know, people started calling people Dylan. You know, first, the first name Dylan really got popular when Bob, you know, a lot of people my age named their children Dylan, even though that's a last name. But Dylan Thomas was a first name anyway. Landon, I guess, works. Michael Landon. Right. I watched a little bit of... of uh, I named I my kid getting... Haas. I named my daughter Haas. <laughs> and, um, man. Oh, man, that is, that's Haas. horrible. Why? That's a beautiful name. Haas. <laughs> like, in, like from Bonanza? Bonanza. There was Little Joe and Haas. Do you ever notice how when we start talking... Everything we talk about has been has been old for thirty yes, years. It was old when Bonanza. Was old. Yeah, last week it was Dorothy Kilgallen. Uh huh. This week we went back to pre Civil War to get to George Dewey. I dame my daughter Haas. You damed her? What did you I, call? No, her? I named one of my you, daughters Haas. Okay. One was named Little Joe, and the youngest was Hop Sing. <laughs> That's horrible. Hop Singh from Little from Bonanza. Yeah. That was yeah. pretty racist, wasn't it? Yeah, Hop Singh, yeah. Everything. Do, Everything. <laughs> Do you know this movie by Tony Randall where he plays a Chinese guy? <laughs> Mr. Tao? Do you know that? No. I, that was That was in the crosswords. That was in the crosswords a couple of weeks ago. And I looked it up. Oh, and like he, burning crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> and uh he, it's a horrible i think he played a horrible racial stereotype you know like with the teeth and everything you and know Mickey and, rooney in breakfast at tiffany's oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that yeah that it's interesting that didn't bother people back then didn't bother me i watched well, it it, you know, bo I it, it did bother people but they were so marginalized yeah that's true they weren't hurt they should have, you know, it's the, the big thing is they should have got a real Asian to do that. Yeah. 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 So you, you, uh, you had snow, and we're going to get some snow and ice, I think, Thursday morning. Would Thanks. you like me to do a weather report on Thursday's show? Sure. Yeah. I'll do a remote from, from out in the, in the blizzard. And where is Ted Cruz going to head off this? Well, place? that's the thing. He, he, might have to, he might have to get out of town, get out of the country take his daughters on a trip yeah i don't know man you know uh i was gonna tell you something else can't think of it oh i uh sent off my approval for the page proofs for saving charlie parker right so god i spent hours doing that and my wife too she's she's really good she's oh, i thought you said you spent hours doing your wife <laughs> i hear i wish <laughs> I uh, I only wish. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I didn't say that. I, I said I spent hours uh, reading the proofs, and my wife helped too, and she spent hours. And when and do I we get to buy this? Well, then they'll do the cover approval, and then I think it's maybe four to six weeks. I hope. Wow. I got to figure out how to do like uh, the release, do the release. But the big thing is, I'm working on the audio book, and I'm gonna have a lot of music in the audiobook there's like 30 different cues of and i'm gonna improvise the music and so that the audiobook <clears throat> will be like a, a jazz event you know it won't be just an audiobook with some music i'm gonna use a lot of i'm use a lot of underscore i think when the guy goes back in time it's a time travel book i'm gonna have jazz under that part right. like the whole time different kinds of jazz and then when he's in the present, I'm not going to have anything. So it's kind of against type, you know. So I, I, I want to get that and then go for a drive and listen to it. It's a six-hour book. So, yeah. That's it. 
I listened to the show. Uh, Liam was funny. Liam's great. I'm so, going to. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going nice to say about anybody. <laughs> I know. I'm going to total up all my t- tracks, and I don't think. I think they come in at about an average of three and a half minutes, which for jazz isn't that long. Did you right. get that? Uh, did you get that song I sent? Sensation. Let's we'll play it. Yeah, I, I re. I've been. I've been learning how to do Logic Pro, and so I remixed it, this one. I think we played this once before, mm-hmm. but uh, I remixed it. This is called um, I Want to Be a YouTube Sensation. And David, I do. I really want to be, if, if I have one desire in life, it's to be a YouTube sensation. You want well, to play? I'm, you're on the wrong show. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Mike. Oh. <laughs> Professor Mike, I know. sensation it has become my new avocation I taught my cat named Jaws to play the piano with his paws we worked all day long to play a Beethoven song then he got it in his head to play the blues instead but I still want to be a YouTube sensation I want to be a YouTube sensation But it's becoming a big irritation I'm getting a little traumatized By my attempts to get monetized I need 10,000 likes a day Before this thing will pay Maybe I'll try some unboxing Or injecting a dangerous toxin I want to be a YouTube sensation won't go viral. I gave haircuts to tigers, trying to get more subscribers. There's such a chill on my channel, I've decided to dress in flannel. I guess I'll turn to booze, cause I've got the YouTube blues. Maybe I connect the dots on a Dalmatian and become a YouTube sensation. I'm a Dalmatian, maybe I can be a YouTube sensation. No one I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That is so great. That's great. That is you're the best. You are. You are amazing. Yeah, I just want to get some traction on this stuff, you know. Get some traction, David. Yeah. Well, go to MikeSpinell.com. Mike Spinell is a jazz trumpeter, composer, educator. He was a member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from 1987 to 2019. Author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary. His latest is Running the Changes, and go buy Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet featuring Rosanna Eckert. You can get it on Origin Records. Go to MikeSteinel.com. You are fearless. I love you. You, you, <laughs> you are. You are. Shall you, I? Yeah, I'll work up uh, Mo Green, Mo Green New Deal. 
You will inspire <laughs> me. You, 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 All you. right. Well, take it easy, David. Don't get too down. You yeah. know, keep a stiff upper. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. I keep Thank at you. my age. I'm keeping a stiff upper hip. <laughs> That's good. Hey, you know, I want uh, that. Last week we did. Uh, we never did talk about the rhyme with my proudest wine. Rhyme. My what? proudest rhyme is his head is sort of hairyless, which rhymes <laughs> with hilarious and gregarious. He's hilarious. He's gregarious, and I most of some, his head is hairyless. <laughs> I came up with some. Uh, I was. You, what are they called? Earworms? What do you call them? earworms? Yeah, that's what you get in my head. Stuck in your yeah, yeah. Uh, I was I came up with my own lyrics, but they're disgusting. Okay, let's not go there. Okay, I love you. I'll see I you next you week, too. maybe. Thank okay, you. bye. My best to Nadine. Woman. Thanks, man. Okay, well, that is our show. We're going to take some calls. We have uh, Benji and then Rodrigo, and then we'll wrap it up. Hello, let's go to Florida. Hey, how's it going, Dave? You, you're a little crackling there. How, how are things in Florida, Florida man, Benji? Oh, pretty good, man. What you been up to? Uh, what are you up to down there? What's that rumbling sound? I'm not sure, man. I, I'd have been here a little sooner, but I was uh, in the bathroom getting my palm red. <laughs> yeah. Hey, bro, man, you know uh, Valentine's Day is just waiting around the corner, man. Like a junkie with his pants down. Yeah. It's a useless <laughs> commercial holiday, man. It's... It's the thing that chocolate and florist industry, you know, they rely on it, kind of like the Trump family depends on a uh, Fifth Amendment. You know, mm -hmm. holiday that makes single people feel unwanted, depressed, and makes married people feel unwanted and depressed. <laughs> I envy single people though on Valentine's Day, even more so than the other 364 days a year. <laughs> I'm obviously not that good at marriage. It's I always say the wrong thing. That's why I seek your counsel, man. You know, David's been in more marriages than Tom Brady's been in Super Bowls. Yeah. David yeah. is the Tom Brady of marriages. You know, he hold, holds all the records. But no, you're definitely an expert on marriage. It's, that's why you stay single. I, you know, you're breaking up. Give me the Tom Brady line again. I was just saying, you're the Tom Brady of marriage, man. You hold all the records. An unquestionable expert on marriage. That's why you're single, bro. Oh, what about the Tom Brady? I thought you were going to be something with my balls and deflate gate. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of similar too. I mean, y'all got a lot more in common than you know most people would think. You know. Yeah. I mean, you've dated some supermodels too. Yeah. No, it's. I know you've been through so many marriages. You had the what, five or six tours of duty, even chose not to re-enlist. <laughs> smart man. But back to me, man. My wife's angry with me again. You know, big surprise. Uh -huh. The other night, she said she, she said she wanted to party like we were in our twenties. So she passed out first and woke up with a penis drawn on her forehead. <laughs> Then she was really mad when she realized that I didn't draw the penis. I traced it. <laughs> then she tells me she feels like she's married to a barbecue grill because all I do is smoke and give her meat. <laughs> nice. That's sweet. No, I'm not perfect, man. I mean, nobody is. I mean, even Cinderella gagged a little when she reached the ball, man. <laughs> Jesus. I'm just not that smart sometimes, man. I mean, right. I know enough not to eat cucumbers out of a lonely woman's refrigerator, but... <laughs> I'm just, I'm not completely. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You don't want to do that. Or maybe no, you do. <laughs> no, you know, my neighbor's wife died at home. Uh, uh, and the detective asked him, you know, when did you realize your wife had passed? He said, well, the, the sex was the same, but the dishes started piling up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got to cut this short again tonight, man. Except yeah. I got into a fight with my wife right before the show because she asked me where I'd like to be buried. And, Apparently, balls deep in her sister wasn't the right answer. Oh, that's yeah. I don't think that, that's not. I don't think that's gonna make for a happy night. Oh man, hey, but I want to get on out here and see what I can do, man. But hey, I'll take off. I'll see you Friday night, brother. Okay, brother. Thank you so much. No problem, bro. Let's go to Mexico, where Rodrigo. Hello, Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Rod Rodrigo, let me unmute. Hi, I was talking. How are you, Rodrigo? Uh, fine. I I fell asleep on Thursday because I was listening to your show. Uh huh. I That's good. It's working. It's working. 
Go uh, ahead. I wanted to tell you what I had to say last week. Okay. First, a quick word on consumerism. Uh, people often talk about eating less meat or driving less or buying less clothes or changing phones less often. The conservative response to this is that the economy would crash if we really did that. The leftist response has to be that we need to change the entire sign of the economy so that we don't lose jobs because 10,000 people stop buying things they're going to throw out next month. We don't have the room for slow incrementalism that liberals pretend we do. And I was originally going to talk about fascism, but this was uh, at least last week more timely. Uh, I was listening to AOC talking about the COP26 and realized that we don't often point this out. When you hear people talking about net zero by 2050, that doesn't mean the year when we fix climate change or the year when we stop polluting or even the year when we reverse the damage from climate change. Net zero by 2050 means the year when we finally fight climate change exactly as hard as we fight to cause climate change. And what climate change? As fight as, as what climate change? Net zero by 2050 is a plan where in 2050 we are fighting climate change as hard as we fight to cause climate change. Right. So if we listen to the politicians, uh, maybe we'll fight, maybe we'll do something real about climate change by the year 2300 or something. So 2300. And uh, the reason I asked Marianne Cummings last week to hang around is because if I yell at the Mexican president, people who know me will think, well, Rodrigo hates him. Of course, he, he doesn't like him. But what is the Mexican president up to that is related to climate change? Uh, one, he made a deal with Trump to keep war refugees climate change refugees and political refugees among the regular economic refugees on the Mexican side of the border. And that deal continues under Biden. Two, he has decided that he will be remembered for expropriating the lithium and strip mining what few forests and jungles are left in Mexico and has tried to change the Mexican constitution three times this year. After the last time he received a visit from the US ambassador to Mexico. And recently there was another visit from a US official. They are very concerned that the Mexican president might try to pull and Evo Morales and make sure the lithium is not mined ethically or worse, kept in the ground. To that effect, uh, he recently signed an executive order allowing all public works to be exempt from environmental studies, asking the opinion of indigenous communities and anything else that might prevent him from mining for lithium once he is constitutional and allow him to give more power to Manuel Bartlett Diaz a man who not only stole the presidential elections from the man who made the current Mexican president, but he cannot fly to the United States because the DEA, the DEA has a warrant out for his arrest since the 1980s related to the death of the agent Camarena, who was investigating whether the second most powerful man in the Mexican government was called trafficking. And three, uh, he's not using this deal for chasing down Haitian and even a few Cameroonian refugees, some of whom have apparently 
gone missing under the current Mexican president to ask for either more USAID money or cheap loans, or even to look the other way as he gets cheap loans from the Chinese. The Mexican president continues to take selfies with Evo Morales while doing the dirty work for Joe Biden, and he is not using his leverage to get anything that we know of. And his inner circle is so lucky that if he was getting something, we would know about either legal or illegal. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you Thursday. All right. And I hope you don't make me sleep too much. Well, we do our part here. That's the purpose of this show is to help you fall asleep. And you know that. Thank you, Rodrigo. That is our show. We have, let's thank all the guests. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, I can't remember who my guests are. Uh, don't forget to visit my website. While you're over there, sign up for the newsletter. We send a newsletter out to remind you of certain things. And we do office hours every Friday night. This coming Friday night, it's office hours and hours. So go to my website and please sign up. All you need is Zoom. Well, I'd like to thank Richard Panchik, author of Power to the People, a young people's guide to fighting for our rights as citizens and consumers. Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny and Neil Walia, candidate for U.S. House of Representatives in Colorado. The great David Cobb, Dr. Harriet Fraud, host of Capitalism Hits Home. Peter B. Collins, Professor Mary Ann Cummings, and Professor Mike Steinell. That's it. I'm starting to answer all my emails. So if you want to reach me, go to my website. I will try to answer all my emails. We invite you to join our Zoom room. If you'd like to attend a live taping, go to my website to sign up. We are on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Tell your friends about this amazing show and this incredible community. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comic too. The Taylor Dirty Joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an enemy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way.